student at Justus Liebig Universität here in Gießen, and I'm your host for today. I want to introduce Anja Henningsmeier, General Director of Hessen Film and Media Academy. Um, she's going to have some introducing words for us. Hello, everyone from all over the world, because um, that's the reason why we speak uh, English here. In this educational section of Die Seriale 2020, like many festivals in times of social distancing, um, we are online now, but it fits perfectly for digital series, right? And the educational is uh, a section which is dedicated to reflection uh, because the world of digital series and its content uh, has to be taken serious, right? To scrutinize its options in the panel, which Isabella will moderate and um, all the effects digital series have on the cultures of the world and the opportunities which lies in this kind of media and we from the Hessen Film and Media Academy which is the network of the 13 Hessian universities art academies and universities of applied sciences we like to have these reflection about the opportunities and uh, effects of digital series in a world of growing populism we need, we really need this diversity, which is, yeah, a typical character of digital series. I wish you a fruitful day of discussions and panels. And yeah, I hand over to Isabella. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anja Henningsmeier. Uh, thank you for your relentless support, uh, your kind words and your good wishes for this year's festival. It really means a lot to us. <laughs> Thank you. To us as well. Uh, as well. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, a warm welcome, of course, also from me, from our crew here at the Educational and from the whole Seriale team. The past few months have been challenging for all of us everywhere. That's why I'm extremely thankful that this festival creates the opportunity for us to be united again. Our speakers today come from many different countries from all around the globe. And even though it saddens me that we can't be physically together this year, we are together here in our creative and scientific ambitions, in our hearts and minds, and on the, the screen and uh, social media platforms. And that uh, does mean something. It uh, means a lot, actually. So from wherever in the world you're watching this right now, I genuinely hope that you are well and safe and that you are able to enjoy today's program that we worked so hard to put together for you. Today's educational is uh, divided in two parts. In the morning, uh, we'll hear three interesting lectures, starting with Joel Bazaje's take on the web series landscape in India. In the follow-up lecture, uh, German historian Anja Horstmann uh, will uh, reflect on um, one of the series of this year's selection, Throwback 89. And uh, she will also join the creators of Throwback 89 in a follow-up panel, which will be moderated by Chiara Bressa and is titled Innovative Formats. They will be joined uh, with uh, other creators of um, this year's selections series that uh, yeah, was in a way to format series. So, and uh, for our final and uh, third lecture this morning, we'll have uh, Daniel Jobst give us insight into um, new and progressive audio surround systems. <clears throat> and I'm very happy to pronounce that we'll have a series premiere today at 2 p.m. You will be able to be the first audience of the series Reset by Moritz Becherer. It will just appear here in the screen, uh, in, the, in the stream, so just stay, stay tuned. Um, after this, we're gonna have a short lunch break and we'll be back in the afternoon with uh, three more panels. Starting with a discussion about where the web series format is going, 
at 3 p.m., which will be moderated by Rose of Dawes uh, from the Bao series land. At 4 p.m., Dizzy Reales' very own Chongo de Brodka will discuss the web series landscapes in uh, different countries with uh, some of our partner festivals, festival directors. And last but not least, I am joined by some uh, series creators of uh, some of this year's selection series uh, in the creators panel at 5 p.m. Since this is a new experience for most of us, our guests uh, zoom in from faraway countries. I want to apologize uh, if any technical problems may occur during the day. Just stay tuned in and we'll fix, uh, we'll fix the problem as, as soon as possible. Um, with that being said, I am happy to pronounce the educational open and we'll be back here at 11 p.m. with Joël Bazagé. Stay with us.
Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Festival Di Serial for inviting me to talk to you once again and share a little bit of my humble knowledge of uh, web series. Congratulations to the team for this sixth edition and uh, good luck to all creators who are in competition. Uh, today, I would like to call your attention on one country, it's India. Indian web series are almost totally absent from the international circuit of Webfest. And as far as I know, there is no uh, dedicated festival in India for a web series. And yet, India is today one of the top five countries to produce web series. Uh, and this happened in only three years. This is really booming in India. In my database, the number of Indian web series in 2016, the total number of Indian web series in my database in 2016 was only 40. And at the end of 2019, I had more than 400 titles in my database. This number grew 10 times in only three years. Now this, this boom of uh, Indian web series, you can check it yourself, uh, because if you type uh, the word web series uh, in any browser, and go uh, to the news tab or the video tab, the majority of results that you will get will be Indian web series or Indian web series related article. Uh, and, and I know that other countries before India have uh, known a booming of web series suddenly. But in India, it's bigger and it's different. Uh, the rise of web series production in India is obviously connected to the rise of OTT platforms in the country. In the recent years, there have been many platforms uh, launching in India, and many of these platforms are offering web series. Uh, platforms like uh, Voot, Alt Balaji, Oishoi, Hulu, Prime Flix, or Z5, uh, for example, they are always strongly advertising web series. Web series seems to be the heart of their uh, programming. And they are proposing web series in all genre, all format, usually in many subtitles available. English, of course, but also sometimes uh, Italian, Spanish, Russian. They have a large range of subscription fees. They usually offer the first episodes for free. And of course, there are also Indian uh, web series that you can see on Netflix. You can see them also on Amazon Prime, which prove that uh, Indian web series have already uh, entered the international market. Uh, there are also independent Indian web series on YouTube. And on YouTube also, there has been, these past years, uh, a lot of uh, channels dedicated to web series uh, launched by uh, Indian collective of creators that are uh, broadcasting web series. And on YouTube, uh, and you can check it yourself again, uh, the audience of this web series is truly impressive. Uh, I have watched episodes of Indian web series that have made more than 20 million views only for one episode. And it's not rare. You will see that an episode of an Indian web series makes one million views. Uh, the channel Z5, the platform Z5, uh, that is broadcasting a lot of web series, is available worldwide and is actually claiming 150 million users. It's big. Uh, but of course, at that point, uh, it may be important to recall some, uh, some demographic facts about India. Of course, India is a big country. It's uh, 1.3 billion people, actually. 
600 million people connected. Half of these uh, connected users in India are between 20 and 40 years old. These are the, 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 the demographics, the statistics of the country. And of course, this is a huge market. Actually, India is considered the second largest online market in the world after China. So this explains also the uh, vitality uh, of this uh, uh, market and uh, the fact that uh, web series can find such larger audience in uh, India. And of course, uh, India is also a very specific country because uh, uh, it's a country where there are several languages. The population speaks several languages and web series, especially on YouTube, are perfect entertainment programs to uh, address one population specifically, even if they put subtitles in other languages of the country or in English. So what are uh, these uh, Indian web series? Uh, first of all, I have to say that the production values of Indian web series are very, very high. Uh, you can be surprised, and sometimes it's even spectacular. Uh, as a matter of fact, web series in India are made mostly by professionals. Uh, directors, writers, actors coming from Bollywood. And as you can check also uh, in your browser, if you type just web series, not even, you don't even need to put Indian on it. You just type web series and you go to the news and you will see that there is a big buzz about uh, who is directing, who is writing, who is acting in a new uh, web series in India. Apparently in India, doing a web series is a must. It's something that you have to do if you are in the entertainment right now. So I really invite you to discover this series. Most of them are available on YouTube or at least they are advertised on YouTube and then you can be redirected to the platform where I told you, you can see uh, at least the first episodes for free and with a, a large uh, range of uh, subtitles. So really uh, do it. Uh, so far, I did not gather a lot of information about budgets of this web series, but my first investigations showed that these web series are often made with less than a hundred thousand euro. Which, what is interesting uh, also is that uh, Indian web series they cover now a, a, a large variety of genres. Uh, when I started watching Indian web series two years ago, it was mainly uh, romance or drama. But right now, there is sci-fi, thriller, uh, even historical epoca uh, uh, productions. And uh, really, you see that, and probably because of these platforms who are uh, uh, commissioning and, 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 and broadcasting these web series, uh, you can see that the web series in India are covering a very large spectre, spectrum of, 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 of genre. And this is also very interesting to notice for a phenomenon that has happened, that has happened in only such a short time. So in my opinion, what is happening in India is very interesting and surely also encouraging for other territories. Because what is happening there is that web series are blooming in an entire ecosystem where uh, production, distribution, and promotion work together. Work together to uh, 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 feed <laughs> an audience that is super connected and super eager to get entertainment, local entertainment, lo entertainment that looks and sounds like them. I think that Indian web series tells us, tell us something that we already know that maybe we 
forget sometimes is that before being global, you need to be local. Voilà, uh, this was short, but uh, I hope uh, that uh, I gave you an insight on what is happening in uh, India and uh, mo uh, most importantly, that I gave you uh, a desire to uh, discover Indian uh, web series. If you have uh, any questions, any uh, remarks, uh, you can contact me uh, via uh, Facebook, for example. Once again, thank you, this serial and uh, good festival. Hello, I'm here with uh, Joël Bazanger for a quick Q&A. Um, Hi. Hello, Joël. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions from the audience, just uh, type them in the chat uh, on desireale.de uh, and we can ask him the questions uh, right here. Uh, first of all, I have a question, Joël. Um, I, I was interested in why um, how how come that you are are like um, into Indian um, web series? Like, what? Uh, well, why are you interested in that uh, topic? I, I wouldn't say that I am into <laughs> Indian web series, but the thing is because I am collecting this uh, database of uh, web series title, international web series title, I I, I could really uh, witness. The, the the rise of the production of uh, Indian web series it, it, it really it was like uh, suddenly it was hundreds of titles uh, in my database so I got interested and instead of just uh, uh, listing the, 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 the titles I started to watch them and I could see also the quality some some web series are really impressive and uh, I have to say that some web series could totally hook me up. I, I was like uh, hooked by, by, by some web series. I started one episode and then went to the second, you know, the, the, the kind of good web series. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, great. Um, so in your, um, in your uh, talk, you just mentioned that there, um, uh, there's not a web fest yet in India. Um, this is really uh, uh, a dedicated festival but already some movie festival and tv festival are opening to web series but uh, so far and as, as far as my knowledge there is no uh, specific web fest uh, in the age there should be there should be yeah definitely <laughs> maybe uh, in the next few years uh, there will be i hope i'm sure and um, so uh, let me check if there's any questions from the audience so far. Um, okay. Uh, John Kim says hi, Joel. Hi. <laughs> Jan Stadel also Hello. says hi. <laughs> well, that's great because it might, it, it might be night in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's staying up for us. That's great. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> So, um, so is there like um, a difference? Um, like, would you say that there's a major difference between Indian web series and web series from other parts of the world, like um, concerning length or style or? Yeah, this is something I, I forgot to talk about in my in my keynote. This is the format. Uh, effectively, Indian web series are longer. Uh, they have uh, longer episodes than what we are used to see in uh, Europe or uh, Occidental uh, uh, countries. But still, uh, they are web series. They are web series because they have no standard format for episodes. So episodes are longer, but you can have episodes that go from 70 minutes to 45 minutes in the same season. So in this aspect, they are uh, web series because you could say that Indian web series are closer to traditional series than our web series because they are on platforms, because they have like a season release to binge, etc. But uh, but the, uh, in in their format, they really are web series. They they really adapt their format to the script of every episode. I see. Okay. Well, th that's really interesting, actually. I think um, we we also have a question from an um, audience uh, right now. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, somebody wants to know if you can recommend uh, an Indian web series. Uh, yeah, I, 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 
I don't have the titles in mind. I want you to talk about it in my, uh, in my keynote. It's difficult for me because the, most of these titles are in India. <laughs> they are in India, they are in Telugu, and I would really not like to pronounce them <laughs> or even try to. But I thought about that, and, 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 and uh, I will send to the Diseriyad during this weekend a list of uh, five, ten Indian web series to watch that are available for watch and it will be posted on the website or in the Facebook page of uh, Diseriyad, yes. But sorry, but it's <laughs> really <laughs> difficult to pronounce. Uh, it's, it's already hard for me to write them when I, when I write them, <laughs> not to forget a letter and I would have absolutely no idea. And even if I, I, I was telling you, you would be like, what? <laughs> and uh, probably you could not find it. But really, as I told in my keynote, if you go to any um, uh, search engine and you just type web series and you go to the, to the video uh, tab, you will have an offer of trailers and and um, and, and episodes, and you will see it, uh, and and you will find something that you like. But I will send you a list. Don't worry, we will we will publish a list this weekend. Okay, that's great. Uh, so to the person who uh, asked that, um, just be patient. We'll have uh, recommendations from Joël Bazager uh, um, on our website or on our Facebook. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, so, is there any more questions from the audience? Um, I can't see some so far. Um, uh, greetings from Spessa Tales. <laughs> 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 and uh, okay, so if there are not any more questions, I'd uh, say thank you so much, uh, Joy Bazager. Uh, well, thank you, you Serial, uh, really, and congrats on this uh, online festival. So far, so good, and I hope that uh, it's going to stay like that all weekend. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It has been thank a pleasure, you. really. Um, so we'll be back here uh, in this uh, stream at 11.30 a.m. Uh, with uh, Back to the Future um, of historian Anja Hostmann. And uh, please stay with us. Uh, we're really happy to have you with us. Okay. Looking forward Goodbye, to that. Joel. Goodbye, ciao, Joel. Ciao. Take care.
Hallo und äh, herzlich willkommen zu meinem Talk über Emotionen, äh, Präsentation von Geschichte und der Instagram-Story-Serie Throwback89. Mein Name ist Anja Horstmann, ich bin Medienhistorikerin und freue mich sehr, dass ich am heutigen Education Day der Seriale 2020 mit dabei sein kann. Vorweg die Frage, kannst du dich noch daran erinnern, wo du am 9.11.1989 warst? Nein? Kein Problem, da bist du in guter Gesellschaft. Eventuell warst du zu jung, um eigene Erinnerungen an den Tag zu haben oder, was am wahrscheinlichsten ist, du warst zu dem Zeitpunkt noch gar nicht geboren. Der 9.11.1989, der Tag, an dem die Grenzen zwischen der ehemaligen DDR und der Bundesrepublik Deutschland geöffnet wurden. Der Tag, an dem die 40-jährige Teilung zwischen den beiden Staaten aufgehoben wurde. Der Tag, an dem die gesellschaftlichen und politischen Veränderungen des Jahres 1989 ihren krönenden Abschluss gefunden haben. Und der Tag, von dem ausgehend dann noch ganz viele andere gesellschaftliche und politische Veränderungen stattgefunden haben und auch immer noch stattfinden. Das ist jetzt ähm, 31 Jahre her und äh, letztes Jahr zum 30. Jahrestag wurde das Ereignis oder wurde dem Ereignis nochmal ganz besonders gedacht und es gab ähm, im November nochmal ganz viele ähm, verschiedene Medienprodukte, die sich ähm, der Erinnerung und den Geschehnissen ähm, dieser Zeit angenommen haben. Jubiläen und Erinnerungstage sind immer recht dankbar für Medienprodukte, die ähm, öffentliche Aufmerksamkeit ist durch die häufige Berichterstattung eh schon garantiert und die Produzentinnen äh, von den Medienprodukten können sich dann ähm, ganz gut in den allgemeinen Reigen ähm, der ganzen ähm, Erinnerungsprodukte ähm, mit einfügen. Aber ein äh, Garant oder ein Selbstläufer sind Medienprodukte zu Jahrestagen äh, nicht von sich aus. Ähm, es ist die stetige Frage, ähm, was äh, präsentiert man, wie präsentiert man es, um etwas äh, Neues darzustellen oder neue Aspekte aufzuwerfen, neue Blickweisen ähm, auf das Ereignis. Und vor allen Dingen, was die Produzentinnen und Produzenten sowie die verschiedenen Sender immer sehr umtreibt, ist, wie erreiche ich bestimmte Zielgruppen, die keine besondere Verbindung zu diesem Ereignis haben, die einfach zu jung sind oder zu dem Zeitpunkt noch gar nicht gelebt haben. Wie kann ich für diese Zielgruppen eine Verbindung aufbauen mit den Produkten zum Jahrestag? Öffentlich-rechtliche Sendeanstalt ARD ähm, hat sich diesen Herausforderungen gestellt und äh, für den Instagram-Kanal der äh, Nachrichtensendung Tagesschau ähm, eine Instagram-Story-Serie produziert, anlässlich des äh, 30-jährigen ähm, Gedenktages an die Öffnung der Grenze. Äh, der Titel lautet Throwback 89 und soll jetzt auch im weiteren Verlauf meines Talks äh, ganz besonders in den Blick genommen werden. Schaut man sich die Ankündigungen auf Instagram an ähm, was, äh, oder worum es in dieser Serie gehen soll, was einen da erwartet, dann ähm, wird darauf hingewiesen oder es wird versprochen, dass es eine ähm, interaktive Zeitreise zum Mauerfall ist, ein Instagram-Tagebuch und äh, dass man die Wende in der DDR aus Instagram-Perspektive erleben kann. Ähm, schauen wir uns doch einfach mal den Teaser an. Ich muss das irgendwie alles loswerden, was hier gerade passiert. Machen wir denn mit dem Kriegsflüchtling? Der Meier wird mich fertig machen. Der wartet nur darauf, seinen Frust abzulassen. Ich find's so cool, dass du alles fährst. Quatsch! Klar stehe ich zu dir. Alles mal herhören! Die Mauer ist auf!
Dieses äh, Instagram-Tagebuch bzw. die Instagram-Stories werden von der fiktiven Protagonistin Nora angelegt. Nora ist 17 und äh, wohnt 1989 mit ihren Eltern in Rostock. Sie macht gerade Abitur und hat danach den Wunsch, äh, Meeresbiologie zu studieren. Und ähm, der Grund, warum sie anfängt mit dem Instagram-Tagebuch oder mit den Stories, ist, dass sie alles, was sie jetzt gerade bewegt, irgendwie loswerden muss. Ähm, ihre beste Freundin ist nicht mehr da, die ist nach den Sommerferien nicht wiedergekommen. Sie ist einfach ohne Nora etwas davon ähm, zu sagen, ähm, hat sie mit ihren Eltern ähm, die DDR verlassen. Ähm, das beschäftigt Nora sehr. Ähm, dazu kommt ähm, oder dazu sind dann aber auch schöne Sachen, die sie in ihrem ähm, Tagebuch mitteilt, nämlich dass sie mit ihrem Schwarm ähm, Falk zusammengekommen ist oder endlich zusammengekommen ist. Nora kommt eher aus einem ähm, angepassteren ähm, Haushalt, ähm, während Falk eher ein bisschen unangepasster ist. Er ist Punkmusiker, hat seine Lehre als Schweißer geschmissen, was natürlich jetzt schon in meiner Erzählung zu ähm, Konflikten führt, die Nora dann weiterhin äh, beschäftigen. Ähm, Sie erzählt dieses ähm, Tagebuch oder äh, die Stories vom ähm, 19.10.1989 bis zum 9.11.1989 und ähm, hauptsächlich persönliche Dinge wie Ärger in der Schule, Ärger mit Mitschülern, Ärger mit den Eltern, mal einen Streit mit äh, Falk und eine kurzzeitige Trennung. Und das Ganze vermischt oder teilweise auch erst ausgelöst durch die ähm, Veränderungen und die Ereignisse kurz vor dem 9.11.1989. Die ähm, ARD bzw. die Tagesschau ähm, versucht durch die Instagram-Story-Serie explizit ein Format und eine Darstellungsart zu nutzen, die äh, ganz besonders ein Publikum anspricht, was äh, zu dem Zeitpunkt 9.11.1989 noch gar nicht geboren war und somit auch kaum eine Verbindung zu diesem Ereignis oder zu diesem Datum hat. Es ist, ähm, sie halten sich sozusagen an die ähm, alte Regel, erstmal die, die Menschen da abzuholen, wo sie sich gerade befinden. Und das ist ähm, instagram das sind Instagram-Stories und das ist der Umgang äh, mit neuen sozialen Medien. Das ist kein Geheimnis, ähm, dass die das so machen. Ähm, damit gehen die auch relativ offen um. Ähm, schauen wir uns doch einfach mal die Ankündigung oder eine kurze Berichterstattung über das Rollback 89 von der Tagesschau dazu an. Hier ist das Erste Deutsche Fernsehen mit der Tagesschau. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Die Grenze zwischen den beiden deutschen Staaten hat ihre Schrecken verloren. 1989 werden Millionen Fernsehzuschauer Zeugen eines historischen Moments. 2019 jährt sich dieses Ereignis zum 30. Mal. Ein Großteil der jungen Generationen hat keinen Bezug zum Mauerfall. Viele von ihnen waren damals noch nicht geboren. Genau für sie startet die Tagesschau eine interaktive Zeitreise. Mit einem Social-Media-Projekt lässt die Tagesschau vor allem junge Nutzer den Mauerfall noch einmal miterleben. Throwback 89 erzählt die Geschichte vom Mauerfall auf innovative Weise und holt junge Menschen dort ab, wo große Geschichten heute stattfinden, auf dem Smartphone. Ein ähm, innovatives und interaktives äh, Projekt, die Zuschauer da abholen, wo große Geschichten ähm, heute stattfinden, auf dem Smartphone, mit dem Smartphone. Das äh, Projekt ist sehr erfolgreich, ähm, innerhalb von einem Monat eine Reichweite von ähm, ca. 6,4 Millionen und 1,25 Millionen Interaktionen. Die Zahlen sind ein bisschen älter, es könnte mittlerweile mehr sein, aber für innerhalb von einem Monat, also dieser Countdown bis zum ähm, 9.11. Ähm, sehr erfolgreich. Und ähm, Surbeck 89 ist nicht das einzige Projekt, was ähm, gerade läuft ähm, oder gelaufen ist. Äh, es gibt noch zwei andere äh, Projekte dieser Art, Instagram-Stories, Einmal, äh, das ähm, startete letztes Jahr, 2019, 
Eva Stories, ähm, das ist äh, ein Instagram-Tagebuch basierend auf dem realen Tagebuch der ungarischen Jüdin Eva Heimann, die ähm, sozusagen den, den Holocaust ähm, aus ihrer Sicht, aus der Sicht eines jungen Mädchen äh, über Instagram erzählt. Und ähm, seit März 2020, also seit diesem Jahr, ähm, das Videotagebuch von Anne Frank, was ähm, ihre Tagebucheinträge dann auch, auch nochmal als Stories erzählt und äh, nicht ähm, als ähm, Nacherzählung äh, oder zum Nachlesen des äh, Tagebuches allein. Also bislang drei Projekte, die ähm, erfolgreich sind, aber natürlich auch für viele Diskussionen sorgen. Wie kann man, gerade was Eva-Stories und das Videotagebuch von Anne Frank anbetrifft, ähm, wie kann man Instagram und den Holocaust zusammenbringen? Dann nochmal ein, etwas eine andere Diskussion. Wie funktioniert dieses doch sehr emotionale Thema wie ähm, der, der Mauerfall? Wie kann man den dann nochmal mal nach zum, zum Erleben bringen oder Nacherleben bringen und ist das überhaupt der richtige Weg, äh, etwas zum Nacherleben zu bringen. Ähm, um dem ein bisschen näher zu kommen, wie funktioniert denn überhaupt äh, Instagram und äh, die Repräsentation von Geschichte, habe ich mir eine Expertin eingeladen ähm, und zwar Annalena Geis, äh, frischgebackene Absolventin der Fachjournalistik Geschichte und Geschichte der Universität Gießen. Annalena hat ihre BA-Thesis äh, genau über Eva Stories geschrieben und sich ganz intensiv damit auseinandergesetzt, ähm, wie denn jetzt ähm, Geschichtsdarstellung, Geschichtsrepräsentation mit der äh, neuen Form von Instagram und besonders der Storytelling-Funktion funktionieren. Hören wir doch einfach mal rein. Hallo Annalena und wie schön, dass du äh, Zeit hast und dich bereit erklärt hast, äh, mit mir über Geschichtsdarstellung und Instagram zu sprechen. Du hast ja gerade ganz erfolgreich, herzlichen Glückwunsch nochmal, deine BA-Arbeit abgegeben und hast dich in der BA-Arbeit mit Eva Story beschäftigt. Das ist eine äh, Instagram-Darstellung oder Instagram-Storytelling über ein junges Mädchen, in Ungarn während des Holocaust und das basiert auf einem Tagebuch ähm, von Eva und dem oder nach diesem Tagebuch äh, werden entsprechend kleine Geschichten erzählt. Aber du hast dich nicht nur mit Evas Story beschäftigt, sondern natürlich auch erstmal allgemein geschaut, was ist da jetzt gerade los, wie funktioniert überhaupt Instagram und Geschichtsdarstellung und das ist auch gleich die erste Frage, die ich an dich weitergeben würde. Wie funktionieren die beiden Sachen miteinander? Ja genau, also zum Thema, wie funktionieren Instagram und Geschichtsdarstellungen, gibt es in der Forschung noch nicht so viel Meinung. Grundsätzlich, ich vertrete die Auffassung, dass es eben funktioniert und wichtig ist, dass davon ausgegangen wird, dass eben, also ich hatte ähm, einen Aufsatz dazu äh, von Kirsten Frieden, die eben von der Post-Memory-Generation spricht und die eben sagt, dass man also als Problemstellung quasi ein Problem in der Erinnerungskultur hat und in der Geschichtsvermittlung, dadurch, dass auch meine Generation, also Generationen, die quasi das nicht mehr miterlebt haben und nicht, ähm, das Ereignis nicht mehr direkt miterlebt haben und auch jetzt nicht unmittelbar davon betroffen sind, ja gar keine eigene Realität dazu haben und ähm, das quasi nur durch andere erfahren können, also quasi als Post-Memory-Generation an Erinnerungslosigkeit leiden und man eben gucken muss, wie schafft man dann an diese Generation Geschichte, also das Ereignis heranzutragen? Und ich bin ja selbst dann Teil dieser Generation, die den Mauerfall nicht mehr mit, äh, miterlebt hat. Und auch meine Eltern zum Beispiel haben das nicht, also haben das klar durch ihr Alter mitbekommen, aber waren da äh, nicht mit betroffen, äh, nicht von betroffen. Und dass man eben quasi durch Herausforderungen wie Globalisierung, Digitalisierung und eben dem zeitlichen Abstand zwischen Ereignis und eigener Lebenswelt schaut, naja, was hat denn für die Zielgruppe jetzt zum Beispiel von Instagram 12 bis 19-Jährige als Hauptzielgruppe, was hat dann das Ereignis mit deren Lebensrealität zu tun? Und gerade jetzt bei dem Thema Mauerfall kommt ja ersch also erschwerend für das Projekt an sich noch hinzu, dass man ja nicht davon ausgehen kann, dass alle Menschen, die das sehen, Verwandte oder Nachbarn oder wie auch immer irgendwelche Personen kennen, ähm, die das persönlich miterlebt haben. Also es gibt ja gerade unter dem Aspekt Migrationshintergrund Menschen, die mit dem Teil der deutschen Geschichte nicht in Berührung gekommen sind, 
ähm, und das nicht als Teil der Familiengeschichte verstehen. Also auch wie schafft man es, diesen Menschen das letztendlich zu vermitteln, ohne dass man auf persönliche Erfahrungen zurückgreifen kann. Und das ist dann genau der Punkt, wo Instagram einschreibt oder Instagram ein guter Weg wäre, um äh, diese Erinnerungslosigkeit äh, mit etwas zu verknüpfen, womit die jüngere Generation, diese erinnerungslose Generation, äh, dann was mit anfangen könnte. Wie genau würde das denn funktionieren auf Instagram? Ja, zum einen ist die App an sich schon mal zielgruppenorientiert. Also meine ich bin ein bisschen zu alt dafür, aber die Zielgruppe 12 bis 19-Jährige ist halt eine Schwarz-Weiß-Doku nicht das Interessanteste, was oder wie Geschichte vermittelt werden kann. Und indem man quasi diese Zielgruppe schon auf ihrem Medium anspricht, dass sie täglich konsumieren, da gibt es verschiedene Studien zu, dass Instagram einfach die beliebteste Social-Media-App ist. Und dass man dann eben guckt, über diesen Zugang ähm, oder über, diese, über dieses Medium einen Zugang einfach zu finden, ähm, den dann letztendlich auch Menschen in meinem Alter oder Jünger interessant finden, ohne sich zu langweilen letztendlich. Ähm genau, aber da würde ich jetzt würde ich genau einhaken, weil äh, du jetzt gerade sagst, die das interessant finden. Aber ist Geschichte automatisch interessant, jetzt in unserem Fall äh, der Mauerfall, nur weil es auf Instagram ist? Also was müsste denn äh, dann noch dazukommen? Äh, was macht dieses Medium besonders aus, dass es dann tatsächlich auch geschaut wird? Also Instagram bietet ja verschiedene neue Möglichkeiten, wie erzählt werden kann. Also ich habe das auch in meiner Bachelorarbeit aufgeteilt ähm, in zwei Ebenen, letztendlich, also in zwei Untersuchungsebenen. Einmal die typische audiovisuelle Ebene, die, ich, also die klassisch jetzt auch auf eine, Fil also eine Filmanalyse übertragen werden kann. Und dann ergänzend die mediumsspezifische ähm, Instagram-Ebene, habe ich sie genannt, weil ich keinen, besseres, ähm, keinen besseren Begriff dafür hatte. Eben, dass man zum einen durch die ähm, Erzählperspektive schon eine ganz andere Storyline hat. Also es wird ja dann die fiktive oder historische äh, Protagonistin erzählt ja eben ähm, aus ihrer eigenen subjektiven Perspektive und spricht, wie das Influencer oder Blogger theoretisch auch machen sprechen die Leute direkt über die Kamera an, was ein ganz anderes Kommunikationsverhältnis schon abbildet. Und dann gibt es eben diese ganzen Instagram-Gadgets, also Filter, GIFs, Hashtags, ähm, Abstimmungsfelder, wo man auf Ja, Nein oder sowas klicken kann. Man kann Fragen stellen, die dann die, das Publikum beantworten kann. Ähm, also es ist sehr viel direkter einfach. Und so gibt es eben ganz verschiedene kleine Aspekte, die man auch als 12- bis 19-Jährige durch regelmäßige, regelmäßigen Konsum, Konsum von Insta-Stories einfach gewohnt ist und dann das einen auch anspricht. Also es wird quasi in die eigene Lebenswelt, die wird aufgegriffen und dann mit einem fremden Thema, was man vielleicht am Anfang nicht so interessant findet, irgendwie verknüpft und sich dann denkt, hm, ist ja auch eine Jugendliche in meinem Alter aus einer anderen Generation, aber irgendwas werden wir ja gemeinsam haben. Mhm. Ähm, genau, du, gerade dieses, ähm, es gibt so viele Gadgets und, und man hat das Gefühl, man kann, kann mitmachen, man kann Fragen beantworten. Also das gibt ja dann doch den Userinnen das Gefühl oder denjenigen, die sich das anschauen, dass sie daran partizipieren können. Das ist ja dann nochmal was anderes, als wenn ich jetzt im Geschichtsunterricht mir durchlese, wie lief jetzt der, der 9.11.89 ab, was ist da passiert oder ich schaue mir das an und kann dann irgendwie interaktiv sogar was mitgestalten. Das ist, glaube ich, oder das, was du eben schon erwähnt hast mit den Emojis oder Hashtags oder einem kleinen Kritzeleien und einem blinkenden Herz und so weiter. Das sind ja nicht nur Mitmachdinge oder Anschaudinge, sondern das sind ja ähm, Dinge, die einen auf einer ganz anderen Ebene ansprechen, nämlich auf dieser emotionalen Ebene. Und das ist etwas, äh, worüber ich heute hauptsächlich ähm, auch sprechen möchte, wenn ich mir nochmal gleich genauer die Serie Throwback 89 anschauen will. Wie ähm, kann denn oder wie wird Emotionalität oder Empathiefähigkeit denn durch diese neuen visuellen Formen der populären Geschichtspräsentation ähm, verknüpft oder wie wird das transportiert? Also ich denke, um die 
Frage wirklich beantworten zu können, ist erstmal wichtig, dass man nicht oder über diese Dichotomie oder vermeintliche Dichotomie zwischen Emotionen und Wissen so ein bisschen hinwegkommt. Also nur weil etwas quasi ansprechend dargestellt wird, vermittelt es nicht weniger Wissen. Und gerade Instagram als neue App, die, glaube ich, in der Informationsvermittlung noch nicht wirklich respektiert wird, also dass man da nicht gleich alle Schotten dicht macht und sagt, das funktioniert da nicht, das ist, glaube ich, ganz wichtig. Und dass man eben versteht, dass die Emotionen quasi so ein, so ein tra tragendes Element sind, um erstmal einen Zugang dazu zu finden und sagt, okay, über Emotionen kann ich das in, meinen Alt oder in meine Lebenswelt integrieren und mir das auch irgendwie vorstellen. Also gerade jetzt bei Jugendlichen, ob es letztendlich, ich glaube, Liebesbeziehungen kehren ja irgendwie immer wieder äh, in solchen Formaten, ähm, tauchen da auf, dass man darüber irgendwie versucht, einen Zugang oder eine Verbindung zwischen historischem Ereignis und eigener Lebenswelt zu schaffen, um dann das Publikum ansprechen zu können. Mhm. Um, um eine Brücke zu bauen, um, um ja, genau. Verknüpfungen herzustellen. Ja. Ähm, genau, also das ähm, würde jetzt auch schon langsam ähm, zu, zu meinem Schluss unseres Gesprächs führen, also zum, zum Ende meiner Fragen zumindest, obwohl ich weiß, dass du noch ganz viel mehr dazu erzählen könntest, äh, zu Instagram und Geschichtsvermittlung oder Geschichtsdarstellung. Aber so wie ich dich jetzt gerade verstanden habe, ähm, so richtig beschäftigt hat sich damit die Geschichtswissenschaft noch nicht, die, äh, die Medienwissenschaften vielleicht schon eher. Wenn, dann sind es so Felder wie, wie Memory oder, oder kulturelles Gedächtnis, ähm, die sich damit beschäftigen. Und jetzt zum Schluss nochmal, ähm, weil Instagram hauptsächlich für Kommunikation und Unterhaltung steht, wird automatisch immer ausgeschlossen, es kann deswegen gleichzeitig kein Informationsfluss äh, stattfinden. Und da würdest du ganz stark dagegen plädieren und sagen, dass das durchaus miteinander verbindbar ist oder miteinander verbunden werden kann. Also eher ein Hoch, um mal wieder, um, um, um das tatsächlich auch weiter auszuprobieren, Geschichte über Instagram und über Stories zu vermitteln. Ja, auf jeden Fall. Also ich denke, dass momentan die ganzen Projekte, die entstanden sind oder im Entstehen sind, es da noch ein bisschen schwierig haben oder schwer haben. Eben, dass so, ich glaube, innerhalb der Geschichtswissenschaft so ein bisschen eine abneigende Haltung vorherrscht gegen was Neues. Ja. Weil natürlich kommt es auch immer darauf an, wie die Sachen produziert sind, ob es letztendlich eine Trivialisierung oder wirklich Nutzen von der Geschichte macht. Und ich glaube, dass in Instagram ganz viel Potenzial steckt, um Geschichte für jüngere Menschen, die sich jetzt keine Schwarz-Weiß-Doku angucken möchten, aus welchen Gründen auch immer, ganz viel Poten Potenzial bietet, diese Menschen an Geschichte ranzulocken. Und das soll ja auch nicht als allumfassende Lehre dienen, sondern einfach nur einen Zugang mhm. dazu legen und die Menschen, naja, vielleicht oder die Jugendlichen zu motivieren, letztendlich sich da ein bisschen einzulesen oder sich Filme anzuschauen. Ja. Super. Ähm, vielen Dank, dass du dir Zeit genommen hast, dass du da warst und ein ähm, bisschen was geklärt hast. Vielen Dank. Tschüss. Gerne. So, ähm, genug Hintergrund äh, zu Instagram und der Darstellung von äh, Geschichte. Schauen wir uns doch mal an, was äh, Swoback 89 macht, wie dort die Verbindung zu historischen Ereignis und eigener Lebenswelt zwischen Emotionen und Informationen äh, stattfindet wo ich anfangen soll. Johanna ist einfach nicht wiedergekommen nach den Sommerferien aus Ungarn. Liebe Nora, schicke dir schon Urlaubsgrüße. Es ist heiß hier, der See ist kühl. Bla, bla, bla. Alle sagen, sie sind abgehauen. Die ganze Familie... Aber sie hätte mir doch was sagen können. Wenigstens eine Andeutung oder irgendwas. Ich hätte es doch auch für mich behalten. Das ist echt scheiße, wenn die beste Freundin nicht vertraut. Aber dass sie einfach so weg ist, einfach aus meinem Leben verschwindet, das tut richtig weh. Und es gibt Neuigkeiten, die sie wissen sollte. Deshalb mache ich das jetzt so. Ich muss alles loswerden, was um mich herum passiert. Vor allem das mit Falk. 
wir sind jetzt richtig zusammen. Er hat aber gesagt, dass er mich liebt. Oh, schon wieder meine Eltern. Er grinst so fies, wie soll nichts aus. Gleich zu Beginn, wo äh, Nora sich äh, selber einführt, äh, schmeißt sie nicht nur sich, äh, sondern auch den Zuschauer direkt in ihre Story rein, indem sie sagt, sie weiß eigentlich gar nicht, wo sie mit sie anfangen soll, es passiert so viel und fängt dann unvermittelt an, darüber zu sprechen, dass äh, ihre beste Freundin nicht mehr da ist, dass sie aus den Sommerferien nicht wiedergekommen ist. Oberschwellig ähm, läuft hier die Erzählung über die Ebene, dass Nora sehr enttäuscht über diesen Vertrauensbruch ist, dass ihre Freundin ihr das nicht gesagt hat, mh, sie nicht eingeweiht hat in die Pläne der Familie, ähm, dass sie gemeinsam über die Grenze wollen und nicht wieder zurückkommen werden, zurück in die DDR. Genau, das äh, finde ich ist schon von Anfang an ein sehr gutes Beispiel dafür, dass zwar äh, hauptsächlich mit der Gefühlsebene von Nora gespielt wird, aber äh, unterschwellig diese Informationen mitgegeben werden, denn das weiß sogar der ähm, Zuschauer oder die bestimmte Zielgruppe, die das Ganze nicht miterlebt hat, aber aus dem Schulwissen, was halt kurz vorher passiert ist, wie viele Familien tatsächlich dann über die Grenze ähm, von Ungarn ähm, geflüchtet sind und nicht wieder zurückgekommen sind äh, im Jahr äh, 1989. Genau, also das ähm, geht dann auch gleich weiter äh, mit ihrer Selbstvorstellung, dass sie sagt, ähm, genau, alles, was so um sie herum passiert, äh, der Zuschauer wird gleich mitgenommen, es passiert einfach so viel, dass man anfangen muss, eine Art äh, Tagebuch zu führen und sich äh, mitzuteilen, denn neben diesem ähm, Verlust ihrer Freundin und die Traurigkeit und auch so ein bisschen ähm, die Ärgernis darüber, über diesen Art Vertrauensbruch, kommt dann natürlich das schöne Ereignis, dass sie jetzt mit Falk richtig zusammen ist. Also wird gleich der nächste große äh, Punkt abgearbeitet oder eingeführt, wo ähm, Gefühle ähm, erzeugt werden, besonders Gefühle, wo man mitleben kann, ähm, weil man diese Gefühle genau kennt. Nämlich äh, Liebe, erste Liebe vielleicht äh, und wie schön das ist. Dann, ähm, Falk wird erstmal nur durch ein Foto eingeführt, kommt dann aber ähm, sofort danach in der nächsten Story dran, ähm, wodurch ihr ähm, Sprechen in die Kamera, ihr direktes Sprechen in ihr Tagebuch und auch zum Zuschauer unterbrochen wird, ist, dass ihre Eltern anfangen, sehr laut Fernsehen zu hören, beziehungsweise es ähm, ist so laut, dass es in ihrem Zimmer zu hören ist. Und zwar ist das die Anfangsmelodie der Tagesschau. Und ähm, was eigentlich hier nur als Ärgernis erscheint, oh, meine Eltern nerven schon wieder mit ihrem lauten Fernsehen schauen, verbirgt denn doch schon wieder die Information oder vermittelt sie mit, dass nämlich ähm, Westfernsehen durchaus geschaut wurde in der ehemaligen DDR, dass äh, viele Haushalte das empfangen konnten und auch regelmäßig geschaut haben als Abgleich zu den äh, DDR-Medien. Genau, also es ist gleich von Anfang an eine hervorragende Verbindung, wie die äh, verschiedenen Ebenen, Emotionalität, ähm, Abgleich mit der eigenen Lebenswelt und Transportieren von Informationen ähm, rübergebracht werden. Verbleiben wir weiter bei den ähm, ersten Stories, äh, die Nora postet, und zwar, wenn ähm, Falk richtig eingeführt wird, äh, und zwar mit so einer Art gestellten ähm, Musikreportage. Falk hat einen Auftritt in einem Keller, sehr wenig Publikum, äh, und äh, das, das äh, erklärt Nora dann auch gleich ein bisschen wenig Publikum und vor allen Dingen keine Punk-Fans. Also wird gleich klar gemacht, äh, Falk ist Punkmusiker, äh, was sich dann natürlich auch sofort erklärt, wenn sie anfangen zu spielen. Ähm, also Falk wird gleich von Anfang an auch mit, sein, äh, mit seiner Art Unangepasstheit eingeführt. Und das Ganze wird dann weitergeführt mit einer Art äh, gespielten Interview auf dem Sofa, wo Nora ihn fragt, äh, wie er denn seine Musikkarriere äh, plant oder sieht in der nächsten Zeit. Und dann ähm, fängt Falk an zu erklären, ähm, dass ähm, man als Punk nicht besonders hoch angesehen ist in der ehemaligen DDR oder zu dem Zeitpunkt noch DDR. 
und äh, dass man als asozial gesehen wird und nicht erwünscht ist und so weiter und so fort. Äh, etwas, was auf den ersten Blick ähm, vielleicht gar nicht ähm, als ähm, besonders interessant ähm, erstmal wirkt oder als Informationen, die nicht notwendig sind, sind aber dennoch dann die Informationen, die wichtig sind, um zu verstehen, warum Falk ähm, als eher unangepasst gilt oder als sogar asozial, äh, arbeitsscheuer äh, bezeichnet wird in der ehemaligen DDR, wie dort nämlich ähm, Punkmusik äh, gesehen wurde, ähm, wie Punkmusiker gesehen wurden ähm, und äh, welche Schwierigkeiten auch damit verbunden waren. Also das ist ähm, dann wieder eine Art und Weise, wie über das scheinbare Hobby oder das, was Falk ausmacht, wieder eine neue Ebene mit reinkommt, nämlich was ist eigentlich los mit äh, Jugendkultur, äh, mit Gegenkulturen in der ähm, DDR zu dem Zeitpunkt. Okay, sind jetzt nicht so viele Leute ja, und auch nicht gerade Punkfans, aber sie stehen auf einer Bühne. Und bald wird sich rumsprechen, wie gut die Jungs sind. Ich sitze hier mit Falk Schwitzkowski, einer Neuentdeckung der Rostocker Punk-Szene. Falk, wie stellst du dir deine Zukunft im Musikgeschäft vor? Das Punk kommt man hier nicht weiter. Wir halten uns für asoziale Chaoten oder was weiß ich. Wir hören gar nicht richtig zu. Was hier nicht nett und ordentlich ist, wird bekämpft, aber ist mir voll Schnuppe, solange wir es gut finden. Und du natürlich. Gehen wir nochmal kurz zurück zu der ähm, Szene, wo äh, Noras Eltern die Tagesschau schauen, ähm, denn das ähm, fand ich ein sehr schönes Beispiel dafür, wie mit ähm, Originalfilmaufnahmen oder Originalfernsehaufnahmen gearbeitet wurde und so eine Art Intermedialität erzeugt wird. So, ähm, wenn Nora anfängt mit ihrem Handy das äh, Fernsehen abzufilmen, ähm, wo ähm, die Fernsehaufnahmen laufen, ähm, von dem Zeitpunkt oder dem Tag, wo Honecker zurückgetreten ist. Sehr schön ist auch die, die ähm, Szene, die dann gezeigt wird, wo das äh, DDR-Fernsehen ähm, mit zwei Arbeitern spricht, die ähm, durchaus eine kritische Meinung haben, ähm, was jetzt gerade politisch in der DDR läuft ähm, und dass die Tagesschau dann selber äh, kommentiert, dass solche Aufnahmen zuvor äh, nicht möglich gewesen wären. Also das ist ähm, wieder ein ganzer Schwung oder wieder ein ganzer Blumenstrauß äh, an Informationen, die damit geliefert werden, nämlich äh, gleichzeitig etwas über das Mediensystem der DDR, wie das funktioniert hat und ähm, auch wie sich das Mediensystem in den ähm, Wochen vor dem 9.11.1989 verändert haben und dass diese Veränderungen im Mediensystem auch ganz viel dazu beigetragen haben, dass der 9.11.1989 eigentlich passieren konnte. Ich dass ihr mich liebt. Schon wieder meine Eltern. Der grinst so fies, dieser Kranz. Aus wie ist mir egal, solange er dafür sorgt, dass hier was passiert. Das ist auch nur so einer, den haben die da hingesetzt wie so eine Puppe. Gucken wir mal, ob der unsere Leute aufhalten kann. Aus Ostberlin, Klaus Richter. Die aktuelle Kamera berichtet, die neue Nummer 1 der SED, Egon Krenz, geht unter das Volk unter Berliner Arbeiter. Das ist eine Vielzahl von Dingen, die sie angestaut hat. Und bin ich auch der Meinung, dass da echte Fehler gemacht wurden, weil nicht darüber diskutiert wurde in den letzten Jahren. Ob solche Äußerungen im DDR-Fernsehen noch vor wenigen Wochen undenkbar. Und so berichten DDR-Zeitungen über den Führungswechsel. In großer Aufmachung, aber ohne Kommentar. Es fehlt jede Würdigung von Erich Honecker. Man druckt nur seine Abschiedserklärung vor dem ZK. Es findet zwar kein hierarchisches ähm, Verhältnis ähm, statt zwischen ähm, Noras Geschichte und Informationen ähm, oder dass die Emotionen äh, den Informationen überwiegen. Äh, 
nichtsdestotrotz ist es oftmals ähm, denn doch voneinander ähm, getrennt, in dem Sinne, dass die Informationen eher im Hintergrund laufen. Ähm, schauen wir uns dann den Schluss der Serie äh, genauer an. Dann ähm, ist es zum ersten Mal so, dass die ähm, intermediale Perspektive aufgegeben wird und ähm, Archivaufnahmen gleichwertig ähm, gezeigt werden zu den äh, gedrehten ähm, Storyaufnahmen von Nora. Wenn es nämlich darum geht, dass sie tatsächlich dann äh, nach Berlin fahren und mit dabei sind beim, äh, bei der Öffnung der Mauer oder bei den ersten äh, Freudetaumel äh, und äh, Partys, die stattfinden, als die Grenze dann tatsächlich geöffnet ist. Das äh, wäre dann sozusagen auch, äh, das einmal laufen zu lassen und diese Gleichwertigkeit oder dieses gleichzeitige Ablaufen von Archivmaterial und Noras Einstellung wäre dann auch mein Schlusswort, ähm, ohne viel äh, noch dazu zu erklären ähm, anschließend. Denn ich würde eher empfehlen, da ich jetzt nur Ausschnitte aus dem Anfang gezeigt habe und dann zum Schluss, sich doch ganz dringend noch anzuschauen, was ist dazwischen und nochmal genauer hinzuschauen, wo passieren eigentlich diese Momente, wo verschiedene Lebenswelten miteinander verknüpft werden, wo versucht wird, die Brücke zwischen 1989 und 2019 zu füllen mit ähm, Emotionen und Informationen und wie gut das doch eigentlich in dem Storytelling-Apparat äh, ähm, Instagram funktioniert. Zum Schluss noch übrig zu sagen, vielen Dank, ähm, dass ich A, meinen Talk hier halten durfte, B, dass ich diese tolle Serie oder dass ich mich mit dieser tollen Serie beschäftigen durfte und äh, vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen. Hey, Thomas, mach bitte schon mal lauter. Leute, alles mal herhören, die Mauer ist auf. Nee, kein Scherz jetzt. Die Mauer ist auf. In Berlin rennen wir einfach rüber. Ab nach Berlin. Knappe vor meinem Alten. Ab nach Berlin. Nora. Also wer ist das? Doch, Wahnsinn! Wahnsinn! Ich weiß nicht, was ich bist du? 28 Jahre, ist die Stunde. Wow, ich bin sehr glücklich. Das ist unglaublich. Mutti, Party, wir sind drüben. Morgen Mittag bin ich wieder da, versprochen. Seit dem Bau der Mauer am 13. August 1961 haben wir diesen Tag herbeigesehen und herbeigehofft. Wir Deutschen sind jetzt das glücklichste Volk auf der Welt.
everyone and welcome to this new panel organized by the educational team of uh, this Reale. You are now watching the Innovative Formats panel and here is Chiara Bressa. Uh, I'm founder of uh, Worldwide Web Series, an Italian blog about uh, web series and digital series uh, uh, since uh, 2013, yes. And here with me, you can uh, see there are some amazing people and creators uh, ready for what is going to be a really interesting discussion. Let's welcome each one of them, starting from uh, Anja Horstmann, who just ended an interesting lecture about uh, Throwback 89. Please, Anja, introduce yourself. Yes. Hello. Uh, yeah. Um, it's very nice to be in this uh, panel, in this dis discussion. I'm a media historian and um, specialized in film and photo history. And um, it's very nice for me because I'm on the on, uh, one side, I'm a user. And on the other side, I can um, have a deeper look uh, in, in this series and um, this is my second time uh, on the Education Day, and every year there are so much uh, or so good uh, series. I'm I'm exciting uh, all the way. <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> Thank you, Anya. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And then uh, let's present the three creator of the amazing project uh, Throwback Eighty Nine. Please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, starting from uh, Svenja. Yes, hi, my name is Svenja Freise. I'm an editor at uh, the NDR, which is the Northern German uh, Public Service Broadcaster. And I work for the Web Video Unit there, which is a unit that's focused on the development of innovative formats and uh, also strategies. And uh, within Throwback 89, I worked as an executive producer. And I'm very happy and uh, excited for this panel. Thank you for joining us. Then we have the Neil, also from Throwback. Hi, everybody. I'm Neil. Um, yes, I'm one of the um, authors of the project uh, with Ricardo and uh, yeah, Ricardo Zale and Ira Weddle. We wrote the um, whole story, and uh, Ricardo and me, we directed also Throwback. And yeah, we are really happy about this project because it was the first time uh, we had um, some chance to do some innovative thing like this and yes now I'm really glad to be also here in this panel. Thank you for joining us and Ricarda so sorry you are having some uh, problem uh, can you introduce yourself or we can go on because I think Neil already said everything should I just uh, call her maybe? Okay, don't worry, we go on. She, she can catch up later, it's not a problem at all. And then we have uh, uh, some really interesting projects that are much fun and interactive. Uh, let's start with uh, Sebastian. Please introduce yourself. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm the creator of Altesk, it's an interactive uh, series. I think I'm the only one in America right now. It's very early here, but uh, uh, I'm in the US right now. I'm from Argentina, South America, and um, the the series is an interactive. I think uh, there are more, uh, others interactive series here, but uh, in my case, uh, it's a, it's like comedy and science fiction series, and it mixes up uh, a lot of uh, video games features in the series. So it's like a, a, a mixture between a, a video game and a, and a series. And that's it. Thank you. We are going to talk about your all your project or the interaction part. It is really amazing. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Then we have uh, uh, Valerio from uh, my country, from Italy. Please introduce Everyone. yourself. Hi. Hi everyone. I'm Valerio Camelin. I'm an actor of uh, the set party, La Festa Triste, as we call it in Italy, in Italy. And it's an interactive game series, probably a game series, most probably. And uh, it's a project divided into it's a web series and then a live show in theaters. But I'm, I'm going to talk 
later about this. Um, I'm excited to be here with you guys. Thank you for joining us. And then the other interactive series of the panel. Say hello to Moritz. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, well, I'm based here in Frankfurt, and uh, we made this uh, series reset. We shot it here and in Bangkok, Thailand. So um, I'm very happy, first of all, to join you guys um, here, of course, in this panel and in the stream later on, where, where our uh, world premiere is going to be shown. Um, and um, yeah, first of all, maybe the interesting point at this project is that we made it in one week, <coughs> which is uh, super, um, yeah, it, it made, uh, it caused a lot of improvisations. And um, <clears throat> therefore, I'm very happy that, um, that we had this very well start now with the project that we just made in the beginning of this year. Well, you can talk about yeah. it later. Thank you so much, because in one week, it's crazy. What? <laughs> in one week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, uh, and a really interesting uh, project uh, is the one uh, titled uh, Swipe, and we have Martin. Hello, Martin. Hello, hello. Great to be hello. here uh, virtually. Uh, <laughs> almost, it's almost the same thing, but not quite. Uh, yeah, I'm um, the writer and director of uh, Swipe, which is a seven part uh, web series uh, in which each episode focuses on a different character, and we uh, go through a different kind of story, but in each episode, the phone, their mobile phone is the center of the story visually and also in narratively. And we uh, follow everything that happens uh, as if you're looking on the phone with you know, app interactions and social media postings. Um, so it really, it really dives into the impact that, that uh, smartphones have on our daily lives from the point of view of our gaze on our phones. I, I, I find it really, really interesting. And I have some questions for you later. So thank sure. you so much for joining us. And now that you have met all these amazing people, we can start with some question. And I would like to start with uh, the Target Show project. It's a Target Show project, right? Throwback 89. OK. Yes. Yeah, and, it's, uh, it's uh, a Target Show and NDR project so okay. we did it together mm -hmm. and i would like to to ask you um why did you what what did make you uh to choose a short format um teen drama shared as uh, instagram stories instead of uh, a classical uh online series shared on a video platform i, I hope it's english what i asked <laughs> yeah um Neil, Ricarda, do you want to say something? Otherwise, I will just start. Well, um, for us, you know, the, the 13th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall was um, a, a huge topic uh, last year. And um, I think none of us were uh, even born at the time of the fall. So um, we watched from the perspective, or we approached this project from the uh, perspective um, of people who yeah, needed a different approach on, on uh, the story. So we wanted to make it um, very personal, very authentic, and uh, through um, a platform that was easy accessible. And, and um, we, you know, thought about uh, Instagram stories and uh, how people share their personal life on there. So um, I think that's basically why we chose that, pro um, that platform, because it's so personal, it's so... Um, interactive in a way and um, yeah and I would like to add that we wanted to um, explain what happened to people um, three weeks before the fall of the wall so we thought like we could put these in little um, films to um, reach the young generation with a topic like a histor historical topic that is yeah some kind of maybe boring <laughs> or not accessible for young people. And that was like the way to talk to young people in their language through Instagram. Then. Yeah, and, and what we also heard in the talk from Anja Horstmann before, she mentioned the project Eva stories. 
um, for us, um, we, we were really inspired also by Eva stories and we asked ourselves, can we take um, this mechanic, this dramaturgy of Eva stories, this uh, core idea into um, a German topic and which is not so far away, like 30 years ago, and can we connect it to archive footage and can we change some parameters of the story with this real-time storytelling in the sense that every day when we published the diary uh, that was exactly the same day 30 years later so we had this kind of like real-time um, layer which uh, didn't exist in Eva stories so we were kind of like um, inspired by Eva stories and, and trying to figure out what we would we could change what we could add and if that would work with like a German audience and with the German uh, brand or with the German um, TV like public television and how, which was the feedback from the the, the audience it was a great feedback. Actually, um, we were very uh, concerned about that because we posted on the um, Instagram account of the Tagesschau, um, which is usually a newscast. And, you know, uh, the followers of, of Tagesschau are used to, you know, getting news on the story. So um, we thought about that for a long time. And actually, in the first place, we, we thought about doing it um, like Eva stories on a different account. But uh, we wanted to do this experiment and we wanted to try it and to, to um, use the reach that uh, the platform of, of Tagesschau had. And um, actually users were very supportive and uh, we even got feedback from teachers who said, I'm showing this in my classroom right now and, and uh, how long will it go on? And um, yeah, we were very um, positively surprised by that. Well, no, I find it a really, a really smart, really intelligent project because you really bring a, a huge, important part of history to people that uh, weren't there. Yeah, and uh, I, I just said that that we weren't there actually <laughs> at that time yeah. as well. So um, for us, it was very important that we um, um, got every detail right and that we uh, really looked into all the the facts. For example, we researched uh, how the weather was at that time and we because we had a scene actually where they would um, uh, sleep uh, at the beach and, and stay there overnight. But uh, after researching, we found out, well, it was uh, minus degrees, so they yeah. couldn't have d done that uh, on that day. So. Uh, we were ve very uh, detailed about that and even um, talked to, I think it was at least 10 um, contemporary witnesses of that time. So we would get right, what would you eat uh, for dinner? Uh, what kind of music would you listen to? What would be your idol? So um, that was very important to us and also uh, to the team of Tagesschau. Well, you, you did it really well, in my opinion. Uh, it was a really good, uh, really good job. And I would like to... Uh, include uh, Anya in this uh, conversation, asking her uh, if uh, this uh, kind of structure, if this kind of format can be uh, the, the, the medium to bring a history to future generation. Yes, um, of course, uh, it can be one of the parts. One of. Uh, Genau, it's it's not um, the the um, the new miracle uh, to interest young people in history, but it's a good way um, to to um, try out new things um, and um, to uh, reach people, the young people, when uh, where they actually are. Um, they are looking at their uh, smartphones uh, and they they use their their smartphones. And um, this is um, always, um, on, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit complicated because on the one hand, everybody says, yes, this is good, this is new, this is exciting, well done. And on the other hand, uh, people say, um, you cannot um, work with history or you cannot represent mm -hmm. or history in such a way because it's um, convenient, uh, it's only enter entertainment, uh, mm -hmm. it's um, just um, little short stories and what is about the context. Um, 
Okay, um, yes, uh, two, two sides. Um, and I think Throwback 89 brings um, this side very good together, the entertainment um, and uh, also the um, teaching uh, about some information and about some background without saying, uh, oh, look, you can learn something. Also, this is uh, what young people don't like. Um, um, you have to look, uh, you have to, to read this or you have to watch this. And um, this is all in the series without... Um, Without looking from above, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's on, yeah. uh, yes, it's on the, the same um, eye level. Mm -hmm. Eye level, yes, yes, it's the same eye level, and this is very well done. You say um, you you try to be very authentic. Uh, the weather, the food, the interior, and uh, this is very well done because um, you see uh, the special table. Uh, in the living room from the parents. It's a special table they have in the, um, 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 have at that uh, time, Mufu um, tea is the name, <laughs> Mufu tea, uh, multifunctional. Yes. Okay. And in, um, it's, it's only in the room and uh, insiders or uh, some people know, okay, this is our original. And uh, it's not, oh, um, it's not, uh, it's without explanation. And this is very good. Um, it's all, uh, like, all in, yes. It's all in, perfect. All in. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. And it was perfect. And I, I believe we have a video you want to show, right? Okay. So can I ask to the Desireala team to show the video live? Hier ist das Erste Deutsche Fernsehen mit der Tagesschau. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Die Grenze zwischen den beiden deutschen Staaten hat ihre Schrecken verloren. In 1989, millions of TV viewers witness a historic moment. In 2019, this moment marks its 30th anniversary. Today's young generation is struggling to understand the significance of this event, as many of them weren't born yet. That's why Tagesschau invites them on an interactive journey back in time. Mit einem Social-Media-Projekt lässt die Tagesschau vor allem junge Nutzer den Mauerfall noch einmal miterleben. Throwback 89 tells the story of the fall of the Berlin Wall in an innovative way, while knowing exactly where to reach their young audience on their smartphone. As the first ones in Germany, Tagesschau used Snapchat's new landmarker lens. Visitors of Frankenburger Tour were able to virtually tear down Berlin Wall and experience that moment of joy at the exact location that, back then, became a symbol for freedom. I can never from my family so getrennt sein. I'm a complete family man, so I can't imagine. Never Divided Again points out how important solidarity is. And everyone took a stand. Tagesschau also demonstrated how it feels to live in a divided country in a fictional story series on Instagram, with its story beginning three weeks before the fall of the wall. And in a rebuilt studio on site, visitors could announce history's great news again themselves. With a reach of 6.4 million and 1.25 million interactions in less than a month, Throwback 89 got through to every third person in the target group. This initiative not only increased the lead of Tagesschau as number one news broadcaster on social media, but also sets an example that such a division must never happen again. Ricarda just wrote that she uh, lost the connection again, but now she's waiting for an exception. Or... Okay, that's not a problem. We are now live again. And uh, when Ricarda will be okay, she can pop up in any moment. And uh, thank you for the video. Uh, it was a really, really amazing project. Go watch uh, um, Throwback 89. Uh, it's on Videmic app, right? For this Ariale. 
and on, on Tagesschau Instagram. Perfect. And now I want to uh, do some to have some question, a chit chat with another uh, smartphone project that is um, Swipe. And we have Martin here. Please, uh, hello again. Tell us about hello, hello. Uh, your project really quickly, because I have two questions for you. Uh, okay, you want me to explain the project? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Swipe is a, a, a seven-part series um, about the, the daily the impact that smartphones have on our daily lives. So we follow different characters and find out what's happening to them uh, through their smartphone. And we're looking on actual smartphones. So there's no special effects, no graphics, no visual effects. Everything you see is actual and real. So we use real phones, real app interactions, all in uninterrupted takes. Ah, well, that's 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 like that's um, the perfect sentence uh, because I want to attach my question to why did you choose the smartphone point of view? Because you yeah. have kind of a Wes Anderson shit with a with a the, the smartphone fix in the middle. Yeah. All the time, you can you uh, can see in the face uh, the character only when he took uh, or she took a selfie. Yeah. Exactly. Everything is from why. Is that you see their thing? thumbs a lot. They have great yeah. thumbs, and you can do quite some, uh, uh, you know, uh, inspired acting by shaking <laughs> your thumb just before swiping Tinder to the left. You know that kind of thing. So it was really fun to investigate how you can tell drama through, you know, all these micro details on the phone. But um, yeah, the, the reason I, it's really a very specific visual concept, the phone in the middle and the rest of the world around it is blurred. So you do see mm -hmm. the yeah. world around the phone. It's not like you just see the phone, but it's blurred and also audio blurred. And it's really a visualization of how I look, when I look at my phone, that's what happens. I focus on the phone and I still have a sense of my surroundings, but it's blurred somewhat. Uh, and that's one of the themes is how the virtual world of the phone um, uh, correlates and, and uh, with the real world, right? And what, what wins, what's what's real uh, when the phone reality sometimes is more important than the reality around us. Uh, and the reason I wanted to do that uh, this way is I, I, I really wanted to tell a story about the love-hate relationship I have with my phone because I, I love my phone and what I can do with it but I hate the person I become very often. And for me, that was essential. There's drama there, you can tell stories. Uh, so that's that's the basic uh, start of the journey. And then we thought, okay, how can I do this with the phone? And I really wanted to use a real phone and real interactions, because I wanted to make it tactile. Uh, I don't, what you usually see when there's mobile phone stuff in, in general, normal drama or cinema, is it's animation and the world is always the perfect, right? You get in instant text messages and people react. But that's not how phones are. They're messy, right? And sometimes the, the battery goes empty or you mistype uh, or, or you're hesitant before you send something. So all these things are only possible if you do it with real phones. So uh, yeah, we basically stuck a phone in front of a camera uh, yeah. and had our actors snuggle up to the cameraman and type uh, and do everything. Uh, and then we had 26 iPhones behind the camera with our team sending you know, the right messages at the right time <laughs> It was completely insane to do, so, uh, and I'll never ever do it again. <laughs> we did it. Yeah. My next question was, uh, how was de developing uh, it from the concept uh, until the shooting, also and yeah. the editing? Because uh, I think it wasn't easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it was a lot of lot of rehearsals, well, technical rehearsals, trying to figure out how we're going to do this. Uh, and then creating, we have the scripts, but then the script also, you know, what, what do you tell, what part of the story can you tell with what app and what do you actually see and think of ways to be able to see our main character. So as you mentioned, the selfie, you have to have a, some, some sense of an audience that you know, okay, this is the main character, which is obvious. You can just make a close up, but you don't have that option. Uh, and then how can you make drama? How can you make these characters come alive, even if you only see their thumb and phone? So all of this took a lot of uh, effort in really figuring out, rehearsing with our crew, with actors. So we rehearsed uh, uh, with actors and the whole setup and crew and basically wrote the visual scripts during our period of three to four months. Uh, and then we finally had everything in place. Uh, and then we shot each episode in two days. So each episode is about 12 minutes. Uh, and it was, we were like a military operation uh, you know, all set to go. 
uh, and of course, a lot of things uh, went haywire anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> most of it, uh, yeah, it's all preparation. So that stuff was really figuring it out. Uh, and just and then afterwards, I really had no idea if the series would actually communicate drama because uh, my worst fear was that we just have thumbs moving over a phone and not having any sense of of drama. And I think whatever you do, even for any innovative series, I think the basic, it's always should be about story, about people. It should touch you as a human. Uh, and uh, well, would that work if we just see a phone? That was my biggest fear, but uh, I think we no, got but, to do that. Yes, you know? yeah, I can I can say that you did it for, in my opinion, because I, I, I was angry with a girl at the, the, the Tinder date, because it was like switch off that phone. You are on a yeah. date. I was angry. I was oh my god. She tapped. She miss uh, miss tap something. So you did it. Uh, you did it, and yeah. it was. Uh, it's the beauty of this uh, this format because you can experiment something really different from what we are used to watch on TV and uh, at the cinema at the movies. Yeah. So it was really Thank interesting you, to watch. And do you have questions, guys, or does are there are question a question from Enrico on Facebook? Presenting. Okay, we have a, we have a question from Facebook. Enrico asked, "Presenting history on Instagram isn't there the danger that the audience thinks people back then were connected the same way we are now?" So I think this is a question for Throwback eighty nine. Do you do, do you get can you see the the, the question perfect do you yeah i think our solution was that we um started every story with a date so you could see it was um 30 years ago what happened in the story that we presented so i guess yeah if you didn't see this time maybe it could be a problem but um, in combination with the archive, I think um, that wasn't a big issue. So I, I didn't hear anything of our audience about this. Yeah, and, and I would add that every 16 year old or 15 year old today knows that the invention of a mobile phone is rather a newer invention and that this doesn't exist in, the, in 1989 and that people were not able to so easily video record and then send it instantly to someone, to a friend or something. And also um, Noah is kind of sending this, she's talking towards her friend, she's making this diary towards her friend, but it's more like an interior monologue in a way because um, her friend doesn't have <laughs> internet or a phone because that didn't exist. So I think um, that uh, we, we didn't get any feedback, like people were confused or teenagers didn't understand that. And we avoid yeah. to uh, say something like smartphone. That wasn't yeah, that's, yeah, that's a big part. We didn't make the, uh, the actual, uh, you know, kind of recording via an Instagram story. We didn't make that part of the story. So we always uh, made it kind of, yeah, not, not part of the story with what she is recording. So she, she, we didn't even call it the camera. So we, um, yeah, try to avoid uh, naming it kind of to, to uh, don't uh, cause any confusion at that point. Anya, do you want to add something? Um, um, the no? only uh, the audience is always uh, smarter than we think. Um, okay, I, I think there's no prob problem that anybody would think that is um, real time um, now. Um, and, and so um, 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 using, uh, using a new social media for transporting uh, history is not uh, to declare the, the audience uh, is a dumb audience. Uh, this is uh, two different um, things. Okay, so yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, I totally agree. And okay, there are questions for Swipe or about Swipe. Yes. Yes. Uh, I wonder how your your script looks because um, <laughs> did you actually write down all the text messages with you know time frames or uh, how did you do yeah. that? Oh, okay. basically we had, we had two versions. The first script looks like a normal script, in, but then every scene heading had what app uh, was it was the story told in, uh, and then uh, written out how we see that. 
Uh, but then we created a, 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 like an alternate version of the script within the with the look and feel of each app, so we could actually see how we're going to shoot it. Because it's uh, you know often sometimes you want to shoot a shot reverse to people having a conversation, and how do we see the other person, or how do we get that information? Um, and that was so that we really made a visual uh, referential uh, guide, as it were, of the script, and that's what we used on set to communicate because even for our crew and cast it was sometimes completely mind-boggling <laughs> well, how uh, how are we going to tell the the story or the scene so uh, yeah there was a bit of a mix of that thank you for the question because it was really inter interesting and it it helps me because I, I want to connect to our interactive careers we have three different uh, interactive web series and uh, the, I want to do First, uh, a general question, and you can chat and answer as you prefer. Um, I always uh, uh, thought that writing uh, um, an interactive series, uh, it's really hard because the creator has to uh, write different paths, different stories that can live uh, together, that they have to be interact one to each other, but they have to stand also by themselves. So can you tell us how it is to write an interactive series with all the paths and the scenarios you imagine? We can start from Sebastian and then go. OK, thank you. Hi, okay. Sebastian. Hi, how are you doing? Interact uh, OK, the, the main thing is the, like the decision when you have to choose has to be like really intense, you know? So the, uh, the viewer has like a, a real intention to choose between the two options. Because if the, the, the decision is irrelevant to the story, uh, the story moves on and uh, the, any choice is the same. So uh, meeting that point of tension in the story, uh, in, my, in my case, is uh, every two minutes. So it's very hard to uh, get there in a very short uh, space of time, you know? Yeah. In two minutes, you have to get to a, like a, uh, a turning point in the story so the uh, viewer can like really think about uh, what choices he he's he, he choosing. So, uh, every, so every two minutes, so you have a lot of different, how many episodes do you have to have the choice? How many chapters? Uh, yes. Uh, 14. 14, so you have okay. to choose like seven or eight times. Um, the whole story is half an hour, it's a, like a micro series, you know. So every two minutes you have to choose, and um, some uh, choices are like this, like uh, very strong for the story, or uh, and others are like more uh, which way you want to see the story uh, go around, you know. So um, yes, it's quite a, like a, an experience to write this this kind of interactive thing. But once you get a, the mood on it, it's like a very interesting, you know. Yes, I definitely I, I agree. Been in the format for a long time now, so uh, I'm eager to to move forward in it. And <laughs> do the other two interactive series want to add? Because I think you have kind of the same interaction with the content. So the the the. Uh, the, the audience has to make a choice, mm -hmm. but you have different plots because you have video game. Uh, the set story has a surreal scenario with a lot of theater also. And uh, Moritz uh, has a thriller drama situation with a lot of money. But, it is, but we have to choose the path, and we can, in any case, have a game over, right? In all of your stories. Okay. Andrea, do you want to tell us how is to write and create uh, an interactive series uh, and bring also theater in the interactive series? Uh, okay. Um, the creation of the set party was very, very difficult because there was a uh, complex web in, of scenes in which we had to move uh, as actors as well just to be concrete and just to be just to be solid in our in our place 
uh, for the creators, it was very difficult to to move inside th this web because every single way has a, a different journey, but they end all with the same finale, which is the opening, the introduction to the live show, which explain all the story and all the absurd story of the web series, of the game series. So it was a, an amazing job, uh, very hard, very difficult. Um, but I think we've done a great job, guys. <laughs> um, it was very, very funny because it was like a nightmare in which we have to be grotesque, absurd, at the same time funny and uh, comical, uh, not losing our focus on the young part of audience. We've got here in Italy at least uh, a lack of audience, uh, a young audience in theaters, and we would like to catch up them in another way talking their language, trying to give them the length of attention they have in this moment, trying to seduce them uh, in a certain way and bring them back with us in theater. Uh, that was our first focus. The second, was, the second one was to trying to describe uh, our society in a certain way um, with giving, through giving uh, uh, the audience the, just the perception of feel of freedom in, cho in choosing something while at the same time we were choosing for them because we were driving what we were leading them to uh, an only finale and one only finale mm -hmm. it, like what Cincera did in in the expo of 67 in Montreal with Kino Automat um, giving the illusion to the audience uh, to feel free of choosing uh, and they were not free uh, it's the same thing plus feminists that happened to us, every one of us, uh, while we seek information, for example, on the internet. We move into a web uh, in which we uh, are seeking for our personal uh, way of build up a truth, a, a reality, but it's not your, it's not the only one. It, it depends on what kind of reality you want for you. And does it, is it enough to feel free to define this freedom? I don't know. <laughs> we were trying to, to play with the story and with the mechanism of the storytelling at the same time. Which feedback do you both have to this interaction with, the, with, with this uh, false freedom you gave to the audience? Which feedback the audience gave you? I think almost every single person did all the 26 episodes at the end. So tried every different way to get to the finale. So they discovered that it was a cheating. Uh, but uh, it's not it's not important. I just would like you to know that what you are choosing uh, um, without being based on p without the pillar of knowledge is just uh, the surface. It's, it's not all. And I um, do well, uh, it's important to follow even the live show because in do the live show, there's the strip the, the explanation, the description of this mechanism. Hmm. Right. And Sebastian, do you have a feedback from the the audience that interact with your? Uh, my series is not online yet. Uh, it's oh, coming okay. in July, so I hope it's, it's good. So we have to wait uh, the audience feedback. Okay. And Moritz, you didn't have you don't have the the, the feedback because it's a premiere at Isariale. Yes. <clears throat> but please. Well, without spoiler, please introduce your project and tell us how was to write an interactive content in one week. Well, I wasn't actually not writing it in one week, like but shooting and creating all this, um, the things behind. Well, um, yeah. First of all, of course, when we when we develop a story, we're not thinking about um, to make an innovative format in the first place because first of all, we think about the idea and how to develop the idea to make a film or a series or whatever. So in this place, um, the decision itself was actually the main theme of the story. So we thought that, um, you know, in our time, everybody can make decisions every day. You are over, uh, you have a lot of tons of decisions that you can make in the web or um, in your daily life or choosing a partner. Maybe Swipe can tell a story about that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, or uh, I haven't seen the project, unfortunately. But as Martin also mentioned, uh, of course, uh, content is a very important thing 
that we are following, first of all, and um, to stand to your own decision yeah, and to what makes you, uh, what it takes to make a decision uh, to think about that, that leads us to all these channels and to what the, actually to the goal where, uh, of the story, like, um, let's say like that. So um, the main conflict uh, is, is about making decisions and what can happen if you're not going to make a decision. And that's why we choose the, the form uh, that you can choose uh, at the end of the stories, different, um, different ways. And not always if, if the way is uh, first, in the first place, it looks like a wrong way. Maybe you think about it twice and maybe it was not wrong. So um, yeah, I hope you, you will see it and uh, enjoy. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be, Ricardo, do you have a question? Yeah, I would like to Hi. ask a question. Um, yeah. First of all, um, to, the, to the three guys making interactive, um, series. First of all, congratulations for making an interactive series. I think this is really cool. Like your project sounds really amazing and I definitely am going to look I'm going to check them out um, later today and I'm looking forward to that because I think I mean telling interactive makes everything even a bit more complicated in an additional layer in writing and in structure and in dramaturgy. So I think this is really cool. And um, my question is um, probably I mean you probably all know the interactive series uh, Bandersnatch, which was launched on Netflix. And I personally, I was so overwhelmed positively by that um, interactive film. And I was, I thought that there would have been more interactive film launched by now, because I thought that a Bandersnatch got a, a, a lot of positive um, feedback, there was a lot of buzz, and I was thinking that Netflix was really moving more into this kind of interactive um, area, but uh, until so far, they didn't really launch that much or nothing really compared from the scale to Bandersnatch, and so I was a bit disappointed, um, but then, I mean, there are new players on this market, like Creepy, and I mean, the video on demand, there's a lot of new things happening and my question is to you whether you think that projects like Bandersnatch really have and I mean interactive series um, have um, there's like a new era and that this might find an audience and whether how you you three think about that. Uh, Ricarda thank you for this question because uh, this was my next one so you gain a heart because it was the Bandersnatch question Guys, please tell us your opinion about this. I can I can give my opinion because um, my series is like very Black Mirror ish, you know, because it's like a center of rehab for virtual uh, addiction, you know. So a teenager is, is locked down in the rehab center and he has to run away. He has no to escape. And when I see, when I saw Bandersnatch from, from Black Mirror, I, I thought that, yeah, like, because I wrote it five years ago, this story, you know, and Bandersnatch uh, <laughs> was going out, and I said, no, Black Mirror is going to, like, uh, they know it. They are going to do it. And then the format uh, came out, Bandersnatch, you know? And I, I thought that um, it's quite interesting because the format in Bandersnatch, the interactive format is, like, very fluid, and it's very like incredible, you know? The story never cuts down. It's like very, very smooth, you know, the storytelling in interactive series. But in the other hand, I was disappointed in the, in the storytelling, you know, in the, in the drama, in the dramatic uh, tension of the story. It never gets like uh, to a, for my opinion, it never gets to a real tension climax, you know? And uh, the storytelling is like, going through ways and you have a lot of options but you never get to a final idea of the or a concept or i don't know my opinion i, I basically agree uh, in in the meaning that it's uh, more focused on the gameplay uh, more um, about the script the story and the, the climax they normally reach in the other episodes in the other chapters on black mirror 
uh, our our project is a, a little different because it's less video game. It's more close to the old game books. I don't know if you ever read of or play to the game books, but uh, at the end of each chapter, you have got four choices that brings you in four different ways. Um, cutting um, truly the story and uh, rebeginning from the next chapter from where you live, uh, where you left the, the story. Um, Bandersnatch uh, went out after a few months after us, so they uh, obviously copied us uh, <laughs> badly. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it was it was the same thought we had uh, uh, of Sebastian, uh, and oh no, it, it's out. And in the first in 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 the first moment, we were upset by the the same. In the same moment, we have a, a low profile production, and they've got you know uh, Black Mirror behind. Uh, and but after, I was very 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 happy because it means that we are moving in the right way we are trying to move something and this is the the this is important uh, it's not where we reach uh, and and the point we we arrived with the last chapter of our opera it's the next one and if bandersnatch helps us to move on i'm glad that someone with a big production has got something done has done something like this Moritz? Yeah, I mean, first of all, they, they all uh, like to show up as they are very innovative, but at the end, there's a, it's also very conservative. So um, it's very good that Netflix tried this out. Um, but as you see, maybe it's just um, like a small, you know, sign. Okay, we do something and let's see how, how this is going to develop uh, on more because you see it in different uh, fields where where just something starts up but it's not never really comes up or but of course it's it's important that um, there are projects uh, like that that are going to be shown somewhere and uh, i really hope because they i think they are very uh they are uh, they are not really going moving forward in this way like really strong this is this is how i feel i think these formats and uh, the audience wants more and the, i think the audience wants also to get more involved in everything so you see it in the social media channels you see it on the production side as well everybody wants to take part of something so i think it's very important and um i hope that they are develop developing this more yeah but um i'm not sure i'm, I'm just not sure how this is going to uh, proceed we'll see yeah. one idea more to to share that is like, I think that is the huge opportunity for interactive series, but we have to get the format right, you know, and the stories right, and get strong stories to tell with this format, you know? And in this case, I think the, the, the audience is ready to interact and it, it, they want to, because the social media shows us that everyone's, everyone wants to, to interact with what they're seeing, but we have to uh, get their like very good stories to, to share, you know? Because the format is ready to to explode, I think. I, I I totally agree with all of you, and I will I would love to go ahead hours and hours because I do love the experimentation, and uh, I invite you to add me on Facebook or write me an email because I have a lot of old projects to share with you guys about interaction and uh, a smartphone project. But I think we are. Our time is up, I think. Yeah, I think right. it would be really nice to continue the conversation uh, further on to the Zoom call and stay connected. Like also for us, when we were writing the series, we were kind of thinking, okay, we have to think, you have to um, write different for our web series and uh, having the social um, aspects in mind. I mean, also what um, Martin told about his series. I mean, these are really different ways of filmmaking. And um, so I think that would be really nice to stay connected. I mean, Neil, Svenja and I, we are obviously on Instagram because of this Instagram project. And uh, yeah, it would be really nice if we can all stay connected because I think this is a really interesting field and um, all our projects are kind of pushing the boundaries further. And I think um, so it would be really nice if we could stay connected. I, I agree. And, but I, I think now we have to leave 
the space uh, for uh, the next panel that I think is a few minutes late. This one uh, is the uh, end. So thank you so much for joining us, but stay tuned because the next uh, panel will be really, really, really interesting. Thank you so much to everyone uh, that has joined us and thank you to, to our amazing guests uh, for being with us uh, today. Goodbye. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Bye. Bye. Thank you Thanks. So
gerade noch mal gucken, wo ich den Chat herkriege. Also da unten ist ja dieses kleine Bläschen Chat. Ah, ja. So, dann schreibe ich mal gerade. Das funktioniert, oder? Ich denke. Ich habe jetzt gerade Test reingeschrieben. Habe ich nicht gesehen. <lacht> ja. <lacht> okay. So. Ja, super. Dann machen wir es so. Okay. Oh, wir sind live. Okay, tschüss. <laughs> Ciao. Okay, um, hello everybody to my um, presentation today. Um, I'm going to talk about modern sound design, um, especially new possibilities of object-based audio. My name is Daniel Jobs. I'm from Hochschule Rhein-Main, um, which is a uh, University of Applied Sciences in Wiesbaden. And I'm want to start um, to introduce myself a little bit to you. Um, I'm working as an event technician since 2012, uh, self-employed since 2015, um, and I do the fields event technology sound and recording in studio and live, and music production and sound design. I studied media conception and production in Wiesbaden, got my bachelor's degree in 2018. And today I'm working as an employee at Hochschule Rhein-Main since 2019. And today I want to start um, with a quote. It's a, it's a big quote, but um, I think it's really important um, just to get a little bit Inside sound design. This quote is from Danny Boyle and he said, when we made Shallow Grave, we had this discussion because we had a million pounds and we were all just working out how to spend it. I said to them, we talked about why was it when we're looking at movies in Britain, the British movies looked shit and the American movies looked great. Even if they weren't great movies, they looked great. Why is it? And it was sound. American movies know you spend money on sound just because you can't see it doesn't mean you shouldn't spend money on it. And um, I really like this quote because I think it's important to think about spending money on sound, spending time on sound, and not only uh, doing sound in the last five minutes of post-production, um, as many people do. I think sound is um, highly underrated till today, and most people don't really know about the power of sound. And because of that, I want to talk a little bit to you today. And what we're doing today, I want to talk with you about departments of sound for moving picture media, just a little overview, um, which departments uh, should you know about. Then I want to talk about the evolution of sound, especially for cinema, and at least a little bit de more detailed about Dolby Atmos. Um, I want to talk about technical information, possibilities and advantages, and I want to talk about new opportunities. So let's start um, with departments of sound for moving picture media. There are uh, five departments I want to talk about, which are the most um, important. I think it's um, production sound. What is production sound? Production sound is about dialogue recorded on set. Production sound is about effects recorded on set. And production sound is about ambiences and atmospheres recorded on set. You should always try to um, record on set. Everyone knows uh, boom operators, they are doing that mostly. Um, you should try to record on set because this is the most, um, the most original sound to your um, moving image. Second part is dialogue. Everyone knows dialogue is one of the most important parts of, um, of sound for moving image media and dialogue can be dialogue from production sound as you know, originally recorded on set, or if there are any problems, any things uh, to do again, you can use ADR, which means automatic dialogue replacement or additional dialogue recording. Um, you can use both, um, um, both wordings, but you should always think about um, that um, dialogues from set are most often um, much more better and much more emotional because the actors are really live on set and they 
do not have to um, work in a studio situation, which can be um, not so good for their emotional uh, behavior. Let's talk about ambient. Uh, let's talk about sound effects and Foley. Uh, sound effects can be recorded on set. They can be um, Foley effects done in the studio. I think everyone knows what Foley is. And sound effects can be taken from sound libraries. I think that um, a mix of all three categories um, is useful for your um, movie or your series format because um, if you only take sounds from sound libraries, I think and I feel that this can um, get a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit, a little bit uh, synthetic, <laughs> a little bit artificial to your to your sound to your sound design. So you should always try to use original recorded effects too. Then we should talk about ambience and atmosphere, which is really important um, to every moving image media because atmospheres, um, yeah, atmospheres give your um, audience special feelings about a setting, about a location. There are different locations and every location has its own different atmosphere. And you should always try to um, explain your audience where they are and what, what is the feeling of this location. And uh, it's really easy and um, important to do this with uh, sound atmospheres. You can record atmos atmospheres um, directly on set. You can record them afterwards if you didn't do that. And of course, you can take atmospheres from sound libraries. Um, sound libraries, um, atmospheres, everyone of us knows is, um, for example, um, a restaurant situations, a club or bar situations, um, forests have its own atmospheres and um, something like that. You should try to um, explain to the audience where they are and how is the feeling on the, on the set, on this occasion. At least we have the music. Everyone knows music um, can be part of the action on screen, especially when you record um, concerts or do series or movies including concert scenes, um, music is a part of um, the screenplay, but also music can be added and is mostly added to underline and emotionalize the motion moving picture. Um, everybody of us knows about the emotional function of music and I don't want to talk that much about it, but um, music is one of the big five parts of sound design today. Let's have a look about um, to the evolution of sound. Um, the evolution of sound star, I want to start with a question and my question is, did there ever exist silent movies? In my opinion, not really because silent movies were always, um, were always shown, were always um, um, yeah, shown to huge audiences. It started in variety theaters and um, went to moving cinemas, to cinema halls and every time such um, movies or um, moving picture um, media was shown to an audience. Um, it was underlined by orchestras, by a cinematic audience or by speakers who um, tried to talk about that movie, about the pictures um, the audience um, looked at. And that is why I think there was never a real silent movie because it was always underlined by music or a speaker. And, um, but of course, that all was live performance, pictures were shown and the live performance uh, by musicians or a speaker were on top. And then it started to get comfortable to um, show movies with um, recorded sound, with sound which was already um, put to the movie. And um, people thought first about it, um, they were not really happy about that because all the musicians, all the speakers um, had the problem that they got unemployed. Um, people thought about um, recorded audio, not really positive. And that was the fact that the first um, movie with recorded audio was shown in the year 1900 in Paris, but then it took 20 to 30 years um, 
till it became really popular that recorded audio was shown in cinemas. And the first format um, recorded audio was shown in cinemas was the mono format. That means we have one speaker behind the screen and um, that one speaker had to manage all the signals which were coming in. So um, effects, dialogue, of course, ambiences, music, everything came from one loudspeaker in the middle behind the screen. But it was okay because nobody knew something else. Then it took some years and then vinyl recordings came up, music recording came up and music recording used the format stereo with a left and right channel. And people thought, oh my God, this is cool. We want to have this in cinema too. And that is why the next step um, in the evolution of cinema sound was a stereo format. But there was one problem about it because the stereo format uh, works with left and right channel and both channels um, um, produce different signals. And if you imagine a huge cinema hall with many, many people in it, when you sit in the rear on the left or the right side, you had only the chance to hear one of the speakers directly, on left or right, and the opposite speaker um, came with a little bit delay. And that was really, really difficult um, to um, understand the dialogues, to understand the spoken word for the people in the rear. And then the cinema developers thought, um, we can do that better. And the next step was, the stereo setup plus center. That was really nice to handle because you had the center channel um, where all the dialogues came out mono and people in the complete cinema hall had the chance to hear the dialogues in a perfect way. And you had, of course, left and right stereo. You had the chance to use stereo balance to um, manage your sounds and you had much more space to balance uh, atmospheres, effects, music, and you had in the middle the space for dialogue. That was really nice, but people thought it has to get better. It has to get more comfortable, more. Um, the audience has to be more inside the story, inside the screen. Um, they wanted to circle um, the audience a little bit. And that is why we got 5.1 surround sound. Um, now they started to use surround loudspeakers in the left and right uh, to circle the audience and to get the audience in the middle of the action. So the audience had um, now the feeling to be inside the movie and it was a great experience for the audience because they had uh, sounds from left and right. That was really cool, but the circle wasn't closed because in the rear there was nothing. And because of that, we got 7.1 surround sound, which um, added surround sound from rear left and rear right. The problem now was the experience of that was so cool for um, um, the audience that many people um, um, started to look um, to the left, to the right, and to the rear, and not only to the, um, to the screen. Um, there was a little problem because people should have looked to the screen because there was the action going. And that is why surround sound mostly today is just used to give um, diffuse atmospheres, to give ambience, to give some small effects, but not really pointed effects, not really um, pointed uh, sound events. Mm, and that is why the, the function of surround is, um, is a little bit close in itself because it just, um, just gives you um, the feeling of the room, of the location, but you cannot really use it creative for uh, special sound events. I want to talk about the point one, which means um, till from 5.1 surround sound on, we had um, a single channel for LFE signals. LFE means low frequency effects and low frequency effects are all the effects which um, happen under 120 hertz and they are all um, fixed to one channel since then and they are um, 
given back about uh, from a subwoofer, which um, yeah makes a much more better um, low frequency management possible to all the cinema halls. Okay, now we have um, a huge 7.1 surround sound system, uh, which is a standard in many, many cinemas today and for many, many films today. But as we learned, there's only the possibility to, to use it for some diffuse atmospheres. You cannot use it for, as I said, for special sound events and you cannot circle sound events all around the audience. And that is um, what Dolby Atmos is about. Uh, Dolby thought about why do we always use this channel based in this, this um, limited number of channels? Why don't we use the complete room, the complete cinema hall to um, place sounds um, on different places and not limited to, um, to loudspeaker positions? And now I want to introduce you a little bit to Dolby Atmos. Dolby Atmos first uses a 7.1.2 uh, surround system, which is called um, the beds of Dolby Atmos. So it, it um, yeah, it works with it because it's, um, it's standard format. But we talked about 7.1. Now I'm talking about 7.1.2. What means the two? The two means the first um, uh, the first big development of Dolby Atmos, the top surround layer. So that means that you have now loudspeakers on the ceiling and you can use one more dimension. So you have the dimension left, right, rear, front. And the next dimension is the top surround dimension. Till today, only missing the sound from below, but there's no, no technology till today which um, uses this. And the second big, big, big innovation we should talk about from Dolby Atmos is we got this um, 10 channels, but on top of these 10 channels, we got 54 more uh, discrete outputs, um, which can be used from Dolby Atmos, which means these 54 outputs, they are discrete. They are not limited by loudspeakers, by the number of loudspeakers or by the position of loudspeakers. But these outputs um, can be used for objects. So there's much more space and much more flexibility in using these outputs um, on top of these um, 7.1.2 surround sound format. To make it a little bit easier for you to understand, um, I try to talk about the channel-based um, channel part and the object-based audio part Dolby Atmos uses. Dolby Atmos uses both of it. Channel-based is called BATS for Dolby Atmos. This is our standard surround format, for example, 7.1.4. Um, you can mix everything you want, dialogue, production sound effects, atmosphere, and music. You can mix them to the normal output channels, left, right, center, left surround, right surround, rear left surround, rear right surround, top surround, left and right. And you can use these channels, especially for all static um, audio events, for all ambience, for all atmospheres. But on top of it, you have the possibility to use 118, up to 118 objects. Dolby Atmos, Dolby calls it objects which can be mixed to a maximum of 64 discrete output channels, um, which will be rendered to every, to every point in your individual cinema hall while, um, while the moving picture is shown. So we have to understand there are no fixed output channels, but the possibility of free positioning and the positions are not limited by the physical number of loudspeakers or surround channels. That is really um, important to understand that you do not have channels anymore, but you have objects which can be pent to every position you want to have them in a room, in a cinema hall, 
in your living room on headphones. Let's have a look on the improvements of Dolby Atmos. Um, first thing, first um, keyword is object-based audio, which uses metadata being able to be freely positioned in space. As I told you, you are not limited anymore by loudspeaker positions. You can pan your objects everywhere you want. The second improvement of Dolby Atmos is the top surround layer. Till Dolby Atmos, it wasn't possible to use top surround. Dolby Atmos made top surround um, possible for cinema, for home cinema, in your living room. Dolby Atmos makes top surround possible um, from um, sound bars and on headphones. That is really great. The third improvement is the much more better LFE management, which means the low frequency effects management. And Dolby Atmos adds a surround subwoofers. On a normal 7.1 setup, you don't have subwoofers for surround signals. Dolby Atmos uses subwoofers for surround signals just um, to make it much more greater and better experience to hear sound. And of course, for huge cinema halls, huge rooms, or for everybody who wants, um, Dolby Atmos adds additional speakers. They are center left and center right and additional surround speakers just to um, give these objects the chance to um, be everywhere. Now let's have a look on, on such a cinema hall with um, many, many loudspeakers you can see there. And I try to, to yeah, explain you how Dolby Atmos really works. So we have our front, um, of course, left, right, center, LFE. We have our left surround, right surround, rear left surround, rear right surround, now our top layer, or top surround layer left and right. And as you can see, you have, um, for example, on the left surround and right surround, we have nine loudspeakers, but all of them will um, have the same output because they are all um, fixed on one channel, which is called, um, for that example, um, left surround or right surround. And these nine speakers are doing exactly the same. And it's, it's completely equal where you're sitting in the cinema it will always be the same. If you are sitting in the first row on the last, um, left and right surround will always do the same over the whole, um, um, yeah, um, number of loudspeakers. The same does um, the rear speakers. All of these three uh, rear left speakers or rear right speakers will do the same. And all of the top surround speakers will give you, using just uh, the channel-based format, 7.1.2 surround the same signal over a huge number of loudspeakers. And that is the great thing about Dolby Atmos. Dolby Atmos thinks about, we have so many loudspeakers, why should they all do the same? Dolby Atmos uses all of them, uses all of them and is not fixed on any position of them because it uses metadata and can put objects everywhere you want. So now it is possible to set an object there and to go on, to do such steps to let objects fly through the whole cinema hall to every point you want. And that is, that is the most important thing about and the most yeah, really cool thing about um, object-based audio that you are not fixed on channels or loudspeaker positions because you can handle objects uh, via metadata to every point you want in your room. And of course, you can use the elevation level to let things fall down from above. As I said, we have the top layer, new and Dolby Atmos. You can use surround layers, and then you can let objects fall down to the head of your audience, which is uh, really cool. Uh, just to say, it's 
it's not that cool because um, sound from below is missing, but it is um, till today really impressive if you um, if you get this um, get to hear Dolby Atmos once. Okay, now let's have a look how to use Dolby Atmos. Um, use objects and beds together and side by side, which is really important because um, this is one big advantage of Dolby Atmos. You can use both um, worlds. You can use a channel based um, channel based audio and you can use object based audio side by side, which gives you really the freedom to um, um, to um, to handle audio as it should be handled. So I think you should always um, put um, atmospheres and ambience on surround channels, but you should use objects for um, special and pointed sound events, effects. Of course, music, you can do um, many, many things with music in Dolby Atmos. And of course, it can be interesting to use Dolby Atmos with dialogues. But that brings me to the next point. Um, use your opportunities to get comfortable with high numbers of defined sound events at the same time, which means use the new space, use that space that objects give to you because objects are, are not general based. They are not on, um, they are freely, they are free to use and they, um, do not need so many loudspeakers as, um, for example, left surround, which uh, takes a huge number of loudspeakers in the cinema, but objects use only um, small points in the cinema. So you can um, get much more space to your mix. You can get much more space to your center, to your front for dialogue. So use this and use all the possibilities you have um, to spread your mix and to um, make your mix clear to make your dialogues clear, um, but also use it to make, um, to make um, effects and sound events. Um, yeah, um, to an experience for your audience. So what is the possibilities about um, Dolby Atmos? You can increase your imaginary screen size, as I, as I told you. Um, you can let things fly through your room. You can um, let them get very close to your audience. And that can increase the imaginary screen size. It increases the audience relations, of course. Um, sounds get lively and tangible for your audience. And that increases relationships. You should use this. Um, as I told, you can make sounds lively and tangible. And as I told, you can get more space to your individual parts of sound design and try to use that and use it. You, you are not fixed on a stereo, on a stereo balance. You're not fixed on a center uh, loudspeaker. You're not fixed on um, two or four surround channels, but you have the possibility to uh, use up to 118 um, objects penned on up to 64 discrete output channels. Let's have a look in which moments does Dolby Atmos play off its advantages. Um, I have to say, for me, especially situations with um, much action and acting in picture are uh, predestined for using Dolby Atmos. Um, I think about fighting situations and chases. But of course, sports can be very, very um, impressive when using Dolby Atmos. And I think artificial sound spheres um, really um, benefit from Dolby Atmos. And that is why I think that mostly action and thriller movies, uh, series in that um, kind of genre and um, science fiction movies will um, benefit and um, gain their sound design by using Dolby Atmos. And um, one point just to, to get over to series, um, Game of Thrones um, published its last season with uh, Dolby Atmos, but just in the English version, because it's a little bit um, too expensive to do that for every um, single. OK, 
Okay, I want to now talk about how to get Dolby Atmos outside the cinema. Um, as I told you, you can use it in your home theater, in your living room. You can use it with uh, 7.1.4 setups. You can expand existing 5.1 setups. Or as I told you, you can use Dolby Atmos soundbars. But um, in my opinion, soundbars will never give you uh, the experience which does 7.1.4 setups. Um, also in, in your living room, it won't be that great than it could be with a bigger setup, but it works. And you can use Dolby Atmos with headphones, of course. You should try that. It's a little bit different from Dolby Atmos itself in cinema or on a big sound system, but it works. It's uh, something like maybe you can Maybe you you tried to use uh, VR uh, virtual reality with um, binaural sound, and uh, you can. It's not exactly the same, but it's uh, close to it. You should try it. Okay, let's come um, to an end slowly. Um, as I told you, Dolby Atmos um, has its four big. Um, benefits um, for moving picture media, which are um, the object-based audio working side by side with channel-based audio. We have um, a top surround layer for our third dimension. We have um, um, much more better LFE management and at least um, I think that's it. Maybe it's just three benefits of it. Um, yeah, I hope you um, got something new for you, you a little bit. Um, I want to end my presentation now with um, another quote from George Lucas, who said, sound is half of the picture. Um, I want you to um, think about that quote because I think it's really important. Um, sound is a minimum half of the picture and it should always get minimum half of your attention while um, creating um, moving image media. So at least thank you for your attention. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, you can see my email address and um, I wish you um, a nice afternoon at the Zayale and um, good presentations and panels at the educational. Yeah, thank you. Are there any questions, Isabella? Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for this really informative uh, presentation. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, and uh, I think our viewers uh, thought so too. There actually is an audience question uh, I wanted to ask you. Um, on Facebook, um, we got the question, uh, especially now that people are watching uh, their series on mobile phones, do you believe we can have a good uh, experience using uh, Surround 7.1? On headphones, uh, on smartphones? Yeah. Using it on smartphone is, is I think, impossible, but using it with um, headphones, I think it can, it is possible to get, um, to get a great experience too, yeah, I think so. But of course, as I said, headphones are not the same as a big um, 7.1 system, of course. Yeah, okay, uh, good. Um, I hope the, the question is answered with that <laughs> uh, but, from our audience member. Um, so thank you really uh, a lot uh, for, for joining us today, for holding this presentation. Um, I hope we yeah. see you next year at the Seriale uh, again. And, I hope uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, everybody watching, uh, stay tuned uh, because in just about less than uh, 50 minutes, we're going to have a World Series premiere here uh, in our stream at the Educational. The Series Reset will find the first audience. Um, so bye bye and um, see you then. Yeah, thank you for having me. Bye. Ciao.
Und dann bist du endlich angekommen. Ein Koffer im Gepäck und das war's. Keiner, der dir mehr sagt, was du zu tun oder was du zu lassen hast. Kein Wecker, der morgens klingelt. Kein Chef, der wieder irgendwas von dir will. Einfach dein eigenes Ding machen, verstehst du? Denn es ist doch so. Du hast eine perfekte Frau, ein perfektes Haus, einen perfekten Job. Einfach das perfekte Leben. Und irgendwann ist alles so perfekt langweilig, dass du es nicht mehr aushältst. Dann verkaufst du dein Haus, trennst dich von deiner Frau und kündigst deinen Job. Mit dem Geld kannst du woanders hingehen und was Neues anfangen. Etwas, was dich wieder fordert, was dir dein Leben zurückgibt. Aus Alt mach Neu ist doch ganz einfach. Und sei doch mal ehrlich, du hast es selbst in der Hand. Alle reden immer nur über Veränderung. Wie schön es gewesen wäre, wenn sie dies oder wenn sie das in ihrem Leben getan hätten. Aber keiner tut es. Ohne Risiko ändert sich nie was. Du musst einfach nur die Entscheidung treffen. You got a lighter? Of course. Thanks. So where are you from? I'm from Germany. Do you have any plans yet? To be honest, no. Is this your first time in Thailand? Yeah, first time. Watch out for the locals. They tend to rip you off a lot, especially around the airport. Really? It's usually better if you travel with someone who has more experience about Thailand. Okay. If you want to, I'm going to a place. There's a lots of backpackers. Nightlife is also very good. The girls are not so bad either. Yeah, that sounds good, actually. Well, we can chip in uh, with me a cab if you want. Then it's only half price, and he will definitely not rip us off since it's not my first time here. Okay, let's go. All right, let's go. Let me help you with that. Yeah, thank you. 
So be careful with this one, okay? Okay. Oh yeah, could you do me a huge favor and go to the taxi booth and give them 200 baht for the cap? What do they do here? Oh, because they have a, they have a line system. It's normal at the airport. So I'm back in a minute, right? Hello, I want to pay the taxi. Pilot, up, pilot. Up. You pay driver in the car. I pay the driver in the car. Yes. Shit. Fuck it.
good. I mean, <laughs> in comparison of the north of Italy and Brazil, because Brazil now it's crazy. So we, we we have a crazy president. We don't have a president. That's true. This is the truth. So I am worried now with my family there. I can go. They don't. they shared on Facebook and Instagram had uh, the three of us plus uh, Rose ah, um, Joel, I, I, I meant to write you because uh, uh, this morning I watched your lecture about Indian singers and if you wish uh, I, I remember some of the
Hello, so we are live right now at the Seriale Educational Day with a lot of amazing guests. It's a pleasure to be here uh, moderating uh, from our homes because there's no other chance right now, but it's um, really nice to come together even if it's virtually. We have a very virtual online international community, so this is also a very nice way, I think, of, of being in contact and, and trying to keep our our small but very, very active community alive. So first, I'm going to introduce our guests, which know a lot, a lot about web series. Um, uh, what we'll talk about uh, is where is the, for the web series format going? And But this will be almost the end of the discussion because this is a very, very complicated issue. And we have uh, to talk about this uh, Joël Bassaget. He, Bonjour. He not only um, founded the Web Series World Cup, which unites a little bit all the, the festival circuit related to this uh, short form, but also he wrote a book on Web Series, uh, which was released um, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, which is short, narrative and serialized, a complete guide to the Web Series phenomenon and also collaborates with Webfest Berlin and a lot of other institutions related to web series and media. So I think he has a lot to say. Hello, mm -hmm. Joel. <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, um, then on the other hand, uh, from Italy, we have uh, Chiara Bressa. Um, she, she has a blog named the World Wide Web Series in which she writes about festivals, about uh, news and everything related to web series. Uh, and she also uh, wrote a book, which is Fare Web Serie um, in Italian uh, some years ago, um, about a little bit all the process of how to, how to make a web series, an independent web series. Hello, and everybody. Then, <laughs> hi, hi, Kera. And then uh, last but not least, we have Caroline Moray, and she is representing the Sicily Web Fest, uh, one of the first and the very, very nice um, uh, island to go to and visit. I've been there twice. Uh, it's a very nice festival and she will talk a little bit about also the situation in, in Italy and over there at the Sicily Web Fest. Hello, so, <laughs> hi, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so uh, now that we know who we are, well, I'm Rose of Dolls. I'm the, the director with Oliver of the Bilbao uh, Series Land Festival. And uh, well, I, I also I wrote my thesis on web series. Uh, and since eight years ago, more or less, uh, all my life is around uh, this format. So I think I also have uh, a lot of input in this conversation. And I think we have to look into the future as always, and especially at this moment, to see how this uh, format, I think, is gonna change. So this is my first uh, question to our guests, which you have answered so many times, but I think it's very important to start somewhere to know where we're going which is, how would you define web series right now? And I think I, I would tell Joel to start. <laughs> uh, right, as you said, I mean, my own definition has uh, evolved a lot <laughs> in, the, in the five past years. Today, I would uh, describe uh, web series as any episodic uh, uh, video program that is out of of television standard. Uh, I would not even uh, put the format in first, but I would put the absence of, for, of standard uh, first. The fact that uh, web series, uh, uh, whatever the format that they have, uh, are out of the standard of television and therefore are uh, specially made and, or aimed to exist, be hosted by platforms uh, uh, broadcasting via the web, yeah. <laughs> this would be my definition today. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a nice definition and it's uh, very open, I think. We, like in my thesis, I, I already finished it like 
four years ago. And my definition, I wouldn't use today. Okay, I could use it, but I know it's much more than what I wrote back in the day. So, so really it's, it's complicated right now. Um, so we have like two characteristics, like a, an abscess of, of standard, which I find really interesting. And yeah, and the, the thing that they're produced to be streamed or seen online on some kind of platform. So um, Chiara, what, what could you add to, to these characteristics? Oh, well, uh, also my definition, uh, given in 2012, it was really large because I agree with Joel, uh, there's no standard. That's uh, kind of the beauty of uh, these the, the, the innovative formats. You, you don't have standard, you can experiment. And yes, you are online, but it's not what makes the difference. It's online because today we are online also with our lives. So it's not what makes a web series a, a web series or digital series or online series. Uh, I can say that, well, another feature can be that um, it's, uh, but also Joel already said, it's uh, outside the logic uh, of the traditional TV. So you don't have all the limit that you have to respect when you write and shoot for a, for a TV channel, for a classical TV channel. That's basically, you are free to, to do anything. Yes, I will. I always talk about like the rebels, you know, like yes. the rebels of the web. The anarchy. <laughs> yes, because there's when when I'm asked by, you know, like um, uh, someone from the me nor normal no, mainstream media when they ask me and like, but what are web series? What is the format? And I say 20 seconds to 30 minutes, you know, like there is no one standard. I can tell you like like if you do comedy, maybe it's a five minute, one minute thing, but you know, you're always talking about more or less in this complete anarchy. I find this strange kind of order, but I just made it up really, you know, like there's no, for me, like common format, which, which was really, really working and was like the only format that existed. So, uh, Caroline, what, what do you feel um, is uh, a web series that, that they haven't said yet? Something important that maybe they haven't mentioned. It's the difficult now. <laughs> yes, yes, it's very difficult. But I think the same. The web series is um, mailable product or capable of be building with different platform and proposal. Um, there are no fixed rules for the production of a web series as well for its format. So I believe that the more multimedia apps appear, uh, mm -hmm. consequently, the formats of the web series increase. Uh, we have now a lot of um, web series um, with formats of like Instagram, TikTok and others. So this is a very new thing coming i i also believe that the the there's not only a genre or or um length uh anarchy but also like a format uh anarchy as well yes and each time we see more and more there's also like 360 or immersive series uh we have been seeing more and more of the vertical videos now yeah. now the platform uh, kiwi is also doing it in an amazing way i must say i have seen some of them and it's really really interesting how i hate i tend to hate the vertical but they do it in a way that i actually almost like it more than the horizontal because it's something very different and and almost seem like sometimes too two um, screens at the same time. So I, I also thought that was that was really interesting. Uh, it, it, we, so sorry, can I add something? Uh, it's kind of a feeling that uh, today I find myself uh, being a kind of angry when I have uh, a vertical video and I cannot watch the video vertically because it's supposed to watch horizontally. And I'm like, why it doesn't turn vertically? Why I can't? 
watch this series vertically. And it's, it's strange because seven years ago, it was like, I hate to watch a vertical series. Why I'm watching a vertical series? And now it's so changed. And so maybe it's where we are going. We are really going, uh, having a format that is really uh, for smartphone that you can really enjoy on a really tiny screen and not on a, a huge screen like the movie. I think, I think this is maybe part also of the definition of web series. The fact that they, they offer to the audience a, a much wider variety of uh, experiences and, and uh, sensations. Uh, of course, uh, TV series, I mean, they are highly entertaining and, and we love them and we will never uh, uh, get away with them. But, but, uh, but there is only one experience and we all have our own experience of it. It's like uh, I'm in my bed, I watch my favorite show or I am in the living room, etc. But uh, web series, you can binge an Instagram 20 second series uh, in the bus and you can binge the entire season. And at the same time, you can also be on your sofa in the living room watching uh, uh, an entire season of uh, Anomaly and spending the night. Uh, but also you can go to interactive. As you said, there is 360 coming, a lot of uh, different platforms and, and, and moments of the day. So maybe this is something that we, we maybe did not think about it at the beginning because we were uh, mostly into web series as part of the traditional entertainment of, in terms of storytelling. But uh, now that uh, we have many different platforms and many different screens available for everybody, maybe this will be something that next year or in two years we will add to the definition of web series. Adding Joel, uh, I think the cultural process surrounded by the contest, uh, the emerging technologies and apps modify not only the facts to be told, but also the way in which uh, these facts are recorded. So is this, the vertical screen, it's, it's here. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yes, what I was going to say is that because I think it's more in the cutting edge than other formats, we're always evolving. So it's very difficult because by the time we already have one sort of definition, this definition has to be, get bigger because it's already changing. So I think that's the tricky part in, in the web series is what I found. For example, in my opinion, the documentary series were also a web series. So I, I put them in the same box, but for example, in some of the definitions were only fiction based. Um, and um, I think maybe those definitions or people behind the definition didn't realize there were some documentary shows as well or hadn't seen them. Um, but then, for example, the vertical showed up. Then when, for example, the, the immersive series, if they are online, of course they are web series. But should we create a new category? Is this something different? You know, like all these new things that appear are always challenging the way we can even define web series because they're evolving so much. And that's what also I wanted to ask you from the time you got to know web series until now, what have been like one of the changes that have really impacted you or you were really curious about how, how it has changed from, I don't know, eight years, 10 years, five years from the moment you get contact into series to to this moment we're living. And, and let's give Caroline this time the start. Okay. Well, I think uh, the platform, um, first the web series, uh, the, uh, it was like just on YouTube, Vimeo. Now we can see web series on a lot of platform um the way it is recorded now that we set the vertical screen that first uh, gave us a lot of uh, uh, uh now it's something uh, normal 
and the format uh, and the the time the time because first uh, for a web series the time was tip a short time now we can see web series with a 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes. Joel said uh, this morning there is a web series, uh, Indian web series with 40 minutes. So now the web series time is not so short like expected. Is this? So uh, uh, let's go the other way now. Kiara, what, what has impressed you in this case? Well, what impressed me is that uh, almost yes, eight years ago, when I were when I try to explain people what were the web series, no one knows, and no one were watching web series that day back day back then. Uh, today, just happened before uh, the quarantine situation. I was on the train, and uh, a guy was watching a series on YouTube, and uh, I ask him what he was, was watching and he told me I don't know just a series on YouTube and I, I kind of asked him do you know that it's a web series oh yeah it's an online series it's a, just a show for me so that was okay so people now know that is a format that is digital that is uh, entertaining that is online that is on YouTube not only on Netflix and uh, that was really surprising for me because on the other hand i still have a lot of people asking me what is a web series it was like maybe young adults are now more into the web series community and into the web series phenomenon uh, then what oh well, my english is kind of black down right now but yeah young adults today knows what is a digital content and uh, eight years ago it wasn't like that it was much more difficult so what about joel i think you can have well, a lot to say here because of i we've had conversations about this i know <laughs> yeah 10 years ago i was uh, frankly for me 10 years ago i was watching french web series and american web series mm -hmm. i had uh, i i I imagine that uh, other countries had web series, but I had never watched uh, one. Uh, I think the first uh, uh, not French or not American web series I saw and I liked was uh, Malviviendo, and it was like a uh, Spanish web series eight years ago. Five years ago, it was uh, the, 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 the rise of the web fest. We, 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 we had an international web fest, and for me, it was the revelation. The revelation that what, what I liked was not only French or American, but it was something worldwide. And I met so much talent, just like every one of us. We had the same experience like five years ago. Five years ago, we had a lot of certitude. It was very clear for us, the future of web series. I think that we were all imagining uh, a market and everything was clear. It was like, yeah, people have mobile and we do web series and there will be a market and there will be a platform for that. And now uh, since two years, we, we are more like realistic and considering it more, uh, not as an opportunity, the mobile and the web, just not as an opportunity, but I think that we start to realize that it's a real industry, just like the cinema, just like the television, and that web series, we have to find our, our, our way to, to, to enter this industry. We are not there yet. And, uh, and, and we, have to, we have to define also not our, our, our definition of web series, but define how, how we useful to this industry, how are we useful to the web today, and to and to the audience today, as uh, as uh, with this format. So this is what has evolved, yeah, no more. Yes, I would also say, uh, adding to this, that uh, the connection to the audience was one of the key elements that made web series something different, uh, because they became like small communities with their viewers, and it's not that uh, the television shows did not do it. But the interaction in the web series was very, very immediate. Even sometimes uh, the content was changing because of this interaction. And, um, and also the, the fact that it's on, already online, you don't have to bring 
the, your viewers from television to another medium, which is, for example, uh, social media or our um, YouTube, the interaction in these places is direct. So I think that is also like a game changer in, in the web series format that, that the audience felt more represented. And not only because of the direct interaction, but also because like the, the genres and the themes treated in web series were much more concrete and precise than in other media. So there is a great mixture of genres. And I always say there's a web series for everyone. And when someone says, well, I don't really like web series, I, I tell them, I'm sure I can find a web series you love. Because there's much more variety than in television, I think. You can find, you know, like um, so many bizarre, uh, weird, combination of genres like a reality show which is a horror uh comedy uh or you know like there's so so many examples of this kind of thing and um it also goes to a, a, a um, fraction of the audience which is much smaller i think so there's uh, always a um community that is going to be there and for example, uh, the LGTB movement is um, a great example for this because some of the shows with more um, subscribers and followers uh, and fans have been some of these shows and sometimes not precisely in their country, but in countries where this is illegal and people actually go to jail for this. So the fact that we can start saying whatever we want without the censorship. And that's where I'm going to now, uh, is really important. And that's one of the key things I feel of being on internet and having a, a show streamed versus trying to go to television to sell our show. And I think in these times, what is happening in the US, what is happening everywhere around the world uh, is, um, how free are we really? And uh, are web series more free than other media? And I would like Joel to start this because I know you have fought a lot for this. This is, uh, there are different point of view, in fact. Uh, uh, always, there is the point of view of the creators. They always say, oh, I can do what I want, but we all know that they do what they can because also there is the budget and there is the production and they, they not often have everything they want. Um, it would be wrong to imagine the web without censorship. We all have experiences of being censored on the web somewhere for, for, for sometimes stupid things and not even understanding why. So I it, it would be it would be a mistake to think that internet is the place where you do what you what you want but at least this is the place where you do what you plan to do this is a place where there is nobody to turn you around and this is this is something that is great that you can watch a web series that is lacking a lot of production values that has been made with a little money and you can see with people with little experience but what you can be sure and what what you feel really is that everybody wanted to do it and everybody had fun doing it. And, 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 and really, this is something that they wanted to do. And as a, as a, when you watch it, really, you, you kind of excuse everything. And I have seen movies, I have seen TV series, where obviously I could see on the screen that nobody wanted to do it <laughs> because, because really it was not working. So uh, yes, yeah, this, is, this, this is something. And then the, there is the point of view of the audience also. As the audience, we are always claiming that we would like to see everything on the web, but we are the first to say, hey, you cannot show that on the web because, you know, it's this or this or that. And, uh, and, and, and this is uh, difficult. Also, it depends on our curiosity. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm taking the example of Low Life and High Life, that are two web series that are well known in the community. These are web series that I would not find myself. I would not have made a search on Google for depression and uh, fiction about depression. I mean, never. But the web series brought to me this, and and this is this this is also uh, the thing. So 
um, I, I was captive of something, but the web series freed me from this, offering me another point of view on a subject. So these things of being free on the web, you're free, but you are very captive of, of many, many networks, and it's difficult to discover the things also. Well, it's diff different being free as a user or viewer also than being a creator. I think there's, there's, we cannot say there is not censor, censorship in, in both. I think there's a lot more than we actually realize, but at least there is no uh, goalkeeper person, big executive that will stop us from you know, producing our show. We may produce it, and then because we have a, a lesbian kiss, it may be removed from uh, social media. Like this happens, <laughs> and I'm I'm really uh, impressed by how uh, they uh, like some things are just taken out just because of uh, something like this. Something so um, I would say not harmful for anyone. But um, at, it happens that some people are uh, harmed by this. <laughs> um, so would you say, uh, uh, Chiara, would you say that uh, we are free or freer? We are freer than, as you have said, uh, um, as creator, uh, we are freer to create content online because we don't have to, we don't have a boss. We, we are in charge to our content, but then we have a platform with a policy. So we have YouTube, we have Facebook and so on and Vimeo, and they can remove their content if uh, it's against uh, their policy or if the audience uh, is not happy. And uh, it happens a lot. As you said, also in Italy, we have some uh, web series that have been uh, uh, shut down or uh, uh, forced to cut some scene because the audience uh, didn't like them. And this, I think this is a really interesting topic to dip into because we create content for the audience. So we kind of understand where we are going, uh, basing, but by trying to understand where is the audience going. They are ready for all we want to tell they are really free from their boundaries because also audience has uh, his limits, I think. It's not only creators and uh, broadcasts that put us uh, inside uh, boundaries to, uh, to respect. I think it's, uh, it, it would be interesting to understand where is the audience going? Are they ready for everything we can create? Are they ready for any type of format? For any type of interaction because if they are not ready maybe uh, we have to wait a little bit and try to kind of teach them what are web series for uh, some other years and maybe they will be able to appreciate every kind uh every genre of web series every every single every single format we have maybe i, I don't i don't know if it's english what i've said but i you know it so i think I say something right. <laughs> yes, I think um, right now um, the world is really sensitive, really you know, sensitive. for any kind of issue, um, not like women, um, gender, sexuality, country, racism. So we are, it's almost as if it's, uh, we're so sensitive that no one can make a joke out of it. Yes. Even though the person making the joke many times, if not all, is actually laughing about how stupid other humans are because they do this. And actually this whole, this joke like, uh, is probably helping us realize how racist we are. Mm -hmm. you know? So in a way, I, I really uh, like uh, edgy um, humor, you know, that kind of humor that is actually offensive, you know? Even though I myself, for example, as a woman, sometimes I'm like, really, you're doing that joke? You know, but then I think about it and I think, 
well, some people actually, you know, like you make a stupid joke with a broom, like, you, yeah, you have to be in the kitchen or whatever. I kind mm-hmm. of first time like offended, but then I think, you know, like um, so many people think that way in the world, you know, that we have to be in the kitchen. So it's a legitimate joke. And I think if we don't know how to laugh about um, ourselves and the situations, then I think we're done because I think humor can can help us, you know, mend all that because in ourselves, we always have some, some things um, like there's so many, so many uh, social issues right now. We have to bear in mind when we create that it's very complicated, especially when you do humor. Yes. Because there's so many lines you have to, Beware if you cross them, you can have a problem, and you have to be aware that the problem is there and how you're gonna um, go through that situation. Okay. You have to watch out everything, so you you are definitely not free to tell the story as you would like to tell it. Yes, <laughs> that uh, goes back to we're not so free uh, as we think either. <gasps> so what do what do you feel, uh, Caroline? Well, I think uh, the web series uh, is in a constant amplification. So it's up to the web series creator to decide what he wants and base it on the instrument to it he has access to conduct uh, his narrative. But I think the web series can can make it do this feel thrilling, do this free thrilling. So, yes, I think we are feel free to recording what we want than the the other the others media like cinema and series TV series. So I I, uh, I think it was Joel who said, like, we need to find something which is useful. And I found that uh, interesting because it is true that um, that the web series do uh, try to um, explore a little bit more into the audience and into what what is needed from the audience. And I say in this changing world and uh, in this precise moment, for example, what do you feel with all this experience of being at home for such a long time, which no one is used to. What do um, people f- found out they need in, for example, in media? It, do you think there's something that may change because, because of this, because we have been much more on our screens and we don't have like a world outside to explore? Um, Chiara? For example, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was watching Joel because it's a tricky question, and he was like, "Please don't ask me. Please don't ask me." Ah, uh, so I think it's a tricky one, Rose. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I, I, I think it can be. Um, oh my gosh, I think it can be because we are so attached to our screen and. We had the panel before uh, with uh, the, the, the series uh, uh, Swipe. I don't know if you watch it. It is uh, based, based on how we are too much attached to our smartphone and to social media. So maybe, yes, we need something that is useful uh, in order also to, kept, to keep this attention this audience attention that is uh, really, really, really light. Uh, We have a social problem about uh, uh, keep attention to nowadays because we have so many inputs uh, and also for uh, creators, it's so difficult to be found because uh, we we, we have too many distractions and these distractions are from the outside, but we kind of uh, are able to uh, see this distraction only through a smartphone. So we 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 can we know what is going on in the world only because we are on social media, only because we are 
watching social media and online platforms uh, and all, also the news are online 24 hours. So we are overwhelmed and it's difficult to understand what the audience is feeling. Everyone is now really sensitive, really angry, really, uh, I don't know if I can say it is alive, but pissed off. Uh, everything is, we are all overwhelmed. And for a creator, it's difficult to understand what is useful. I think that's an, uh, okay, that's a question. Uh, it is, uh, it will be really useful to get in touch with the audience and try to have a kind of interaction in order to understand what they are feeling nowadays uh, in order to create content that, that they can really, really appreciate and not just watching them and forgetting because they are inside uh, too many things around. Do you agree, Joel? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was uh, uh, so still from my point of view, I mean, but the first day, were all news and news from morning to night. It was all news and maybe a little bit of Facebook to uh, take news from the friends and, and, and family. And then I think that we have all seen something that was pretty cute and, and very interesting is the fact that a, a lot of institutions, a lot of artists were ready to jump on the web. We have seen operas, we have seen museums that we oh, were yeah. maybe not uh, expecting to be there for us. They were there from the, the next week. They started to build experiences online for us. And also we have seen uh, uh, pop groups, singers, uh, 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 jumping on the web. So the main thing that I, that I get from this is that now the web is so easy that even in a crisis like that, institutions as well as People at home are ready to jump and create some content to face yeah. the crisis. The thing is, with web series and web doc, we cannot jump on, on the daily things. We rely more on a catalog. We rely more on a... We, 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 to be there, we need to have a catalog built and then offer the catalog. And this is what happened with Netflix and with Amazon. They got the biggest part of the of, of the crisis. I mean, they made a fortune there because they were there with the catalog. Mm. And even okay. the people who had the catalog were not apparently able to take the uh, to, 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 to jump on the opportunity that, that, that they were there. So this is something that we have to think about. How do we exist on the web? Well, I mean, it's this strange that in this period where everybody had a lot of time and it <laughs> was connected all day. Uh, uh, we, we, web series did not emerge uh, so, so much, uh, really. I was, I was surprised with that. I saw even that the creators would, would, would be able to jump more on the opportunity. They, did, they, they, they were not about it. Yeah, that's what I meant. In this, uh, in this situation, we have the possibility to deep into the audience and understand what they were needing. Uh, in that moment, they needed to escape. So museum goes online, uh, uh, movies and theaters go online and web series, the web series community uh, were not able to analyze the audience and uh, offer the catalog, as you said. So we have to analyze our audience, I think. Yeah, I think maybe we didn't go into that direction so much and mm. we should have maybe used the opportunity. Like we used to the opportunity to edit <laughs> and course. make our web series better, which is also good. But it's um, also difficult because um, it's, uh, I, I feel, a moment in which we are all a bit a bit also down and we don't have as much energy because we're out of our you know daily lives and it's all already difficult to um, cover this. I, I believe almost everyone became a vlogger or a YouTuber, but not so many people became a web series creator. That but I think you know, Rose, more difficult. this is important, excuse me, but this is important what you say because this is also in the definition of web series because at the beginning of the crisis, a lot of people were saying, oh, you guys from web series, it's gonna be so easy for you. You take a camera and you're no, gonna do, no. you're gonna make, no. We are really cinema people. 
I mean, we, we, we write scripts, we, we, we reorganize a team, we shoot, you know, we have a director, we have things. We, we, we're maybe not this kind of people also. So, so this is part of the definition, I think. We, we saw the limit of what we can really do. Yes, I, I, I agree totally. And we have a question from Trip, which we were kind of mentioning, but he wants to know a little bit how web series can be used for a social change. Like we already mentioned LGBTQ plus uh, audiences, but also maybe COVID we just mentioned, uh, but the Black Lives Matter or other um, political movements and that go to trying to uh, reach, you know, like smaller uh, communities or uh, uh, movements that fight for uh, people's rights and how can they help and I'm gonna go first with Caroline. Welcome back. <laughs> yes, I have a little problem with the internet. Uh, so I think uh, the web series is a easy way to to show uh, the the world, like uh, uh, the real world, not just the fiction. Um, so this can help, like showing now the Black Lives Matter, matter. we can show um, the Black people how they um, go through the racism and with the feminist and the problems that the woman has um, daily. Um, we can show this uh, in an easy way. And I think uh, the web series is there to easier the things. I don't have the sound. Can oh, I, I thought I clicked it. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so when I was starting to do my thesis, there was one uh, one teacher I told her like maybe I should do something about web series in Spanish or in in Spain, and and she answered, well there's no borders, so you should always if on internet there's no borders. The only border is the language. So if you understand, for example, English content can travel to English speaking countries, but also to other countries. Um, so that makes the small community you can have in a local television, you can build from these small communities in all over the world, you can uh, build a very big audience. And I have to mention the example of a series which um, was in our festival and it was in sign language. How many people are uh, deaf or know sign language because they have someone deaf close to them, it's not very common, right? So if you do that, probably it's difficult to find on, on, on television, but on the web, they have so much support from their very small community, but it has reached a very high number of people inside this community. So I find it fascinating how, thank, thanks to the internet, this a small community can, can be a very, very large one potentially. And I think that uh, the fact that we are now more connected than ever helps uh, spread the world word for all these uh, social issues. But then um, going to, to the, I would say, Black Lives Matter, which is right now the center of the question, they're not so much a minority. I mean, there's millions of people in there that that um, have to fight for their rights. Of course they have to. And I think the, not only web series, but everything online helps spread the word. But especially I think, and I want also your opinion, Joel, um, I think the web series creators are much more uh, into these social issues and much more uh, mm -hmm. sensitive to them in, what I have seen until now. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, 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 there is way more social content in web series than, than in uh, TV series, for sure, for sure. 
uh, and anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. For example, I have to, I, I can give you an example. When we talk about Black Lives Matters, mm -hmm. I mean, already web series have, 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 have been way above what uh, television did. Uh, I, I can, ju just on the top of my mind, there is a Shooter Stance. Shooter Stance is an American web series that tells the story of a black uh, a police officer who witnessed two white police officers killing a, a, a black guy. Uh, and it, uh, this series was shot after one of the riots. Uh, it was already years ago. Uh, we had the wrong kind of black, which is happening in, in, in yes. another country, but also talks about this kind of thing, the, the, the fact of being black in this uh, particular territory. We had Dreaming Wheels Black, for example. So web series are already there. And, and there is always, even in some horror, horror web series or sci-fi web series, there is always social content. When you, when you go to Canada, for example, Canadian web series are always very into the contemporary society and what is happening in the society, trying to give an angle on that. But I think that it is also important to remind that artists are not there to change the world and we are not there to change the world. The thing is that we make smart things, we make clever things that sometimes help people to change the world because we are artists and we, we sometimes help people by giving them. But you know, the, the best way to change the world is when you vote. This is when you change the world or don't, don't change it. But as an artist, I want to change the world. I, will, I may help you uh, think differently, uh, uh, but but you know it's 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 not my thing. I'm there to propose you something new. I'm there to propose you an experience. And if this experience makes you change your view on the world, well, good or bad, I don't know. <laughs> but but it, I, I'm always careful when when people ask me how web series could do this or could do that because you know often I want to say you know. It's first the people who have been elected who should do it, not me, the artist, because, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm always here to help. <laughs> I'm always here to help, but I wouldn't like to, whatever. Yeah, I, I, I really believe, yeah, I think it's interesting what you say. I think there are some small uh, portion of the web series creator, especially those dedicated to documentary, that really want to change how people think about one specific topic. But in the other cases, I think we just put either a reality up there, which is racist, uh, chauvinist, etc., cetera, uh, homophobic and all those things, you know, even we can put the reality out there or we propose another reality in which, for example, this is completely normal. And I think, either one or the other can make uh, the viewer think about what is going on there. And I think that's the most important job in a fiction is you're always giving your opinion when you write and produce something. So uh, you make a small change. Of course, you're not gonna change the world literally, but I think you're gonna at least with the, the proposal of characters and of um, the interaction between them, you really are proposing a new world or a new possible way to relate to other people. Yes, you can have a little impact that makes the difference, I think. Yes, yes. So now this uh, the million dollar question, where <laughs> are we going with the format? What do you see happening uh, really soon? We've already talked about multi-format, multi-platform? Is there anything you see happening in the in the not so distant future? In the uh, I'm gonna start with this one because I have to go after that. I'm sorry. Uh, did, did you finish? Yes, yes. <laughs> Your introduction, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would... Um, web series right now, there is a phenomenon that I, that I see and that this Pretty cool is the what I what I call the waiting room of television. <laughs> that the webs, a lot of the people who are doing web series uh, are given the opportunity to do other things, movies or television series, uh, not necessarily adapted from their web series or not necessarily from their job, but uh, they are given the opportunity. So this seems to work. A few years ago, I was not. Uh, 
I was not pleased with this idea of a web series being uh, like in between cinema and television and uh, everything and being just a laboratory. But this part is actually working. It, it works. What doesn't work right now is monetizing. It's still the thing. It is 10 years we're talking about that, monetizing, monetizing, money. It doesn't work. We still, we still don't have it. And I don't see it happening. It's really, I don't see it happening. I go to the markets. I don't, see, there is only one, two international distributors who can really sell a web series. The interest from platforms is, is there, but it's more curiosity than real appeal for, for, for buying the things. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I can see that the, 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 there's something lacking there at the, at the market uh, yet. Yeah. But I think also it's an entire ecosystem, it's an entire environment, and I, maybe we 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 need to 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 keep on trying to have web series being talked about. I'm thinking, uh, uh, I think it's very important that we have the blog, like Chiara's blog, and, and all these things. Uh, to talk about web series and, and, and give them uh, more visibility, but maybe in another way, uh, voila. But, uh, but I, see, I think it's a good thing. I mean, if I had to say, uh, uh, and I'm saying this to students all over the world when I give conferences, I tell them, you know, if you want to do a movie one day, if you want to do a TV series one day, do a web series today, because a web series, you can do it and this is actually right now today to me this is the best way to end up in television or cinema uh, one day yes i totally agree <laughs> <laughs> so and now i tell you ciao ciao thank you very much for this panel it was so interesting i would like love to stay for you for hours but i have to bring my bike to the bike doctor <laughs> <laughs> okay bye bye joel um, ciao ciao, ciao. <laughs> We're just going to listen to uh, the answer of uh, first Caroline to this last question. What do uh, you feel will come in the in the future of web series? What is coming? Well, we'll be fast. I think the future of uh, web series is uh, uh, it's on the new platforms, uh, the new apps, um, and principally the cell phone. I think uh, this is the new format, the smart, uh, uh, the, the cell phone. Yes, I think we're gonna be more and more mobile as well. Yes. Uh, we already have all our world in our phone. So yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Yes. So Chiara, last intelligent thought <laughs> Last intelligent thought, okay. I, I, well, I totally agree with all of you guys, and uh, I also agree with uh, um, you know, that um, the monetization is uh, far away. But uh, uh, where we are going, uh, we are going to have uh, a really near future in which we can uh, still experiment everything with web, with uh, web series. And uh, it's uh, not just, uh, but it's not just a, it's springboard English, right? It's not just a, a springboard board the web series uh, format. It's something that you can do to do something different. And there are a lot of platforms and applications that are now interested in this format. So let's do this and uh, try to keep the attention from the platform and maybe someday you'll be a movie star or a movie <laughs> director, but let's face it, web series are really not easy to do, but uh, you can do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's do the web series now today using all the technologies we have. Yes. Well, to sum up, I would say it's not easy to say what is going to be the web series in the future because it's already very difficult to define what are web series right now. Um, but what we can say for sure is that if you are really passionate, if you want to do something in film or in television, it's probably a very good way to start. And you will be in the cutting edge. You will be in the creative, uh, innovative uh, aspect of media. And I think this is always good to try to be 
up front to try to be in the first line of fire and and try to fight your way up because if you if you really uh, like to produce like I think a lot of us in the web series world do uh, you just do it and you don't ask for permission so I advise everyone um, <laughs> of course keep on fighting to be in television and in film but if you can't you keep on fighting for your dreams and go into the web series <laughs> go into web series guys go into web series <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, now you have another more panel here at the Seriale Educational Day. So this was all. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 <laughs>
just a moment. Okay, hello everyone. I, it's um, it's <laughs> hello. <laughs> it's uh, so nice to uh, see you. Um, it's wonderful that uh, you all joined the panel, and um, and uh, I began. Uh, I think the best is you can introduce all yourselves because we are so many, and I'm really uh, really uh, really happy about it that you are here. Uh, if um, we have um, for the audience. We have here festival directors from around the world for some of the wonder, really wonderful festivals. Uh, many of them I uh, joined uh, myself, and um, they are really beautiful. And um, and um, the festival directors will um, tell uh, you something about the festival. And uh, if you have questions, please write it uh, to the um, uh, write it down, and we will. Um, Yes, and you uh, they, will, uh, they will be answered from the festival directors. So then, um, yes, maybe we can uh, we can um, start. Uh, in uh, in my window is Adria uh, Kishore, the first one. <laughs> so please, maybe from Stable Festival, maybe you can tell something about your uh, festival for, at first. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, uh... My name is Andre, and uh, I founded Terrible Fest. Uh, we're going into our third year this year. It's going to be in October. Um, traditionally, it's in uh, New York City, um, though it's looking like this year we're going to be um, virtual. Um, and where we see the festival really focusing on is is about connecting all these visual, all these amazing digital creators, as we all know, um, with um, mainstream industry. So network studios and agencies that are looking for talent and IP. Yes. Yes, thank you very much for introducing. Uh, yes, then I, I will ask to my next, uh, my next window is uh, Gabriel. Hello, Gabriel. I uh, will <laughs> tell you uh, something about uh, Montreal Webfest. Yes, what? I... <laughs> Yeah, my name is Gabriel, um, I'm the Delegate General of Montreal Digital Webfest. Uh, among the members uh, of the festival team, we have also Lara Everett, that uh, is not there now, that's why I'm here. He's uh, the founder and the festival president. Uh, we have uh, Shaima Stewie, Assistant Director, Angelo Cadet, Artistic Director, and Christopher Leduc, Technical Manager. And um, the Montreal Digital Webfest was created in 2014. After a small pause, we are coming back with our third edition, yeah, this year, uh, which will be from September 24th to 26th, during the Journée de la Culture in Quebec, an event uh, celebrating all kinds of arts in uh, Quebec. So that's, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, great. That's wonderful that you are back again with the festival. Um, uh, and OK, my next window, uh, Young Man Kang, please intro introduce your festival. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, yes, my name is Young Man Kang. Uh, I'm from Seoul. Uh, I have two uh, web tests. The first one, uh, Seoul web test, is a sixth edition. Uh, it's going to be happen in August 20 through 22nd. But uh, we don't know yet. Uh, there might be small chance uh, offline event. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, we're going to announce exactly how we're going to happen in uh, June 20th when you uh, announced uh, nominations. Also, I have another uh, one, Asia Web Award. That one already uh, online web test start from 2017. See, I already predict what's going to happen right now. So that's why I already started Asia Web Awards. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello, Neem. Hello. Hey. You joined hey, us. Everybody. Hello. Great. <laughs> uh, wonderful. So and my next window is, uh, I, I can't uh, almost not read it, but Natasha, hello. <laughs> yeah, 
Hi, guys. Um, I'm Natasha Grigorieva. I'm from Russia. Uh, and I'm the member of the Realist Webfest team. So we are the first and the only one Russian web festival. We already had um, two editions, and um, but now I have some sad news. Uh, we didn't announce it yet officially, kind of a official announcement here and now. So we decided to cancel this year edition. Yeah, so. We won't have a festival this year because it's uh, it's on August and we decided it's it might not be <laughs> the right time this year. So no really sad, but yeah. Later I will tell more about what we're gonna do next year, probably. That's it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um and uh, and my, my next window is Santiago. Hey, Hello. Hello. So I hope everyone <laughs> Hello. is okay. Hello, everyone. Nice to, to see you, to meet you virtually. Um, I am Santiago Gomez, a director from Bogota Web Fest. And um, as you might know, we have uh, to postpone our Web Fest because we had it uh, for April. Uh, so everything uh, we had to arrange everything uh, and to postpone it to October 14, 15 and 16th. Uh, we are also going virtually. Uh, we are doing some uh, restructuring of, of, of the panels of the conversatories as well to talk about more about the, this situation that digital is also like everyone was talking about digital. Yeah, digital the future, digital the future, but nobody thought that this was going to be like, hey, you need to do it now and you, to, and, you, and you need to learn it now. So I think this is going to be a good experience for everyone. So thank you for, for inviting me and I uh, hope to have a wonderful chat uh, today. Thank you very much. And my next window is uh, Martin. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, maybe probably it, uh, um, uh, Buenos Aires series was the last festival live uh, yeah. from the web fest. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, we are the last in this year. Uh, yes. I don't know. Uh, well, in March. Uh, well, my name is Martin Lapisonde. I'm the director of Buenos Aires series in Argentina, in South America. Uh, this year, we changed the name of the festival. Uh, the other editions, the name is Bagwad Fest, but now is Buenos Aires Series. We have a new competition in the festival for the long um, uh, format, uh, not only for short format. And this year we are starting, uh, starting with the um, new program for the young creators with the category under 25. Um, now, we are making for the next edition, but we don't know uh, uh, we are um, passing to the next year. It's, 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 a, it's a difficult uh, situation. Now in Argentine, we are all the industry is stopped. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so and, uh, much. World. And uh, my next window <laughs> is uh, Ricardo. Ricardo Canella. Hi, guys. My name is Ricardo Canella. I'm the founder and director of CC Web Fest. The next edition, the sixth edition, will be in September, but we are trying to do the, a live edition. I know it's very difficult. And um, we have a big partner that is a really big festival here in Sicily. And uh, we are to, we want to understand how we can do this year, this edition uh, together, but uh, we have to understand because here the situation now is it's okay, but uh, the economy, the situation, probably the tourism is very, uh, it's very complicated now, but I need, we need to understand in the next days. So we will wait for, Okay, I understand. 
Okay. Then next, um, my next window is uh, Leandro. Hello. <laughs> hey, Changi, how are you guys? Hello. It's awesome to see you all again. Uh, and most of, of us, uh, everyone here, I already know in person, which is very awesome. Um, my name is Leandro Silva. I'm the founder of Real Web Fest and I'm producer of Sao Paulo Web Fest. Uh, Real Web Fest, I would say it's the biggest uh, web festival because uh, we have uh, four days of, uh, of the event and the, the award ceremony is, is held on a huge theater for like 1200, 1200 people. Yeah, 1200 people, 1200 people that could be, yeah. So it's, it's very gigantic and we always, and we, we do it live stream also. And we've been doing it since 2015, since the, the same year that Soul Web Fest started. And uh, we had Young Man Kang here, Natasha, Martin, uh, Ricardo. Um, we are still missing some faces here, but I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to invite you guys for the next editions. And um, Real Web Fest is all about networking, uh, screening. We always have like uh, cash awards for the winners. And uh, we have some agreements with other festivals that we send creators um, to represent their series on different countries. So we send one creator to uh, uh, Bilbao web series, web fest. Uh, we send it to Marseille also and Rome. And um, this year, uh, Real Web Fest, uh, we are lucky because Real Web Fest is at the end of the year, it's November. So I'm pretty sure uh, we, we have, uh, we have the locations confirmed, so uh, we are 90% sure that's going to happen. So it's, it's going to be awesome if you can join us in Rio in November. And thanks for the invitation for this awesome panel at the City Added. Very excited. Thank you very much, Leandro. Uh, yes, and um, Neem, please introduce yourself and your festival. <laughs> hey, this is Neem Basha from the New Jersey Web Festival. Had the pleasure of meeting some of the people that are on here in person or virtually and good to see all of you um sorry i was late i told uh as i, as I mentioned in uh, my email i had to had work obligations today but uh, i did want to make sure that i get on and just chat with you guys uh new jersey web fest <coughs> um it, this year we're actually it's funny because we're actually uh, at, at one o'clock our time going uh, premiering a, a video where I explain the state of the New Jersey Web Fest as it stands. Um, but I'll announce it here first that um, we will not be having a September 2020 New Jersey Web Fest. We're going to postpone the official selections of the following year till 2021. Um, the tri-state area and the whole world has been hit really hard this year with this pandemic and whether it's financially or whether it's resource wise or any number of reasons, we know people are having a hard time. So, um, uh, you know, we, we decided to just push it and while, while we'll incorporate some digital components as we go and just push all the official selections over to a live event in 2021. Um, yes. But with that being said, hopefully, now that everyone's got over a year to uh, to plan it, maybe we can see some uh, some of your beautiful faces at our festival next year. It's, uh, um, you know, we, we try to make it a lot of fun where people can learn and people can have, there's pageantry and there's excitement and there's um, just like all of yours. And so we, we, we hope to see you out there in September. And we are also partners with a lot of the festivals that are uh, on this panel now and a lot of festivals throughout the circuit and we send each other uh direct selections and, and uh, i believe uh di seriali has uh after one of our shows and um we uh we'll be we're going to be happy to be announcing a direct selection from di seriali to our festival we're sending over a video for that later on today so uh but i'm, I'm happy to see Thank all you much. guys it's it, the, the, this pandemic has hit us hard, but we're all adapting and, and doing doing what we can to, to try to stay positive. So uh, I, I appreciate all you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have a, I have one uh, also one more introduction and a greeting from uh, Janet Tenadis. Uh, she uh, 
uh, couldn't join us, but she sent uh, us a message. Maybe you have to see after about it because we cannot see it in the panel, but uh, the audience will see it in the, in the, um, uh, in the stream. And we are back right, uh, soon. Dear all, thank you for inviting me to participate. I do it with a short video message to congratulate Tucson, Dakota and the whole organization of the Dia Seriale Festival for its tenacity and determination. In this moment of pandemic and era of economic crisis and uh, insecurity towards the future, it is important not to stop. It is essential to carry out your projects. The world of art, and in particular the audiovisual one, has a great task. To tell stories that give courage or that make you think about mistakes, who look to the future or who remember the past, to excite is the mission of those who choose to live and work in a difficult and uncertain market, the audiovisual market. Web series are the last frontier of the cinema that has changed rapidly. We must be pioneers of new languages and I am sure that together we will still have many stories to tell. Bye bye from Rome. Uh, thank you very much, Janet. Uh, we are uh, live again now. And um, yes, at the next, um, I would like to ask you uh, before we talk also about really about the impact of the pandemic. This, uh, this is also a big topic because all of our festivals are really uh, um, need audience. And we can't, uh, at the moment, um, it is really difficult. And uh, also we this year decided to go digital. But what I um, would like to say for our audience here in Germany, it's something about the unique of your festivals. Because every of our festivals is, uh, is different somehow. We have, I know that we have also a, a different focus, everyone, and um, maybe, we, uh, you can talk in uh, how it was in the past, how, what was your main topic, uh, what was something special about your festivals, maybe some sentence, uh, sentences about it. So, and maybe we can uh, make it a, into different way. May, uh, uh, Neem, we can start with Neem <laughs> now. <laughs> um, so, our, our initial our initial uh, launch this, this would have been our third year our initial launch we um, uh, as many of you know I'm a creator myself I've been uh, my show has been graced with being in a number of your festivals and these themes and I um, saw that New Jersey uh, had a lot of creative uh, energy a lot of creative talent um, and I see all these web fests popping up all over the world and uh, conspicuously I noticed that New Jersey did not have one. Um, and so I spoke with a number of the web fest directors that I've uh, formed relationships with over the years um, to get started on launching this New Jersey web fest. And, um, you know, right off the bat, the first year we, we, uh, you know, we focused on a very, you know, creator-centric uh, uh, platform. Um, we, we, we went all in. We, we have our screenings at an actual movie theater where people go in, they buy popcorn, they get soda, they go, they watch the, the screen, the, their screenings. We have, uh, we, we were able to get industry giants to come in and do master classes. Um, we have our awards gala at a, a beautiful banquet hall. Um, all of this to, you know, everything to, uh, as, as all of you know, uh, those that attend the festival, the creators that attend the festival are the ones who make the festival what it is. And, and we, we hammer really hard on wanting to create an experience for them that's going to make them want to, as we call it, feel the magic 
you know, the Jersey magic. Um, so we, we uh, really strive for that. And, um, you know, we've been blessed to be very successful in terms of, in terms of um, forming, you know, success in, in our, in our world is uh, how happy the fest, the uh, creators leave, uh, how happy the creators are when they leave your festival. That's really what success in our, uh, uh, for web uh, director is. And it's been, it's, you know, we've been really, uh, the, the feedback has been great. Um, folks have been happy when they left our festival. They've learned a lot. They've networked. And we see a lot of the people who met at our festival uh, now working together on projects. So it's been, uh, it's been a very community-based uh, festival where people learn a lot. They, they, they get a lot. And they feel, um, you know, they, they feel, uh, engaged and enthusiastic by the end by the end of our weekend they they want to make more uh we get that a lot they want to they want to go out there and make more content and so that's truly the best compliment anybody can can give us so we're we're really excited and, and honored by that so, and, and i want to say thank you to all the webfests that came before us that led the way um i always say we're we're doing well thank god but we're we're standing on the shoulders of giants and all you on all of you who came before us and and, and led the way and and it's kicked off this webfest uh, world, and, and and now here we are. So thank you. Thank you, Neem. Thank you very much. Um, and I uh, just see uh, Michaela is oh joined us and yeah. okay. Uh, hello. Sorry for me. Uh, I was confused with the hour. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm sorry. Um, um, what do we? Um, at the moment, we introduce to uh, introduce uh, uh, our festivals, and uh, I ask then as a second question, um, what was in the past uh, uh, years um, uh, without a pand pandemic uh, so the special thing about your festival, and because every of our festivals uh, are unique, and maybe you can start now. Um, uh, because uh, everyone introduced uh, themselves, so maybe you can introduce you and your festival. Michaela? Uh, uh, is it for me? Is it only yes, for me? yes, 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 yes. <laughs> sorry, I'm ah, sorry. Okay, I was thinking uh, was an invite for everyone. Okay, okay. So I'm. Uh, a video maker and uh, director of Apulia Web Fest. It's a, it's a new web fest, has only two years. And uh, <laughs> in the second year, we, we had to reinvent it, all the festival, uh, for the reason that you know. And we, we felt that uh this year war um was a, a special moment for all the video maker because it was a a moment for create union between uh, so many people uh, that lives uh, distant uh, and uh, during our streaming uh, all people uh, was writing uh, uh, many beautiful things about love, about union. And we had about uh, 5,000 of audience of people that uh, follow our stream. And it was great because uh, we had not only the, the ceremony, but we collect so many uh, important uh, witness from Joel, uh, from uh, uh, other directors, and was uh, very beautiful. And now <laughs> we don't know about next year because. Uh, we are thinking about to, to move 
our date uh, because it's uh, uh, we don't know nothing about uh, next year about the, the global situation about the situation of transport and flights uh, uh, it was a, a pity because uh, uh, last year was a, a was the first edition but it was so great because uh, in uh, in our ingredients we had uh, three things that are audiovisuals peas and food and I have to say that food was a very important glue to, to create union between people and, and so many artists in their messages. Uh, in the last ceremony, they told in streaming, uh, we want Apulian food. We want come back to Apulia for, your, for taste your food. And so we hope to, to have another live edition. So, yes, yes, it is. I understand. Yes, um, thank you very much, um, uh, Leandro. Hey, hello. Um, I was supposed to talk uh, something about Rio, right? Yes, something. Uh, what is uh, what in the past years? What was the special uh, focus of your festival? Um, our. Well, uh, or there's Rio something Fest, unique of, uh, or focus. I wouldn't say it's unique because uh, for most festivals I've been to, we always try to offer the same things as cash awards and distribution, um, uh, distribution deals and uh, tickets to other festivals. So uh, I think uh, for Rio, especially Rio, is a it's a very well known city internationally. So. Most of the people that I know that are from abroad, they always want to get to Rio, to get to know Rio. And uh, I think it's a unique experience because of the city itself. And also because of the festival, uh, we started very small. The edition that Martin was uh, there the first year, we were in a small bar with a small library, a uh, very cozy place. And, and then we moved to this big cultural but so center. so beautiful, but so beautiful edition. Yeah. Oh, thank you, my friend. Uh, I've been to Buenos Aires also, and it's so, also very beautiful. And uh, so uh, uh, I, I think networking is a key, uh, getting to know the cities, getting to know the other creators. And one thing that I really like about Rio is that every series that come to Rio, when they come back, they come even better. So I, I say that I believe that WebFest make a difference in creators' lives because when you create the internet, you are lonely, you don't get to know people in real life. But when you go to the festival and you meet people and you make connections and you learn a lot because of master classes and uh, keynotes and round tables, such as, one of those, such as the one we are doing right now, uh, people in, are improve uh, their work and they, they keep getting better. So I, didn't, I, won't, I, don't say, I won't say that this is only in real web fest, but this is something that I really like to see that creators that come back, they come back with projects they are always improving. Thank you very much. Uh, Ricardo? Okay. Uh, like I said, uh, we are trying to do all is possible for a new live edition this year. And uh, mm, would be difficult, but there are a lot of uh, Amazing festival around the world, but uh, if we talk about the Sicily Web Fest, I think the focus, the the special thing is the possibility for the authors to do uh, an incredible uh, networking in a special location. So this is the reason we um, we are trying to do a live edition this year too. The problem is if uh, um, the authors uh, to want. Um, travel or uh, leave a new holiday this year, no? Because the City Web Fest is uh, an holiday too. And uh, so we, we are trying to understand this in these days. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, um, Martin? Martin? <laughs> yes. Hi. 
Hi. I, uh, yes, the same question. What is uh, about uh, unique about uh, Buenos Aires uh, uh, series now? And uh, yes, yes. Well, yes. Um, you assist at the last uh, festival. Uh, yeah. um, I don't know if uh, special or, or unique. Uh, we are changed uh, the festival. Uh, we have a new competition, uh, but I think it's, it's very unique, the program of under 25, because the festival uh, makes two weeks now, uh, but only for the traditional festival is only for um, four days, but two weeks we are making uh, and working with the new creator of the all the parts of Argentine. Uh, we select and we um, make a special work with these creators and the project. This is the, the, the new part, uh, very special of the festival because uh, it's for the future. Yes. Well, thank you very is, much. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. That's uh, thank you, you too. Yes, I was uh, was there, and uh, I it was really beautiful. And uh, this uh, this year, it this uh, I know, uh, one day after uh, I came back from uh, Buenos Aires, also the uh, I you can travel. I traveled through Italy, and at, at that time it was. Uh, uh, the pandemic uh, was started really yeah. uh, fast, and uh, the close uh, down was one day later. So yeah. I had really luck to came back uh, home. But uh, before I uh, uh, was going, uh, you you didn't know what will happen because it is it is uh, so um, uh, it it was everything going so fast and for us. Okay. Uh, so yes. Um, but uh, it was really a beautiful festival, and I saw this uh, under 25 so part, and it was really, really very interesting. And I also think about it, uh, what uh, that what we can do for for young people, for young uh, young creators. So this is a really good idea, I think. Um, Thank you. Uh, then um, um, Santiago. Uh, hey. Hello. <laughs> Maybe you, you you can say something about to my to the same question. Okay, probably, I think I think probably uh, Bogota Web Fest probably is the brand new festival all around you guys. Uh, so we have learned about what you have done uh, in Colombia. Uh, as you know, we have FISMED from Medellin, and uh, there is also in Roldanillo Valle. Uh, but Bogota didn't have any Web Fest about so what we decided to do at the beginning it was like to do just a web series festival you know but then when we were doing the research we found out that there were a lot of people talking about uh all their different contents uh, so one day somebody says hey why don't we open a category talking about peace and reconciliation so we said, okay, you know what? Probably that's the way that we need to open more, to more categories to see uh, these creators, these content creators, what are they talking about? What are they talking about? And uh, what is the meaning of, of, of their content? So we decided to open different categories. Uh, one of them was peace and reconciliation. We also opened um, influencers with a sense because we wanted to, to show who of these influencers were talking with a with a purpose, with a good purpose behind all his speech. So um, I didn't remember how many categories we had in the first uh, version. It was like it was on February for three days, and uh, we talked about uh, fake news and, me and memes. We talked about um, influencing. We talked about web series. We talked about. Uh, uh, distribution, we talked about music. Um, and uh, for this second version that was planned for be in April, we were planning that the main uh, the main idea or the we were talking about re virtual reality. 
uh, and we also open a new category uh, here, uh, virtual reality, and so many more about, uh, we wanted to see what, who was talking about uh, environment and all that stuff. So, um, uh, so now we, are, as I was telling at the beginning, now we're restructuring all, uh, all the content that we're having uh, in October, all of because the COVID situation. So um, we are planning to have like chats just of one hour. Um, we are changing uh, also uh, the people who speaks English. Uh, we are planning to bring them at the next year. So probably this Webfest original is gonna be completely in Spanish uh, because for the resources and all that stuff. Um, so, but one other thing I think that we should uh, pay attention at this is that we can democratize uh, digital content with these virtual events. And uh, that is one of the purpose that we are planning to. Uh, we want to have like this uh, arrangement with, uh, with uh, social media uh, so we can like uh, spread the web fest and spread the content that we are uh, going to talk about. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens in October and let's see what happens next year. Uh, but that, that's, that how, that's how we are doing now. Yes. Thank you very much. And Natasha, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, what is special about Realist? Um, it's probably um, the atmosphere of the festival because yeah, it's screenings, panels, discussions, uh, but it also about celebration, about parties, having fun and sharing the experience of watching web series on a um, big screen, not such a big screen at a theater screen, but still it's bigger than like um, laptop screen or mobile phone screen. So, and we know that that experience is really important for our guests and we saw it uh, during the two years of our festival. Um, and uh, probably that's why we decided to cancel this year edition. Uh, because, yeah, probably and most likely um, on August uh, in Russia, everything will be back to normal, most likely. And But we realized that um, still the rest of the year will be pretty hard for everybody. It's a massive crisis and people are suffering around the world. So... Um, yeah, we don't want to lose our guests and we want to meet them in person and we want to make live event and on the and and also the ethical side because as I said it's it's a celebration and maybe it's not the right time to to <laughs> to make such an event and to celebrate because yeah, we all share in this hard time and we all uh, like uh, suffered somehow so yeah and um, we didn't we decided not to make it online also same reasons because we like we like the live event and no offense uh, online <laughs> it's totally fine and you're doing actually a great job and it's amazing and I can't even imagine how hard it is to organize everything but to be honest I don't know how everybody else feel but we like sitting home for almost three months. <laughs> we all a bit tired of online. <laughs> we really want life, something life, uh, meet people and uh, have some real connection talks and meet friends. Uh, so, and it, it's gonna be hard to, to make it this year. So we decided we better cancel this year and next year we'll make a bigger festival. We'll make it longer. And of course, we won't ignore all the submissions we had this year because we had almost 1,000 submissions. And um, I want to say a big, huge thank you to all the creators who send their works to our festival. And 
no worries guys we we <laughs> we won't ignore you and uh, the next festival we we will take uh, the submission from this year uh, for sure and uh, it's and the festival just going to be bigger and uh, cooler so <laughs> That's a shame we 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 cancel it this year, but yeah, we we just think that it's it's the right decision. Yeah, that's yes, it. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, yes, I um, I understand. Of course, we had also uh, um, asking ourselves a lot of times what to do, and it is uh, it is really not easy to decide. I think each festival decides for themselves what what they can do and. Yeah. It was it is, decision, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes. we just made it a couple of days ago. This final decision it was really hard because, yeah, we all had some hope <laughs> that we yes. can make it, but we we don't want to risk the festival and of course like our guest health and everything. And borders will be probably closed till the end of the year, and we really want to see people from all over the world, and it's also important. So yeah yes 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 thank you yeah. very much thank you very much and uh, so i ask you uh, young young uh, about soul web fest and asia web awards uh, yes uh, what can you say to the same question um for soul web fest um what's unique about actually uh, we have a really nice uh red carpet because uh, uh, we want to provide creators this nice photo and then you know nice uh, environment so actually that uh, memory from the uh, attending solar fest actually helped them uh, promote uh, you know uh, their uh, web series and then also uh, second one uh, we have a special program one night or two night for uh, tour program from a uh, local the government. So that one actually a uh, local government for uh, tourism purpose. So they provide to creators for uh, for free everything like transportation and then hotel, also food. So, uh, I mean, most of 100%, almost like 99% creators who are attending Solar Fest their first time uh, visit uh, Seoul, uh, even like Korea or in Asia. So I don't want them leave uh, right away after the event. So I want them to uh, get experience. Also, uh, last couple of years, almost like uh, over 100 uh, international creators so came over. Uh, and then uh, even they have a great network uh, so they have good time and then good memories. So uh, this is a perfect time, right, to look at the photo and uh, uh, you know look up the uh, you know the tour. And then third thing, uh, we do uh, uh, VOD distribution through uh, Korean telecom uh, mobile uh, app. So some creators uh, slowly actually uh, start to see the uh, money. Uh, it's not a lot, but still like some uh, money. Uh, hopefully, a uh, more uh, younger audience watch the the, uh, the mobile app, and then uh, more getting more popular the web series through uh, I mean like uh, general audiences. Uh, that's our goal. And for uh, Asia Web Awards, that one we started 2017. It's completely like online. So uh, that one, I really want to help uh, creators that web best online. So uh, I give out a lot of award actually. So uh, that award helping uh, creators to find uh, more investor sponsor for next project. You know, award this is very important for the creators. And then for a pandemic situation right now, uh, Seoul actually pre-settled down. Uh, we are, you know, pretty good used to it. Also, uh, the government, like, uh, under the control, and then uh, all the people, they know how to, uh, you know, deal with uh, the pandemic. So, so number is very uh, settled. But still, thing is, uh, 
we don't want you know only Korean people uh you know event because uh, without you guys from international attendees, it's uh, no use for a Seoul Webfest event. So that's why um, we still like I'm still uh, uh, dealing with some officials. So. 50 50 i mean but still like i'm worried you know even though uh the event is going to happen and uh, how you guys are going to you know fly over uh from your country to korea maybe uh after arriving in korea two weeks uh quarantine and then after that you guys go back your own uh country then another two weeks of quarantine might be it's too uh crazy so probably i think I don't know. I don't want to kill myself. Maybe it's too much for uh, the real event. So that's why um probably go to online event. But we will see. Are we going to decide exactly what's going to happen on June 20th? June 20th, so we're going to announce um, nominations. OK, so yes. see you guys uh, at that time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I am. Um... It's uh, it's really uh, it's wonderful to be there at the festival, and it's uh, really beautiful because you make also this tour to the uh, uh, the last two years, uh, last three years, you make the fem tour, and you can see something also uh, from uh, South Korea, and it is uh, I, I was there of course. Uh, because that I speak about that, and of many festivals, and I was also at uh, at uh, um, uh, Sicily Web Fest, and you see something from the country, seem, uh, and it is the energy also, and the, the contact the, between the creators to make uh, new projects. Uh, this is this is really uh, really something very special also about the Web Fest, uh, and um, it's um, really uh, said that we don't have this year in that way. So, um, uh, Gabriel, what would you say um, about, uh, okay, um, you have uh, like a break uh, a couple of years, but what was and what is your plans? What are the unique uh, thing, what you think about uh, Montreal Web Fest? Yeah, of course uh, we, we don't escape the situation here. The pandemic is real, <laughs> so yes. all the cultural uh, uh, scene is affected by that. So yes, we will go online too uh, with some yes. uh, yeah, panels and all that stuff. Yes. Um, but we have some new uh, new things that we launched uh, this year. Uh, we launched the. Um, the podcast uh, on the road to Webfest on uh, our YouTube channel, which uh, each episode features a creator from our official selection or a director from a partner festival. And it's, it's part of our promotion because we want to put the creators and the directors on front, you know, to promote them. So we, as a festival, we want to promote each creator, each series for seven days on social networks including Facebook and Instagram. And after the festival, because we don't want that the festival is, we don't want the festival to be an end uh, in itself. We want there to be an after, after the festival to continuing promoting the series of our selection. And also this year we launch uh, our special prize, the Joel Bassager Prize which will recognize the most audacious series. Um, each festival partner submit a web series from his location. And the objective of this award is, of course, of course to reward uh, a web series that has stood out, but also to allow greater interactivity between the partner festivals by allowing them to be the defendants of a series from the region or a region. And by that, we want to uh, to include more uh, the, the festival partners. Because this is why having partner festival is important, I think. I want to, to share this idea with you. It's some, just an idea, but we had this idea in 2016, but we could not explore it at the time. But uh, I think 
of that idea uh, about uh, uh, perhaps creating an international web series market independent of webfest events in which each partner festivals could promote web series from their official selection where producers, promoters, broadcasters from around the world will do their market. The idea will be to push the web series community to the next level. Like each of these markets could take place in a different location each year. For example, Montreal, Gisen, Minnesota, Bilbao, Miami, Seoul, why not? And uh, just to name a few. <laughs> And in this way, we will leverage our partnership or community by not forgetting the co-production. So it's an idea that we could discuss uh, here or some in another panel maybe. And uh, yeah, I don't know what you think about uh, all that. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. That's interesting, uh, very interesting because uh, yes, uh, the uh, I think uh, um, co-production and to bring uh, um, Uh, people from the different side of the world together with projects it's, it's a really uh, uh, it helps everyone uh, we, we saw that also in the past so it is it's is really a nice idea i think um i would like to um uh to ask aj uh, or, uh what, maybe um can you introduce something or speak something more about uh, your uh, festival And maybe because of the um, uh, your audio, you have to. If you are not speaking, please turn on that. Uh, the, uh, the who are uh, speaking is in the, uh, in the not in the background. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, I, I think the thing that that we've always seen is the is the uh, festivals are amazing for so many reasons. I think the ability for creators to uh, connect with each other, you know, those sorts of um, friendships and collaborators that you meet by bumping into someone grabbing coffee and um, lingering at the bar uh, after um, the festival events. It's so amazing. And it's, it's something I think we're all struggling to recreate in a um, virtual way. Um, for us, in terms of programming, one of the things that we've seen as the core of the festival is the marketplace that we set up. This year, we are actually very excited that um, we uh, brought in um, a new partner and sponsor, AMC Networks, um, which is a big uh, US television network. And they are sponsoring a prize for the best female creators that are coming through the festival this year. Um, and that that is something that you know we feel um, very important, uh, is very important and kind of a missing um, link in the ecosystem right now is, is there's all this amazing talent that is working online. They're coming from outside of the traditional system. How do they have the conversations that they need in order to um, take their content to bigger platforms and bigger audiences and level up their producing abilities? So um, I think that's something that you know we're planning on um, figuring out the best way to take that industry marketplace and, and going virtual. I think in some ways it'll actually be helpful because there are a lot of industry partners that don't necessarily want to get on a plane and come to New York City uh, in the fall, um, but are very willing to jump onto a Zoom call with um, some creators that they can potentially hire. And I think there's an interesting silver lining around um, the, or not silver lining is not the right word, but um, a way in which the pandemics are affecting production right now. Um, so I think there's, there's, a new appetite and a new openness to talking to talented digital creators um, for uh, new show concepts and new IP. So it's it's definitely something that um, we're in the midst of figuring out, but it, it feels like it could be a, an exciting opportunity for a lot of digital creators at the same time. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I see uh, we are, uh, we can, Uh, we have not so much time. Our time is over, but I want to have a last a last question. Maybe can, each of you can answer uh, very fast, <laughs> and uh, because uh, I think uh, our audience, um, the audience uh, are here in Germany, maybe interesting. Uh, what um, 
what is your festival about, where is your festival, and how they can uh, apply, and where, if it will take place or not. We talked about it that uh, the pandemic, of course, uh, affected each of us. And um, but uh, we have uh, today, this panel is also about, uh, we are on our educational panel, and this is also sub about the web series itself in the different parts of the world. Because I know also myself, as also a creator, that if you make a series you, uh, <coughs> and you produce it independently, you really don't know where is your audience. Maybe it, your audience is not only in your country. Maybe you have audience also in different countries. And I think that this uh, this cooperation between our festivals is really wonderful because uh, so uh, in each country the, the, the creators have the really the opportunity to uh, to learn something about uh, their opportunities and uh, about uh, uh, different. Uh, possibilities in the world and uh, web series in the world. And what I'm interesting now, because we all talked about our festival is uh, really short, a very special thing in your opinion, in your country, what is special about la uh, the web series there, in their, in their part? Of, uh, what, is, what is the most special thing, uh, how web series are made? Maybe a really uh, short answer that we uh, can go through and every can, uh, everyone can say something. Would be really nice. AJ, maybe you you at first. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing that really excites me about web series is that it's this you know um, opportunity for indie creators to explore their creativity and um, create something without the uh, the restrictions or the narrow lens that you know mainstream industry can take to. Um, television and um, content. And so, you know, I think what we're always looking to do as a festival and a company is to celebrate that sort of creativity. Um. Thank you very much. Gabriel. Um, I think we are lucky in Canada because uh, we have a lot of uh, support from the government, like a grant or something like that. And I think it's it's nice to have two languages in Canada. So it's really different when the, the creators uh, create web series in English and in French. Here in Montreal, it's more in French, but it's also good. <laughs> yes. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Yang, please. Okay. Um, okay, Solar Fest is uh, still only one in uh, Asia. It's compared to a lot of like uh, populations in Asian uh, territories. So, uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, online. So, uh, you know, you cannot ignore, you know, some country or some country, whatever. So uh, uh, I think you guys have a benefit uh, through uh, your show, showing through uh, all the, you know, the Asian people through Asian market. So that's the very strong and um, powerful uh, in the Solar Fest and also Asia Web Award. So even this year, um, slowly uh, other Asian countries actually, they are making a web series. Like uh, India, uh, they're huge uh, web series market. Also China, uh, also Japan, slowly they're making web series. And uh, also Singapore, also Taiwan, uh, other few countries already, uh, they submit to uh, us this year. So I can see that they're slowly uh, coming up the web series in the Asian uh, community. And also in the Korean market, um, we are very strong. Uh, it's kind of branded, uh, also uh, government or some corporation and also the, uh, the K-pop stars, all kinds of like the branded with uh, the storytelling that's getting very popular also there's a lot of uh, money and now uh, we are looking for uh, um, the co-production with the other country also uh, other creators that's why a, a lot of korean creators they're really uh, excited to see you guys but this year uh, is unlucky right it's a pandemic so uh, maybe through online maybe uh, next year hopefully uh, 
we can get all together. Thank you very much. Uh, Natasha, please. Um, yeah, <laughs> if, if I need to describe Russian web series and Russian web market now in like one word, I would say experimental uh, because Russian creators, they love um, all kind of interactive stories uh, and a lot of experiments and a web series. Uh, probably <laughs> because we don't have uh, um, this financial support from the government if we talk about web series. Um, and that uh, makes um, creators to be more creative <laughs> because they <laughs> usually don't have uh, a lot of money and but they're inventing something and then trying to make it look different, look, look interesting. And as for the festival, we are looking for all sorts of web series, um, not only experimental, of course, it'll be anything. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much. Santiago? Uh, Songor, I think, uh... Not only Colombian creators, but also like creators all around the world, we have like a challenge is uh, to tell about who we are, to tell about our culture and about our identity. I think if we spread uh, that knowledge in that way of who we are uh, in different ways, I think it's going to be awesome because that's the, the way you're going to see who we are and uh you are going to see and we are going to see how all you are you know with or your identity and all your all your cultureness if that word exists <laughs> but yeah i think that is the challenge yes. we have yes thank you very much thank you very much cool. martin well uh in argentine is similar to canada we have a uh, a lucky country because we have a support of, of the government. Um, but the interesting in Argentine is the creators. Uh, I think it is the, is the best. Uh, with money or not with money, uh, the creators make a lot of uh, new ideas all the time. Uh, now, uh, I, I saw a, a lot of um, short stories uh, in quarantine, making for a famous actors uh, in Argentine or or famous uh, creators and inspirate uh, the new creators and the new generation. And this is important because uh, when the pandemic is finished, uh, we are started again. But now we need to change, but uh, no stop. I understand. Yes. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Michaela. Michaela, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, here in Italy, uh, we we had a, a situation uh, that uh, is always the same about the web series because there is no a market of web series. Um, there. You cannot um, have so money from the creation of web series. Uh, there's someone that wants uh, uh, to to say that uh, we have a market, but it's not it's not in that way, uh, and it's uh, too far the day of uh, <laughs> the, the the rise of this Italian market about web series, but. I think that this is uh, an important way to create a communication, not only because it's a democratic way, a low budget way, and uh, that can create networking, but because uh, with uh, the, um, the born of a web series in Italy, people discovered again genres. Because from 70 years, we don't have genres anymore we have only intellectual movies no no sci movie no um, thriller no uh, western movie 
but thanks to a web series, uh, all the audience can discover the different Jersey again. Thank you very much. Uh, Leandro, please. Um, um, I, I believe that uh, the pandemic uh, is a very bad situation, of course, but it has also opened for new possibilities for streaming. So I see a lot of streaming platforms launching right now, and uh, they are always looking for content. So if you are creating content to be consumed on mobile or by the internet, this is the best time to try to distribute your content. There are platforms everywhere. And uh, if you don't speak English or your series is not in English, I would strongly suggest that you put English subtitles and that would help you find uh, niche audiences outside, even outside of your country. And uh, as I mentioned before, Real Web Fest is happening live on uh, November uh, 12 to 15. Submissions are open in Film Freeway and also on our official website. And I hope to see everyone there. Thank you very much, Leandro. Uh, uh, Neem, please. Uh, it's, it, the question was about uh, the... Um... Yeah, I heard, I'm sorry, I was just muted. I had to unmute. Okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, one of the things um, about web series that, that's pretty special, especially here um, in the, in the tri-state area, the New York, New Jersey area, I mean, we've had a lot of creative you know, a lot of, it's, you know, one of the world's creative hubs. And we noticed that a lot of the, of course, I echo everything that um, my colleague said uh, already, but one of the things that I wanted to add, the thing about web series, it gives opportunities to people who um, have never had opportunities um, it gives them opportunity to create as long as they have the, the talent and the will to do it. Um, but I'm also, I, we also see a lot of, of, of veteran filmmakers who have made films, short films, feature films, have been in the industry for a long time, who um, have gone to web series, either um, because it's a great way to kind of like, uh, you know, close out your, your filmmaking career and, you know, get even more exposure or because, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks have been doing this a long time to very limited success because of um, some of the stuff that Ajay spoke about, you know, mainstream uh, platforms slamming the door in people's faces for any number of reasons, having nothing to do with their talent. A lot of times it could be bureaucracy. A lot of times it could be, you know, there's, there's limited number of space for how, how much, how many films there can be. Um, it could be for any, any number of reasons. Some, uh, we can go on and on about the, what the reasons are, but some people have, have had very limited success who have then taken those talents now that we have a web world and um, had unlimited ability to make their projects and then be seen and thanks to the webfest circuit and thanks to the web series world cup and thanks to the ubiquity of of, of web series in general they've um you have these people you have these uh, again veterans who've been doing this for a long time who've now um for the first time found found uh, success and and uh, exposure to their work in the web series world. So uh, it, it's really great to have that kind of mix of like very, you know, up and coming, first time filmmakers making web series. And then the people on the other side of the spectrum that have been doing this a long time that are bringing that experience. And then they come together in the web series, in the, in the web fest world, they come together and they exchange ideas and they exchange thoughts. And it, it's really, really exciting. And we're seeing a lot of those filmmakers, obviously, out of the New York, New Jersey area, but from all over the world. Um, so we're super, super excited about that. And, and again, New Jersey Web Fest, um, you can still submit at Film Freeway. Uh, 
and we our fe- our festival our submissions are going to be open for a little bit longer than we planned because of uh, we're we're moving our festival to 2021. Um, all the official selections they get selected from this year will screen next year and be celebrated in live uh, next year. So uh, we we. Uh, look forward to having that energy that I just spoke about, that collaboration between all these filmmakers from various experience levels. We look forward to having that collaboration next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ricardo. Okay. Um, here in Sicily, we have the support of the government of the Sicilian Film Commission. So, it's real that it's true that in Italy we don't have a, a real market, but we have a good opportunity of uh, co-production. So I think the festival is a good opportunity for create the connection to the many authors and uh, create this kind of uh, co-production. So yes. Oh, great! Thank you very much. So. Um, our time is over, so uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. And I, I'm really happy that you uh, helped us to make this uh, panel happen. And it, it is really beautiful to see you all together. And at the same time, I also want to thank Janet for, for, for your awesome video. Thank you very much that you sent it us. And, um, and I, um, I'm, I hope Everyone uh, can, um, I know we have uh, everyone difficulties with the actual situation. It is really uh, uh, a challenge for all of us. And I wish you all uh, to really the very best and, um, and stay safe and healthy, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You too. You guys also. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Take and, care. And, uh, bye-bye. 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 And uh, for the audience, I would like to say we are a little bit late. Uh, stay tuned. We are back in a couple of minutes. Bye.
Hello, everybody, and um, welcome back to the educational, to our final panel. Um, I'm joined today by um, a team of uh, very creative uh, filmmakers from all over. And um, so here with me is uh, Frederik Seimet from uh, the series W. Say hello, Frederik. Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> and uh, Gaston Amakeno from uh, Fila78. Hello. And we have a Kyle Leland from Hammersmith. Hi. <laughs> and uh, Joachim Jung from Man for Your Sins. Hi. <laughs> I'm very happy we're together here today. Um, first of all, for our audience, um, I would like you to um, maybe uh, sum up uh, your, your series just in like maximum three sentences. So our audience um, who ha maybe hasn't seen uh, all of the series yet um, knows the plot. And I also think sometimes it's uh, really difficult to actually say what is a series about. Um, so I would like you to, to recap that um, everybody for themselves. Um, starting with um, Frederick, maybe. <laughs> Gladly. Um, thank you for having us. It's, it's always nice to talk about what we did. Um, so my series is called W. Um, it's the story of a woman that has been found in the middle of the forest by um, the Luxembourg police. Uh, she doesn't know who she is, she doesn't know where she comes from and what she's actually doing there. But um, strangely, she knows everything. She just like a working Wikipedia. Um, and and the, the whole series that develops over six episodes, uh, between five and ten minutes, and ask the question of who she is, what she's doing, and what's her role in this um, if, in the disappearance of three children in Luxembourg. So it's a whole question about her identity and and so on. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll continue with uh, Gaston. Okay. Well, my series is Feller 78. I don't know if Feller or in German did they, we say different filler, like you say. Fila, yes. <laughs> Fila, yeah, okay. It's um, a series, a science fiction series, and some a bit of comedy of a group of people that is living in a van, in an intelligent van, and is uh, that they are searching for people, for other people that maybe they are alive, or maybe they are the only one that they are alive, and they find something uh, worse than that, and now they have to survive of this situation. Thank you very much. Um, so we continue with uh, Kyle. Sure. Um, so Hammersmith is kind of half action, half comedy. It's about a uh, filmmaker who's trying to make an action film franchise. Um, it's kind of like uh, The Office on a film set. Um, and he's such an, a, a terrible idiot filmmaker that everything goes horribly wrong. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I thought it was really funny. I, I really loved your series. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Just, uh, just my genre mockumentary, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, the last one, uh, Joachim Jung, would you present your series? Sure. Um, my series is about uh, a priest who sits in a container and he uh, hears confessions of people who come in. So it's a very easy setting, you know, just a container. And each episode is just a priest and one sinner who comes in to confess. Thank you very much. Um, so let me first say I, I really enjoyed all of your series. Um, of course, I watched them all and I, I, I thought they're each and they're so different. But um, they're, they're really all like, um, like really enjoyable within their genre. Um, and I noticed that like... Um, almost all of your series um, had like really um, strong social commentary um, made in a really different way. And um, maybe we can, uh, we can talk about this uh, a little bit. Um, so I, um, I felt like uh, there's, um, I, I, I want to ask you, uh, Joachim, um, with, your, with your main character, this priest, uh, who's in the container. Um, what is like, what, uh, because there's really short episodes um, and they're each like, um, have a story that's like closed, 
within itself. Um, so there's always a new person uh, in every episode who comes to the priest to confess something. But uh, this priest character, like, uh, what would you think is like, um, is like the, the root of this character? What's like, what, who is he? Like, what's his core, you know? I think it's a commentary on man, basically. You know, it's not about the priests, it's about men, how men behave and how men in these days have a lot of difficulties to, uh, to, to transform. You know, especially if you think about the Me Too movement or about the feminist movement and about the changes, how our parents still were kind of very traditional. And now let's say we men, we are supposed to be different and the, the adjustment, I think it's a very comic uh, process. And I think that's the core of, the, of my priest, of the main character. So it's not so, bad, so much about religion, it's more about the difficulties to adjust in a society which has moved on. And we sometimes as men are still in the past. And I think that's funny. You know. yeah, so the, the priest is kind of like a, a representation for this part of society. Yes, I think so, yeah. I mean, he wants to go, do good, but he still, you know, uh, falls back in this old uh, behavior of being a macho kind of, or also feeling as a victim. You know, he feels very much like a victim to uh, society, but also the women who come in, they treat him bad and he feels, oh, as a man, he should, uh, you know, cope with that, but he can't. Yeah, you know what I mean? So Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Um, I, I I really, um, because it's, it's interesting that you say that. Um, I, I kind of felt the feminism in your in your series, especially through that like older lady um, who's uh, had like two boyfriends or two husbands. Yes. Uh, yes. That was a really great episode. And uh, she she was really um, like progressive in her character, I thought, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, now when you say that, um, I feel like um, I, I read some articles about that and it's, um, that, that said that um, men nowadays don't really know their their role anymore, like their, yeah. their place. Yeah. And yeah, so uh, that's that's a um, really nice way to um, to make this accessible, I guess, um, mm -hmm. through that kind of um, art form. Yeah. But let me also add, because you were talking about this one character yes. who comes in and she has two boyfriends, uh, two husbands actually, it's also, that's also something about racism. I also wanted to say something about racism and about the, the falseness or bigotry uh, we have sometimes in society or with, in ourselves too, you know, that, um, well, definitely it's about the subliminal, subliminal racism. Yeah, I mean, this um, topic is really like um, yeah, on everywhere to, today, yeah? Yeah, um, yeah. not just in the US, but also here in Germany, of course, right? Um, where people now are saying um, we have to uh, reflect like each or every one of us uh, ourselves because we grew up with certain stigma stereotypes. And of course we have them in us, like yeah. no matter how reflected we are um, on this uh, subject in an academic way or but um, we still have like these these stereotypes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I, I always uh, I thought it was really funny when when she said she is uh, married. I think there was an Indonesian guy, right? Yeah, Indonesian Muslim. <laughs> exactly, and uh, the priest was uh, so. Why don't you convert to Islam? <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, thank that's... you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was your second season already, right? Yes, um, that was my second season. The first season were only five episodes. And now we shot uh, 16 episodes, mm -hmm. but so far only eight episodes are finished. And I still don't know where to place them exactly. I'm still looking for the right platform. Ah, okay. So, okay. so um, but we can look forward to more episodes. Yeah, 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 definitely. 16 more episodes. That's but right. Let me just, you know, just let me add, because you said, or well, also said each episode is enclosed by itself, but also I have storylines which go over all the um, episodes. So when you watch more of the episodes, you find out that there are some certain stories, stories which go on longer than one episode. And also the sinners come back and also the, the story of the priest will, is also, you know, it's, he has his problems and he tries to solve them, but they're not, un, they're not solvable. But that's kind of a storyline which goes through episodes. Okay. 
Good. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, I think we maybe move on to, to another series. Um, um, yeah, Hammersmith. <laughs> so Kyle, um, as I just said, I, I really love uh, mockumentaries. Um, it's one of my favorite genres. And um, I was wondering, um, what kind of advice would you give someone who is planning on making a mockumentary? Because it's really meta what you did. So yeah. uh, I was wondering, yeah. Um, well, I, th I personally, me and my team, we actually make documentaries for, you know, for promotional stuff and for, um, you know, for theater companies behind the scenes, that type of stuff. So I think, well, the, the first thing you should do is actually make a documentary. <laughs> then you, you learn how to best, um, you know, set up interviews and, uh, you know, and kind of, you kind of hone in on that, um, that, that genre. Um, and also watch a bunch of documentaries. So you see their style. Um, you know, a lot of different mockumentaries do it very differently. Um, like the office kind of doesn't have, um, it's like very loosely documentary. Like usually you don't really notice it, but then they use the documentary to make a different type of joke. Um, so if you watch a lot of documentaries and you watch mockumentaries, you can kind of see um, how how they do it. Um, yeah. And then, I mean, I guess it, it's it really helps with writing because um, it's kind of like the exposition. The character can just say straight to you, you know, so it, it makes some of the writing easier. Um, so it's a good type of um, filmmake. It's a good type of genre to start with, I think, for for younger filmmakers, because it gets a lot of the hurdles out of the way for you to just um, be able to move on with the story. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of different. It's a, a lot of the advice would be the same advice you'd get for for anything. You know, a lot of trial and error. Okay, um, but um, so in your in Hammersmith. Um, also felt like a really strong uh, feminist commentary um, was going yeah. on and made in a like um, like real like direct and really funny way by with the characters like I'm I remember these the two women talking and they'd be like did you uh, did you notice never uh, two women talking uh, in a scene of one of those movies and that yeah. was the scene where the both of them were talking right. so um, yeah. I thought it was uh, really on the point like really um, really in your face but also. Yeah like really uh, funny. Um, do you think it's a good way to, to um, or what, let me ask uh, differently, what, what makes this, uh, your approach uh, so, um, uh, what, what makes it effective, you know, um, to communicate um, feminist issues? Yeah, well, I guess in jokes like that, uh, it's the, the obvious irony of it, you know. Mm. Um, but one thing that I wanted to, um, kind of what I wanted to make fun of specifically was, wasn't just like sexism in the industry, but the fake, like fake feminism, you know, like somebody who is like corporations who try to take advantage of feminism to make it seem like they are, you know, so high and mighty, but really it's inauthentic, you know? So like he's, like Hammersmith, the character, Bayou Straits, this director, he, you know, he he wants to to have the image of feminism. So he hires um, a female DP so that he can get into better festivals, you know, like it's so it's kind of making fun of, you know, a deeper element of that type of uh, sexism that's that's in the industry. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I don't really know how I how, how I tackled the uh, the specific uh, the specific way. I kind of just found ironic ways to show what is actually happening. Um, but yeah, there's kind of just a way when you when you take somebody and you who's a total idiot and you catch him doing it. It's just for some reason it's funny, you know. Would Would you say uh, Hammersmith uh, is supposed to be a lovable character? Yeah, that's something uh, that I've kind of we, we kind of debated a lot is like how how likable does your character need to be, you know? Um and I think 
yeah, I think he's likable because he's so blind to everybody, everything else because he's so narcissistic. You know, he's so um, he wants, you know, to be rich and famous so badly um, that it's pathetic. And I think when someone is pathetic, you kind of you you're not so harsh on them, you know, like he's you know, you pity him a little bit. But he also in the story, in the in the rest of the season that we have yet to release, he kind of he becomes more um, he eventually, you know, learns the error of his way. And and he kind of actually starts to make the decisions that that uh, show his actual character, you know. OK, so we have like a, a nice character arc for him coming up. Yeah, he, yeah. There's a redemption kind of. Uh... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. yeah. So um, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, I, I will definitely. <laughs> um, so I just uh, see uh, Lotte Ruf has, uh, has joined us. Lotte, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Okay, wow. Hello. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, right now I'm on the train from uh, Berlin to Düsseldorf. And uh, I'm actually a little bit surprised I'm part of the panel. Um, I didn't know this. Um, but I think I've got enough internet here in the train to join you. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I already heard from my team that there was a mix up with the with the dates um, with you. And, yeah. Y yes, I'm also a part of the panel tomorrow. Uh -huh. And um, I didn't realize I'm in both. That was the mistake. But no problem. Yeah, I am. Okay, no, that's great that you join us. <laughs> um, Lotte Ruf is, um, you're the writer of um, Haus Kummerfeld, right? I'm the producer. Ah, producer. Okay, sorry, I got that mixed up. Um, yeah, so um, Haus Kummerfeld was a, is a German TV series, a, a German web series. And um, right now in the beginning of the panel, I asked our panelists to... Um, to summon up the plot um, or the message of uh, the series in like own words for like maximum three sentences. Maybe you could do this for us as well. Yes, of course. Um, House Kummerfeld is a web series placed in the 19th century and is about the noble Louise who uh, lives with her old fashioned family in the Münsterland, a really um, yeah, a really sad kind of uh, landscape. And she wants to become famous as an author and wants to write books. But as she's a woman, she can't uh, do it as she wants. And she has to start a fight against her own family uh, to receive her dream. And um, she does it in a really weird kind of way. And this is how our story begins. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, well, I was just talking um, uh, to the uh, to the others about um, about uh, the feminism that's in their series. Um, like um, Hammer Smith has really feminist um, social commentary. Um, Joachim Jung actually has like um, a, a commentary on the masculinities in the, in the, the Man for Your Sins. Um, I didn't get to talk to the others, yet, but. They have similar social commentaries, and um, I think, of course, House Kummerfeld um, has like really strong um, feminist commentary. Um, yes. So maybe um, you want to talk a little bit about that, because um, I was um, you you have the big disadvantage that I actually wrote my thesis about masculinities in about this time frame that House Kummerfeld uh, has played, and um, I was really wondering. <laughs> <laughs> about her uh, brother character, um, about Louise's brother, uh, that he, he becomes her, um, like, um, what's it in English, uh, her uh, guardian, kind of? Um, yes. Yes? Yes, exactly. Um, and he, um, he he's been really, um, he comes off as really, like, mean, um, but I was wondering, like, what is it uh, that drives his character? Like, like, what is, uh, what, what is his character about? Because uh, I felt like uh, all of his, uh, like, negativity, um, and he's like this antagonist, right? Um, that kind of yeah. stems from his, like, 
perception of masculinity probably yeah, he's a really traditional character so um when he comes when he has his first theme in Hauskummerfeld, he's just back from military school and um the father of uh, fight and Louisa dies so he becomes um the guardian of of the manor of his sister and he's the small brother so he's not the guardian of his uh, bigger sister and um and he's just back from military school and he really has this drive to get there and then we have louisa who's really a dreamy person living in her mind in her own world and those two characters crash together and um of course, Louisa doesn't accept that um, her little brother is now her guardian. And um, Fight, who in his childhood, he was always the little one, he was always told off, and he now sees the chance um, to, yeah, to revenge this um, behavior of his sister uh, in their childhood. And um, now proves that he's a real man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay um so uh, there's um uh for a second um yeah so so i i thought um uh, frederick um, actually um i have a question for you and um you are like strong female character in this uh, series um so she uh, i think uh, she has a really interesting relationship uh, with the uh, two cops uh, maybe um, you can tell us a little bit about this because uh, it seemed like like this traditional trope of um, good cop bad cop who's kind of became like almost like a running gag or meme, uh, you know, <laughs> in uh, movies. So was it in intentional? Like, um, um, uh, uh, I, I would love to say yes. It was really super intentional. And everything was really measured out, and I knew absolutely what I was doing. Um, yeah, um, no, so, so it, it's from, from the beginning there, there was this kind of idea of a high concept of this woman alone in the forest who doesn't know who she is. And I wanted to tackle different issues through this kind of high concept. So, one of the first issues is um, when you watch the series, is, um, she has Asperger's. So, um, the, the whole question of, of, of autism, how autism is um, pictured in in movies or TV. So she has a commentary on that. And then of course, um, what I found interesting is, is so I, I'm, I'm, Luxembourg is still like this very small country. And in this small country, you still have like this kind of small areas uh, where people, you know, everybody watches, series and movies and everybody wants to, to be this kind of cowboy who just gets his gun out and shoots at people and he's this superstar of everything and while writing it i wanted to have this kind of character but also in a way um to not to make fun of it but to turn it around so he's still a sensible guy who's a little bit lost who thinks he needs to be a cowboy who, but it doesn't he's, he's, he's just a luxembourg policeman so he needs to work with what he has, and um, and so the, the, I wanted to talk about different things and be able to to go around and make it sometimes funny, sometimes less funny, uh, but not not trying to make fun of people, but just trying to make it more uh, sensible. So, but um, I thought it was really striking and. Um, that this um, that this Asperger uh, was such a central theme of uh, the series and um, uh, how it was interconnected with like this detective uh, storyline and uh, I was wondering like how, how how did you get the idea for that? Um, so it started with the high concept of a woman learning, uh, lost in the forest. And I always had this kind of idea of to do something about hypermnesia. So that's the opposite of amnesia. That's people who are not able to make a difference between what's important and not important. So they memorize everything. And while going through this research, 
um, so it's, it's, it's a theory. People think some these kind of people must exist, but uh, we have never met them. Lotte, could you maybe background. turn off your microphone? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. That's great, thanks. <laughs> uh, so so, so there's, it's a theory. So people think that they must exist, but they don't know if they exist. And while going through these features, I came across people um, having Asperger's. And, um, uh, and I, I, I wanted, to, as soon as I discovered it and, and, I, and I started writing about it, I wanted to be as um, close to reality that I could. So I went to uh, different associations and I talked with a lot of people with autism, uh, with Asperger's in the kind of autistic spectrum. Um, and uh, as, 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 so slowly the concept faded away uh, and this kind of issues of um, Asperger autism came across as something that I really wanted to make more important and bigger in the story and to be able to talk about it without being too too much on the nose. So it's in the series, it's in the narrative without trying to be like, you know, autism is that and that and that. It's more like you understand it while watching what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I thought, I thought it was really um, nicely done because um, often when you have um, film or TV um, that uh, like includes um, characters on the spectrum or characters with mental illness or whatever, um, it's usually just about that. It's like this is the main main plot point. And uh, so but it wasn't it wasn't the main plot point. It was one of the plot points. And um, so so I thought there was um, a really nice um, like twist on that, you know. Um, and I thought it was really interesting how you, how you visualized um, what's in her in her head, you know. <laughs> it was really beautifully done. Like whenever she's like, sometimes when she thinks, it's like these white um, lines coming up um, where she's looking at, and yeah. Thank so. you. Thank you. That's, that was. Yeah, it was kind of a lot of work I, because when 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 I talk with people in this autistic spectrum, something that always came back was this kind of synchronicity. So this capacity of having this kind of emotions then mixed together. So when they hear a note, they see a color, or when they see something, they hear something. Or all this kind of complexity that that I had trouble to. Um, to put into words or to put into pictures. And um, we, I, I tried with them and with talking with them to find a way to, in a way, uh, make it tangible and understandable what's going through their minds. Yeah, as I said, I think it's really well done because not just like um, showing what's going through her mind, but, but it's also like visually, you know, pleasant uh, to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah uh, speaking about visually ple pleasant um Fela 78 is also <laughs> i think a really well shot and um but what struck me the most uh, while watching it was um like the dialogue it's uh, so funny um like it's really like witty and fast and um you know it's, it's just full of humor uh, and sarcasm uh, but uh, this uh, the the this post apocalyptic setting of the series is uh, a huge contrast to that. So I was wondering, um, like like what what were you going for, Gaston? Maybe you can maybe you can say something about that. I I like I like the when well, well something that I like a lot of <clears throat> films or or series is when they mix up two kind of genres like humor and suspense or science fiction, I think it's a, it's a good way to say things because you are mixing two kinds of, of, of uh, moods, uh, two kinds of, of styles, and you are doing one. I think that I am really doing comedy all the time. I am a star in the web series doing, uh, like, uh, like, like Kyle, a uh, um, uh, mockumentary of, of a human documentary and and I always 
make myself easier to, to tell something with comedy. In this case, we search for tell something about a pandemic, like a pandemic, like now, but more exaggerated with some monsters, and we love the genre, and we love to do something horror, but 80s or something like that, because in our country, it's something that is starting now to appear, because they do another kind of movies, and we fight for that kind of cinema too, for a different kind of cinema. And I love to make that. It's like a roller coaster. You make fun, you have fun times, and maybe you have like uh, something else, so maybe a scare or maybe thrilled about what is going to happen. And it's a good way because in all the series of criticize people in in a in a dangerous situation or in the worst situation, you can talk about the worst things that the human change a lot in these kind of situations. And uh, in in all the series, I think some characters start to be uh, really shitty people because they are as scared and they don't know what to do, and they have the real self out in these kind of situations. So we mix a lot of things. Thank you for 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 the the the, the, the compliments of, the, of, the, of whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was it was really funny series. I, I always like um, the crossover between like sci-fi or horror and uh, comedy. Um, I think great things uh, happen when you cross this. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, you you also play a character on the series, um, and it, it seems like your friends doesn't really like you that much. In no, the... my my character is the is the shitty one. <laughs> But I didn't really think he was so shitty. I, I sometimes I didn't understand why why your friends don't like you because uh, because it's something that is going to start at the beginning. But then in the in all the series he she, he does some shitty things. He does he start to be funny, but he he start to be scared. And in some situations his reaction is not the the, the best reaction. And and in in one scene. Something happened with some some of the of the crew members that he left them out and he's on the on the van and, and left to the to the this monster killed this guy. So I think it's something that starts in the past and he starts the series with something that we don't know that happened with him and all the people uh, hate him because something because we think in some way he do a prequel so. To, to but I don't know if it's going to happen but but maybe some things is going to be more clear because we think in a prequel a sequel too. <laughs> so I don't know yeah because I, it felt like they never liked him so maybe you, no, you no, can explain never. the story why why they don't yeah <laughs> never never uh, yes so we, because as I, I am the director so I have to play the the, the worst character <laughs> so so it's <laughs> but like I, I think uh, he's also like the like the the most like um uh, funny character uh, kind of because he's a uh, yeah a little mean sometimes and you know well yes maybe yes 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 why not why not when, when you play a character that is mean and, and funny in some days sometimes it's, it's maybe it's more more real too because he have like all the the, the things together He's not a perfect person he's like uh, an idiot <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you you were uh, the, the, a lot of the series is uh, set in the, in the woods um, and um, I was wondering like um, was the uh, well difficult to shoot there than somewhere else like um, I don't know how, how far have you like shot it in the woods was it like just the beginning of the woods or were you deeper in no it was all in the woods and it was easier to us uh, because we have to change the script because we think in all the series in a in a like in a lab and it was going to be your other thing and we have problems then with the location and we start to change things to to do it in the in the woods and the woods uh, was really near the place that we are the city that we are Montevideo and was more, more easier to put to to shoot in there because well, you have everything. It's like uh, you can uh, 
uh, talk about a pandemic war or a post-apocalyptic war more easier than have buildings and everything because you have, we don't have the budget to do that. So it was, was a good idea to, to don't show all these things that we don't have or we can't do. Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> obviously. Um, yeah. But 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 you can do. I think. Um, I, I think it must have been difficult to um, to 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 shoot uh, in in an RV because yeah. it's like limited space and you have cameras, you have the crew. Like uh, yes, yeah, you have to think a lot in the in the in the, in the different uh, planes that we were to do because uh, it was really really a, a really little place. We use the the wood the woods to make more uh, wide screen shot shoots, but the the, the more it was difficult and it was we have to to think really well to do it there because it's like uh, shooting in a row. So it was not easy, but it was nice because we play a lot with the with the environments and with this band that talks with the people and everything. We we make. The Vanna character too, so it was funny in a way. Yeah, it, I mean, uh, it. Uh, I think also it was um, a really um, like a, a nice uh, contrast uh, to uh, like the life in the van, and then you have the woods, which is actually a place that we as humans kind of connect with, like something positive, you know, like being yes, yes. nature. <laughs> but for them, it's dangerous. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that was, um, I, I really like that contrast. Um, Lotta, are you still with us? Lotta? Yes. <laughs> Hi, just checking if you're still with us. Um, actually, I would like to talk a little bit more about, about um, Haus Kummerfeld, because um, it was uh, compared to um, the other series uh, that are here in this panel today are quite a uh, long series. Um, and so uh, it, I think it had a running time uh, for like one and a half hours um, altogether. Um, so uh, you're, but I guess you're, you're planning a second season. Yeah, so we uh, just shot uh, eight episodes each about 10 minutes long and um, we already have some ideas for a second season um, but uh, nothing nothing really planned right now okay because it kind of ends like um it kind of ends like like a little cliffhanger i guess well to me at least i, I felt like the story was not um, like i wanted i wanted to watch more like I wanted to see what's what's gonna happen next. <laughs> Happy to hear this. Um, yeah, so it's uh, totally uh, the concept is totally uh, up for another uh, season. But um, it was really hard to produce the first season, and um, it, um, our director Mark Lorai, it took him, I think two and a half years from the first idea till now. And um, yeah, we have to see how we get this for a second season a little bit faster and better and everything. So yeah, we yeah, have a well, plan, uh, but nothing more. <laughs> well, I, I hope we, we're gonna see it soon <laughs> because now I, I, wanna, I wanna see it. <laughs> But uh, I, I thought, yeah, of course, it's a lot of work that you put in there. You can see that the costume design, um, the place it was shot uh, was uh, really beautiful. Um, and it kind of uh, really, um, you kind of really recreated this like time, this historical time. Um, and I liked it very much. Um, I also, um, <laughs> coming back uh, to this uh, social commentary, right? Um, I think it was uh, what what really uh, took me with the series was that you you place the story in this historical setting, and um, you manage to um, to recreate the, um, the, the the life of um, a young uh, woman in this time and her struggles and her fight, um, and but you also um, kind of. Uh, 
yeah, spoke spoke to uh, our um, generation of women and uh, our our struggles and our fights at the same time. I can't um, hear you right now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you <laughs> say the question again? I'm sorry. I was just blabbering, um, but <laughs> so I, I I said I really like how you managed to to show the struggle of um, this times uh, women and nowadays women, you know, um, because it was in there like like um, the problems that we still face today. Uh, and you also like visualized that and um, especially also I worked with the soundtrack um, to make it more modern. I was like a really like cross contrast. To, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I was wondering um, how, how did you how did you get uh, uh, the idea behind them um, setting that in, in that time period? How did we get what? Sorry. <laughs> the idea to, to, to put the story in this time period. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Lots of... Okay. Yes, I can now I can hear you. Okay. So... <laughs> um, Is it better? So, yes, now it's better. So why we put this modern story in a historic setting, right? Yeah. That was the question. Okay. Um, so it starts with our director who studied uh, history. And um, yeah, we wanted to, um, to show the similarities to women's problems in the end of the 19th century compared to the problems of women nowadays. And um, they're almost the same, which isn't really nice. And we wanted uh, to elevate this uh, situation that actually in the last 150 years, they didn't change enough. And um, yeah, this was the idea behind this uh, historic setting. But um, I felt like you, you did not just comment on um... On, 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 on women's um, problems. Now I can't time. hear you again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, you're always driving through like holes of, I guess, internet, internet holes in Germany. They're everywhere. Yeah. Welcome um, to Deutsche Bahn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I didn't, I, I felt like you would not just commenting on women's um, struggles but also on, on, on men's um, struggles uh, with, with gender, um, you know, gender expectations. Lotte? <laughs> okay. Okay, I think we, um, we move on from that <laughs> for now. And um, I actually, I see that um, our audience um, had some questions. Um, I will read them to you. Um, so our audience wants to know, um, nowadays uh, there seems to be a high demand of productions being shot in English, as it seems becoming more and more the language of um, media in general, uh, at least if you want to be internationally known. Um, yeah, but you guys, um, some of you didn't film in English. All of you, except Kyle, actually. So, <laughs> um, what do you think about that um, question? Um, or, or not a question, but as a comment. I mean, Frederick's um, is, is, uh, series was in um, Luxembourgish. What's it in English? Oh. Uh, <laughs> I don't know the English term. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Luxembourgish. So it's, is it's, it? It's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> good. And uh, I mean, we have a Spanish um, series from Gaston, and uh, of course, Joachim and lots of series are in German. So, um, so how? Uh, what do you think about that? I have certain thoughts about that. If I may start, yes. yeah. but because I, we were also thinking about English, but. Um, I hope, let's put it that way. First of all, I think it's also important that 
we keep our culture and language is part of the culture. And I think, you know, like great actors in Germany just speak good German, they don't speak good English. But also I think most languages in the world are still not English. So I also felt with the first, uh, with my first season, that a lot of countries would watch the series with subtitles and it's not unusual to them. So a lot of countries are used to uh, subtitles. And also I hope uh, with the vertical, especially with the vertical format and with the, with the web series really being used on, on, on Facebook or on, on smartphones or tablets, a lot of people don't even listen to the sound. So I think, you know, especially my series, I also would like to do, and I, so far I only did the trailer, but I would like to finish that also in a vertical format and just use subtitles so people can watch it and read the subtitles. They don't even have to listen to the sound, which, you know, most of the videos, on, as we know, most of the videos are, are consumed without sound. Not web series, but, you know, like all the, all the series on, on Facebook, uh, not series, but all the videos on Facebook and Instagram, mm. they don't even listen to the sound. They just read the subtitles. And that's why I think, okay, you know, then you don't have to shoot in English. At least that's my excuse. And I think, um, I think subtitles, a lot of young people, or a lot of people in the world are used to subtitles these days. So I hope it's also fine to, to, to use your own language because it's part of your culture. So. Yes, and, and another thing that is happening, uh, if you watch some series, for example, in a platform like, like Netflix, uh, you can watch series that are, the characters talk in multiple languages, like in, in Spanish, in English, or in German. They are like mixing the languages, and we can watch now series that don't have like, like one language. It's like these characters talk in Spanish and he's going to talk in Spanish with this other that is talking in Spanish. And they are like starting to mix in the, the series. I am now working in a in a series that have like French, Spanish, and Euskera, that is the, the, the Spanish, uh, the Basque country uh, language. And it's like three languages in one series. And it's, it, that's because of the of the uh, geographic uh, uh, situation that the people in, in Basque country talk in English, if sorry, in Spanish and in Euskera, and they have the French part too very close, so they mix up all the, the language in one series. I watch a lot of series in Spanish and English, for example. I think that that's like uh, the the Frederick, uh, sorry, the Shojin. Uh, uh, thing that thing that he talks is very important, and this too, because in the other way we 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 have to fight for our language too, and don't don't uh, lose that fight only doing things in, in in English. I think that we can do it in, in a lot of more idioms languages. Another thing that um, you know, this last uh, in America, the 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 Oscars, the Academy Awards, um, Parasite just won. And it was the first film um, ever to win best film that had subtitles. Um, and, you know, everyone I know has has seen that film. So that's kind of, you know, an indicator that it's kind of changing, that people are more willing to watch things with subtitles. Um, and, I, you know, it's funny, I actually, we showed um, our first episode um, when it was just a short film, we showed it in, in France. And they asked us to write out the the subtitles in fr in French, and so then we had to figure out how to write all these you know like wordplay jokes in French, and it was like we had to write completely different jokes. Like it didn't, you know, it's 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 for humor specifically. I think it's really hard to translate um, yeah. jokes like that, you know. <clears throat> yeah, kind of, uh, actually, uh, that is um, the reason why I watch everything <laughs> uh, yeah. in the original, because uh, you can't translate humor at all. Um, uh, the it's nice that in uh, America, people are getting more willing to watch foreign movies with subtitles. In Germany, we, we don't have that trend. Uh, Germans are, like love to have uh, everything synchronized. And um, that actually, um, for me at least, takes away a lot um, of the authenticity and of uh, the jokes um, 
of the of the of the media. But uh, yeah, Frederick, do, do you also have uh, some thoughts on that? Uh, it, it was interesting because I, I, I never thought to do it in English because I was I was like, if I do a web series and it's supposed to be available everywhere, why not show the people what there is a language in Luxembourg and it's Luxembourg and nobody speaks it, but still it we have a language. Uh, why not try something? Uh, but but so the series is out, so you can watch it on YouTube and so on. But what what I realize is it's it's still complicated to. Um, so the younger audience are now really um, like that. This kind of reflex that everything is supposed to be in English to be good, and uh, telling them there is a web series that's kind of not. It's kind of still modern. It's kind of new. But it, it's in Luxembourg. There was no, there was kind of no appeal for them. So teenagers were not really interested in watching something, even if they are really like people watching on the web things. So being in Luxembourg was not really something that interested this kind of audience. But it was interesting for the little bit older audience and for the, for um, internationally speaking, because there's this kind of exotism about a language that nobody speaks and. Um, that was interesting, but for me, I, I never thought about doing a series in English because it's not the way I, I think, and it's not the way I write, and it's not the way it's not the way I live. Policemen don't speak English, and women who are lost in the middle of the forest will not stop to speak English. So why do it in English? Yeah, and no, I, I really um, actually, um, I mean, you always said Luxembourgish is not really well-known language and um, even though I've been to Luxembourg I, I never because the people in Luxembourg they all speak German or, or French and they would be like ah you're from Germany okay they speak German to me um, so it's really rare to hear that language and I really enjoyed uh, hearing it because uh, it's like such a funny mix between French and uh, German I think uh, yeah it, it was really interesting to listen to that for that um, long amount of time I think that's, um, that's, that's, that's great. That's, that's, thank you. Yeah, I think um, we can all also gain something by, by just listening to other languages, um, a better understanding, maybe a, a better like understanding also of culture, I guess, because, uh, yeah, it's not all, all English, yeah? <laughs> except here at the Reale today, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, our the, the, the viewer that um, asked uh, this uh, question or this uh, comment was not uh, over. Um, he uh, wanted to know, um, but I think you already answered a lot of it. Um, but just for like, I, I will read it to you. Um, how do you guys as creators deal with the issue of filming in your native language compared to filming in English? Do you rather stick to having full grammar and acting control in your native language or would you rather use the English language to be more international and then maybe put up with a more stiff acting performance because of her heavy accent? So I guess you answered uh, a lot of it already, but um, maybe there was some new input in there because of that acting question now. <laughs> well, I, I can say, you know, I, I did two episodes in English for my uh, series. And there we used, I thought, you know, the accent is comedy. So we used, you know, we didn't have our priest speak perfect English and also the Russian girls who come in, they don't have to speak perfect English. And then I was trying to make, you know, use that as a comedy element. So in this way, the, the writer is correct, but a whole series, it might get old that kind of using it as comedy, the accent. I would always go with better actors than going with a stiff performance for English reasons. Yeah, I guess that's kind of a, yeah, speaks for itself, I guess. Um, okay, um, uh, let me check um, if there's any more questions from the audience, uh, maybe, because I thought that was a really interesting question um, and everybody had a, a, an opinion about it. Um, so maybe to our audience, if, if you have any more questions, you can um, ask them and uh, write them on Facebook or here in our, our, our Twitch uh, uh, chat. And then I, I, well, I will ask them our, our guests. Um, but yeah, um, there's lots of stuff with us. <laughs> it's the question that I have. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, she is. <laughs> Doctor, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so not uh, maybe I, I would I would try to um, ask the question again I, I wanted to ask you earlier um, because I'm I'm really interested uh, interested in this topic for personal reasons also and um, uh, I was wondering or, or I felt like this series was not just commenting on on female struggle in this time period but also on um, on the struggle of uh, of men and their like gender role and and uh, the um, the pressure to um, to fulfill this role. Not it. <laughs> I don't think this is going to work today, which is sad. <laughs> yeah, I think now it works. So ah, no, no, it. Yeah, did you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, no, I, I need the question again. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, okay, no, never mind. It's no problem. So, um, do, do you also feel like your your work, um, or maybe it's just my my point of view because I was like writing my thesis about it and it's all in my mind. I, I, I don't know. But um, do you also feel like your your series was commenting on? male gender roles in this time period and the pressure to, to I don't know, um, fulfill this role? Yeah, um, our um, man roles are really different. So um, we have um, we have the really romantic um, Dr. Büchner who falls in love with Louisa and he's He's an idolist and he's really, um, yeah, the romantic, the prince charming. And then um, we have the small brother of Luisa, who's this military strict guy and um, who uh, promotes that uh, men don't have feelings. And um, then we have her father, who's a really kind man and who's, a little bit supporting her but also just letting her do what she wants to do um so more the type of guy who just doesn't want to be bothered and um so um when you combine these or when you compare these three characters um you really see that uh we don't have such a such a strict role model um and uh yeah but this we wanted to show or we wanted to show different role models uh, of uh, male characters in this time i see okay thank you um so i i would like um to ask you guys like a final question maybe and um i um wanted to, because i want to end on like more like a fun note and um, because we talked a lot about social issues now and feminism and whatever. So um, I, I know that on, on film sets, usually uh, some something funny or crazy or whatever happens uh, that's like weird. And um, so I was uh, asked, I wanted to ask you to share maybe like a, a funny story that happened during filming or something like that, if you, if you got one. Who wants to start? Um, I'll start. Um, I, uh, so our, so we, we shot six episodes, um, and our, our fifth and sixth episode we shot in Paris actually. So Hammersmith ends up, they end up going to a film festival in Paris. Um, and so we were filming a scene where he's drunk and he's crazy and he's running around on the streets and, um, you know, production kept getting delayed. So we were shooting at like one in the morning or something, you know. So at one point we're shooting this scene and I'm, I, I keep telling the actor to like, you know, to say it a little quieter, but he keeps screaming like whenever we start rolling. And then eventually, you know, like somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and they're like, Kyle, like look up. And then we look up and we're on this, this like residential street and we look up and like everyone's head is popped out just like watching us and they're super mad. 
and they were like way too loud at the, one in the morning i was like uh uh pardon pardon uh and so i just cut it early and we shot the next day but it was really they were they were very generous you know the the parisians are very generous with filmmakers they were nice but yeah jo joel actually um told me about this today that paris is a really um really nice uh, town for for film and filmmaking yeah. and uh, watching movies um but yeah you should you shouldn't make uh, the french mad i don't think that's well <laughs> yeah right germans know that um <laughs> so yeah who wants to continue okay i continue uh, we have a strange situation with the uh, with the van that with the motor home that we rent because the guy that rent us the motor home who wants to keep the the motor home in the in the woods all the time in the night all the time so we say okay yes we can do that if you are okay with that and he say okay and when when we go all the time that we go to the to the other day to shoot it we have the problem that the guy destroy all the art of that we do in the in the in the van all the days and we have to start again all the days doing the art because he doesn't like the art that we put in the in the van so he's all the time we end the the, the shooting we go out to our home and he starts to keep everything out of of the places and one of the times we he keep all the time what the second key to us uh to to have and he have another one that we doesn't know we were like uh shooting and sh doing the scene and he appears from the bathroom we doesn't know that he was there all the all the time and he appears and, and, and say oh hello or whatever and we was in the middle of shooting so he was all the night doing living in the in the in the motorhome all the time i think he lives in the motorhome and he was his house and he ne doesn't never tell us that. And he, I don't know where he goes. He goes to the to the woods, and maybe when we we go out, he goes to the to the to the van and lives there. So we are shooting in his home. It was so strange. He was a really strange guy. Oh, that's crazy. He <laughs> <laughs> was so strange. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, <laughs> uh, does somebody else want to uh, share a story? Well, I can I can tell a story because we're also doing Facebook clips and we shot you know we do we we try to mix reality with scripted fiction. So we have certain we always shoot certain clips just for Facebook for the Facebook account of the priest. So we were in Rome at the Vatican and we we are shooting my priest, our priest, Hannes Hellmann, in front of the Vatican, and he was dressed as a priest. And of course, you know, people came to him and talked to me, hey, father this and father that. They wanted, everybody came by and wanted money from him. And he's a priest, you know, he has to give them money. So it was, then we were sitting in cafe, you know, for trying to relax and he had his priest attire. So it was really interesting how the reality and the fiction were growing together. And the actor was kind of um, overwhelmed by the situation. So that was funny for me, at least, because <laughs> I didn't have to give the money to the to the beggars and stuff. So. Yeah, so, so really, he really became a priest. Basically. Yeah, he was, but he's, he's not religious himself, so he couldn't handle it in a way, you know. So it was very weird. And then, yeah, but he became the priest at the Vatican. <laughs> that's great <laughs> yeah that's that's a funny story <laughs> uh frederick do you have something to share no, I, I, I would love to say something funny but my, my shootings are kind of boring so it was it was, it was so tight we had so, so it was everything was just we had to move on and shoot and shoot so nothing really strange happened so i'm, I'm kind of sad right now when i hear it's kind of fun stories one was just shoot, 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 done, 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 and then bye, 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 bye. <laughs> well, that's kind of funny also. <laughs> yeah, and what about Lotte? Oh, can... I actually have a, a lot of funny stories to tell because uh, we had a great crew uh, at the shooting and um, 
we had a lot of fun together, but we really had to struggle um, because we shot last summer and it was really, really hot. And um, we were on one castle for about 10 days and we had the opportunity to also live in the castle. So half of the crew uh, was sleeping in the dorms uh, of, this, uh, of this manor. And um, so in the evening, we always uh, had a nice little party uh, in front of the castle. And one day it was so hot that um, we just jumped into the water around the castle and had a midnight swim to cool down uh, after a really long and really hot shooting day. So um, yeah, it was a great feeling with these wonderful people. And yeah, so we had a midnight swim in front of a castle. I think I never had this before and I will never have this again. It sounds you need really an, romantic. If you need an extra crew member on your next season, let me know. Uh, I'll, I'll come help. I will call you. Okay. Yeah, it's a, a really beautiful castle where you shot that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm envious, of course, as well. <laughs> yes, and it was a great feeling to have the key for this castle and to wake up in the morning and open the great door. And uh, yeah, I really felt like a princess. <laughs> and you also had like this actor who played this butler. So he, I guess he did that also like all the time, even when he wasn't acting. So. <laughs> Yeah, he he really uh, he was really born for this role, and um, after some time, he started to opening doors for everybody, and always uh, was really polite and silent, and always helping. And um, yeah, I asked him if he doesn't want to to do this forever at my home, but actually, he denied. I'm really sorry. That's too bad, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I loved his character so much because there was like this, uh, this really like cliche stereotype uh, butler character who's always listening at the door, you know, <laughs> he's always like knowing everything that goes on. So I thought it was really funny, yeah. He was, uh, he was one of the best characters of, of the series. <laughs> so yeah, um, I guess we have to come to an end um, now. Uh, I want to thank you all so much uh, for joining me in this panel and for being here today at the Educational and for all your wonderful submissions, um, great series, um, and I hope our audience gets to check them out. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you too. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. and. Um, our, our audience, uh, to our audience, um, the uh, educational is uh, therefore over for this year. Um, we're really glad um, you stayed with us and for all of your um, support and, um, and kindness um, that we received on social media so far. And yeah, really, I'm really grateful for all of this. And um, I hope I, I see everybody uh, maybe next year in person. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.